There is no simple answer to the question then of whether women are happier as mothers or as girl bosses. It is. Here's the simplicity of the answer. It's based off the individual. <gasps> women aren't a monolith. You f***ing reductive thinker. This is the dumbest video I've ever seen in my life. Humans are individuals. You're an individual person. Stop asking the world if you're allowed to be happy, if you're allowed to find joy, if you're allowed to have a relationship with your consciousness. Do it anyways. Don't listen to the world that is shaming you for being a mom. Don't listen to the world that is shaming you for being a girl boss. Don't listen to the world that is shaming you for having mental health and getting better. Don't listen to the world that is miserable and alone. Don't listen to anyone who doubts you because they're not you. Listen to your joy. If you need advice and help, go to people that aren't going to turn you away from your joy because of their bias. What? There's no easy answer. The easy answer is let people choose their lives. Give society choices and let people choose. Even if a majority of women choose having babies, great. Let it be their choice. And if they choose to have jobs, let it be their choice. And if men want to be stay-at-home dads, let it be their choice. Men also get shamed for being stay-at-home dads. That's why I don't believe men's statistics on men on whether or not men want to stay at home. Men aren't always safe to say they want to be stay-at-home dads because other men make fun of them or some women don't think it's attractive. So again, men also should be given choices about staying home. Literally, data shows us that positive reinforcement is the best thing for people. It is the best way to change. You can do this. You absolutely can. Our ancestors have proven this to us. People who have come before us have proven this. You can do this. This is a video that Discord recommended to me called The Girl Box Girl Boss Paradox, Why Empowered Women Are Miserable. I can't wait to watch this because I just saw that Brett Cooper also made a video about how like women are going to their soft girl era. And I have to say as a woman who's going more into her masculinity and more into her job, I'm having like an opposite reaction. I'm I'm moving further and further away from a desire to like raise babies and focus on being a mom. Like I'm definitely moving harder into business and I'm really hardcore thinking about growing a successful business by my mid 40s so I can chill in my 50s and 60s and I'm excited about it. And I this video is a year old to be fair, but let's see what this person has to say about it. I want to have a kid with you because I think you're going to be an amazing dad. Okay, first of all, everyone called me Monica growing up. <laughs> and Chandler, Chandler's my favorite, obviously, rest in peace. But like everyone called me Monica growing up, my brothers are like you're so Monica. I take that as a compliment. I know a lot of people wouldn't, but I do. At, at the fun parts and at the hard well, parts. I'm between Phoebe and Monica, which I think is perfect. Yeah, well, can you picture me saying, go to your room, you're grounded. <laughs> can you hear me say you're grounded? Yes. You said that to me last week. Is being a mom the toughest job on the planet? More difficult than hard labor, ditch digging, mining, and garbage collection combined? Well, if you were to read Mom Life Comics, a series of simplistic images with overlaid text that became popular on Instagram within the Momosphere, a community comprised of minion meme-sharing Farmville addicts whose hearts pump more box wine and zannies than blood, created by Mary Catherine Starr, then the answer is an obvious yes. Mom Life Comics reached mainstream popularity for perhaps all the wrong reasons in mid-2022 after this particular comic went viral, wherein Mary laments the differences between her and her husband, highlighting her selflessness compared to his selfishness and deciding who should have the right to eat the final peach. Meanwhile, The Rock. Look, the last ripe peach. Not a chicken. I want a fried chicken with pink sauce. Each comic is a variation upon this same theme. Mary is a beleaguered mother who does everything to enrich the lives of her children. Well, oh, I her it. husband is a... Recently, my husband and I were unloading groceries from the car. Yes, this is an accurate depiction of our different unloading styles. You know what's so sad is just like, again, because I believe, and this is what I believe. You don't have to believe it. You don't have to agree with me. I do think most people are settling in their relationships and most people aren't having what I would call is like the dream relationship, which I think I obviously attained. I wouldn't have married this person if I didn't think I did. And I think a lot of people think they're attaining it, but then they tell these stories and I'm like, you cannot possibly think you are in love the way I'm in love. I'm so sorry. Like, again, not to compare the relationships as like valid or less valid, but you cannot tell me you and your husband are having the same relationship I'm having with mine. Because like, why is this happening? Like, I have a relationship where like, no, like what we either all pull our weight or whoever's stronger takes more groceries. And so it's like, what are you talking about? Like, again, I, if this is your life, 
And she put in parentheses, yes, this is an accurate depiction of our different unloading styles. You're not in love the way they write about in storybooks. You're not in love with a person who sees your consciousness. Like, what's happening? Unless you are literally saying, oh, my husband actually can't do these things. He's disabled and you're making fun of him. But if he is able-bodied and, you know what I'm saying? Like, what what are you doing with your life? This For me, this needs couples counseling. Or you need to sit down and be like, hey, do you love me? Because sometimes I feel like you don't see me or you don't think of me or like you're not being thoughtful and then I'm resenting you. You know what I mean? A loser do nothing. And by the way, I feel for her, but also I want her to take agency and have the conversation with her spouse. To do anything to help with the parenting. Except people quickly discovered, upon only slight investigation, that Mary's husband is in fact a lawyer who works a second job to support her. Oh, my husband is not a dumb jock. He's a very smart lawyer who also runs a basketball training business side hustle. But he loves good sports metaphors, so sometimes I talk to him like this in hopes that it will click. As you can imagine, he loves it. It's a great way to convey the mental load of motherhood to him. Please tell me you do something similar, and if so, what kind of metaphor do you use when talking to your partner or kids? Um, <clears throat> okay, but like, even if he is a lawyer and works like a second job, does he also only carry one bag into the house? I'm still confused about that. And their kids, that he cooks most, if not all of their meals, and tends to the subsequent dishes. Does Wait, what? Investigation that Mary's husband is in fact a lawyer who works a second job to support her and their kids, that he cooks most, if not all of their meals, and tends to the subsequent dishes does the grocery shopping, the laundry, the yard work, and watches the children while she does attend to the strenuous job of teaching yoga three nights a week. And the entirety of her comic series appears to be self-centered whining from an extremely privileged woman, bemoaning that she is forced to take care of her own children. However, clearly this message spoke to a lot of other moms on Instagram. I'm so confused. I think I remember this. Wait, I think I do remember this. Wasn't this like a scandal? Was this only last year? I'm so confused. Oh my god. Instagram who found Mary's message relatable. Although that may be because mommy bloggers on Instagram are suffering from what the medical community has described as a clinical lack of human decency, self-awareness, and the immortal soul. That message is that being a mom really is the toughest job on earth. So the question is, well, is it? Is being a full-time mother- Okay, I just want to say this too. I, I will say like, um, we talk about this a lot in our relationship because right now my partner is the stay-at-home partner and I swore I would never have a stay-at-home partner because what I imagined was this. I imagined a stay-at-home partner would be somebody who literally just stayed home and then I was still paying for like a housekeeper, housekeeper or something like that because I had male partners in the past. Again, I've never had a problem paying for my life and my partner's life. Like that's never been an issue for me. I don't care. Like if my dad did it for his, like my mom and him, like I don't care, right? But you have to be doing something at home. Like you have to be helping. You have to take the load off of the person who's working or something like has to be, it has to be symbiotic, a team. So like if I had a stay-at-home partner who was like, I just want to work on my arts and crafts. I like want to do a hobby and I never want to help around the house. And I expect you to also pay for someone to do those chores instead of me. Like I would be like, um, ma'am, like, what are we even talking about, right? And that's sometimes what I feel when I hear these mommy bloggers or these mommy somethings. Or sometimes it feels like you don't even want to be a mom, which is a lifestyle. You don't even want to raise your kids, which is like, how wonderful is that? Like, it's a, it's a great honor to raise your kids, bros. But also, if you didn't want to raise your kids, why do you have them? And also, like, if you're a stay-at-home partner, you know, I'm just confused, you know? 50-50, not 80-20. I disagree, 100-100. I don't believe in 50-50. 100-100, bros. 100-100. There's no 50-50 in my marriage. 100-100. Everyone puts 100% in. 100% in. You know what I mean? Like, Brene Brown talks about this, how, like, the reality is, is like, it's not always 50-50 because life gets in the way. But I think you need to put 100-100 in every day based off of, like, your capabilities. You need to do the best you can do every day, even if it's less than you did yesterday. It still has to be the best you can do today. And that's my philosophy, right? Like things have to get done. Like you have to do stuff. You have to do it. Like my partner and I are currently sick and we're doing 100-100 as sick versions of ourselves, right? Like we woke up today and we both like, I woke up early for a call and then went back to bed and I got sleep because, you know, we're sick. We're trying to get better. But like 
he woke up and he had to do something. He has an event on Thursdays he does. And I was like, okay. And I was like, I'll run to the store for us instead because that's usually his job. I was like, I'll do it this time. I was like, what do you need? It's like, yeah, that's his job. But also like because we had to sleep the way we did, he couldn't do it today. So like we both do 100, 100. And I know later today he's going to do the other things that I don't want to do, like dishes and all that other stuff. And I'm going to work. Like I'm, I came to work today. So it's one of those things where – it's about doing 100, 100 for the day, not about saying, well, this is your job and why do I have to do it? And why do it's like, no, what do we need done today as the team? Great. Do that. Like, do that. Let's go. What are we doing today? And that's all we did. Like, we just do the best we can every day. Really more difficult than working full time or balancing motherhood and having a career. And before you dismiss this topic outright by humming a few bars of the chemical workers song, I should emphasize that when I hear, sorry, uh, Jules says, can you explain 100, 100, please? You've said that before, but it doesn't make any sense. I think 50, 50 insinuates balance. I think, I think for me, 50, 50 insinuates holding each other accountable. Like I did the dishes, so you need to do the bathroom. It's like, no, I don't want to go have these on rent. I don't want to go have these on chores. For me, when I think 50, 50, I think have these. You know what I mean? So for me, like, I don't want halvesies. We're not going halvesies. We're going fullsies. Does that make sense? So for me, when people say, um, you know, 50-50, to me, it means like, oh, let's go 50% of the rent, 50% of the bills, 50% of the chores. Like, I don't want to do 50% of the chores. I want us to do the chores. I don't care how it gets done or who does it. As long as we're both attempting to do it and putting in the effort, I don't care how it gets done. It's not about saying like, oh, well, I did the dishes yesterday and you did this yesterday and oh, well, I worked yesterday. It's like, no, I don't, I'm not keeping score against my teammates. Absolutely not. If you have a team of football players or basketball players, 100%, you go 100%. It's, I'm not gonna, no, I don't, I, I'm not gonna hold it against the guys who are benched for the game and hold it. I'm like, no, we're all putting in 100%, even if you're benched, we're putting in 100%. That there are a lot of people like Mary who truly believe that motherhood is tougher than shoveling cyanide or mining asbestos. The world's toughest job. It's basically 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There are no breaks, no vacations. If you had a life, we'd ask you to sort of give that life up. Also, the position is gonna pay absolutely nothing. Excuse me? Possibly. That's crazy. What if I told you there's- Oh, I remember this ad. I remember this. Discord said, Megan Trainer recently said on a podcast, I saw that clip. That she has a nanny from eight to five and that's not enough. LOL. I have been a full-time nanny to three kids. Made me sad to hear that it wasn't enough. Well, like that's, I heard that, I saw that clip too. And I was like, that's what I mean. Like, I'm so amazed. Again, I don't know why people are having kids if they don't want to raise them. That's why I'm literally, I love my job. I told my mom, I was like, I really love my job. And I do, I want to do it every day. And I don't know where a kid fits into that lifestyle. Like if I had had a kid before, I would have made it different. But I'm kind of like in a career place. And so I'm open to adoption. Like my partner and I are super open to adoption until we're much older. Like we're very open to adopting older kids. So in our mind, even if we don't raise a baby and have one, and I want to have one before 40 if I do, then I can have one at 45 and I can adopt. You know what I mean? Or I can foster children or I can do something like that. So for me, it's like, I don't know why you're making these babies just to have a full-time nanny. I genuinely don't get it. And I was a full-time nanny. I worked professionally with very high influence um, or high affluent families. They were very nice. They were really great people. But yeah, like I, I'm going to be real with you. I did not just bring a baby into this world to not spend time with them. And I think dads or working parents really lose out on time with their kids. And I think that's fine if your only goal is to make the human species exist. But since mine is to break like generational curses, I will tell you as a child, one of the things my siblings and I love is that we had our dad every evening and every weekend and our mom was with us 24 seven. Our dad was with us all the time. And so it's one of those things where for us, I mean, sorry, our mom was with us all the time. So for us, like, I always had somebody I could go to always, even if we were fighting, even if it wasn't great, I had access to a parent versus some of my friends who had working parents. Now that they're older, the number one complaint they have is they never got to see their parents and it wasn't enough just to see them at breakfast and dinner. And I think it's going to be dependent on the children, of course, but even studies are showing with menosphere bubbles. There's this, um, why do I always forget his name? But he's talking about how like studies have been shown like men who work all the time their kids report as they get older, like no one ever cared about the money. I just wanted my dad home. I just wanted to like throw a ball with my dad. So again, like there's something to be said about this. Like what are we in a privileged society? 
So if somebody like me, what or Megan Trainer, it's like, why are we making babies if we're not going to spend time with those babies? It seems weird. Like it seems strange to me, but like you do you. Like I don't care. You're you're no better off from breaking generational curses than anyone else. Like you're not obligated to. But you can't be upset when your child grows up and goes, hey, like I spend more time with my nanny than you. I had a caller who literally spent more time with her nanny, right? This was like a very old caller from years and years ago. But I had a caller who spent so much time with her nanny that she started to question if she was allowed to like identify as a different ethnicity, the one that matched her nanny, because she felt like she didn't even belong like in the same way to her family, which I know she did. I'm sure she wouldn't feel completely like that. But the fact that she was even thinking about identified ethnically as relating to her nanny, like, like, what are we talking about here? So anyways, good luck, people out there just making babies. Discord says, I think some people, uh, for some people, a nanny is part of their village. It's adding to their support system. I was a full-time nanny for parents who both worked from home. Such a different life. Ooh, I did have a family I worked for where the dad worked from home, and that was pretty dope, and that felt pretty okay, and that felt like it worked better than the parents that are like, I basically just don't, like don't want to see my kids. And I'm like, okay. Like, that's interesting to me too. Like, or they, they're focused on their career. They don't want to lose their, like, again, I don't know why you're having babies. Because to me, having a baby is like such a big deal. It is like such a big honor and deal. And it's like so much responsibility that I think people aren't doing it with that in mind. They're just doing it because it's the next thing to do on a bucket list, right? And I think that's the problem. <clears throat> Yes, Henry, 100, 100 is just bringing your best as much as you can because you love your partner. It's about, it's not quantitative, it's about quality. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Jewel says, depends on the couples. In some cases, I think it's appropriate to split things that evenly. Sometimes one person handles all aspects of certain things while the other handles the other things. Um, That's still different, right? Than 50-50 or like, I'm talking about a very specific category of people, right? Um... V says, I think 100% sounds like it holds us more accountable. I think when people say 50-50, they mean what you mean when you say 100%, but it's a term phrase off bubbles. That's true. We might be just having a bubbles difference in language. Because, yeah, every time I deal with somebody who wants 50-50, it's like they're trying to not be responsible. And they're trying to say like, oh, well, that's not my chore, so I don't have to do it. And I'm like, you're such a freak, bro. It's like the men who think they don't have to baby or they have to babysit their kids because it's 50-50. I work. Why do I have to watch the kids? That's the the bubble I'm from when people say 50-50, they mean like, why do I have to do that when that's not my job? And like, that's weird to me. It's like, we're 100% in this relationship. Like, please make an effort. If I'm sick one day, are you not going to do like my chores because they're quote unquote my chores? No, but some people do that. Or, so, or even 50-50 of the rent, like that's very confusing for me. If you're in a marriage, if you're dating, for sure, like 100%, right? Like if you're not mixing finances, like illegally, to I totally get that. Um, but anyways, anyways, anyways. Um, -da -da -da. Imagine you as a foster mom running an orphanage is really a beautiful. I mean, honestly, I would thrive. It would be great. I would, I would just like want to adopt everybody, but like I would thrive. I would make it work. Someone that currently holds this position right now. Who? Moms. Make your friends and get over it. For example, there's this woman who made a reward chart for her husband that similarly went viral a few years ago. Although, to be fair, she did later claim that this was a joke, only after catching a lot of flack on- Ooh, gee, as a guy, I'll pay the bills as long as you take care of the kids in the house. Does that mean that you never want to take care of the kids in the house? Or does that mean that, you know, what does that mean? Like, obviously, like, I have sort of a similar setup where like I work seven days a week and I bring in the money and he handles all the house care, all the like calls to like people, like if we need anything done, like he does it because I don't speak Croatian as well. So he handles everything. Um, he like, you know, changes out the bedding every week, which is like a wonderful thing. I love him so much for that. Like he handles everything. But obviously if he's sick, I will do it. And if I'm sick, like, well, he can't work for me, but he'll support me. <laughs> See, that's I, I understand that. Like, I understand that realistically, like, he can't do my job for me. So if I'm sick and I can't work, it's just what it is. But if he's sick, I can help do the chores. And I have no problem with that. Like, I don't know why. It just doesn't matter to me. Like, my dad did the same thing. My dad worked. And of course, my mom couldn't work for my dad. But if my mom was sick, my dad would just take over the chores. 
You know what I mean? So I don't know. Maybe it's just something about that. Maybe the person who works takes on a little bit more labor in some ways, but I don't have a problem doing that either. You know what I mean? I would take care of the kids, but as a man, I don't need to be around them as often. No, no, gee, you are not going to break generational curses this way. As a dad, you need to be around your kids. Your kids need you. You know what I mean? Like you do you. Of course, a lot of men have this narrative, but like that's the thing that my partner and I are trying to break. Like if we become parents, he also wants to break the generational curse of thinking like you don't need to be around your children. You know what I mean? I think that's a really common narrative in some bubbles. And I, I'm not saying it's morally wrong. I'm saying it is psychologically damaging to your children. And so like the fatherless issue like in children is so clear. You know what I mean? So it is one of those things where I'm like, oh, like you do you, of course, but like your kids really need their dads, you know, you know, Kay says, does your partner have an accent when he speaks English? Yes, but it's not very heavy. Um, he doesn't have the heaviest accent. His friends have much heavier accents. He's been he's so Americanized. It's insane. <clears throat> I don't I honestly think that's why we connected. My theory is my partner and I connected because he's so Americanized for a Croatian even though he had never been to America before. Um, but his friends, I don't know. They don't, I like, I, he, 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 he knows my team. Guys, we talked about Fresh Prince of Bel-Air the other day. And I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, of course I watch Fresh Prince. I was like, <laughs> okay. Like we just watch the same things and we know the same. It's really lovely. I think that's probably why we connect, you know, you know, um, anyways. Okay. Online and the new She-Hulk television series posits as its main focus. I'm I'm going to be there, just not 24-7. Okay, I mean, fair. If you work outside the home, you can't be there 24-7. Okay, fair. Fair, G. Same. Okay, that makes sense. If you if you work 24-7, or if you work, of course, you can't be there 24-7. That women do far more than men while being far better at it. So I'm in. You know what? I watched the first, like, three episodes of the She-Hulk show, and I didn't hate it, and they mentioned DBT, so I officially loved it. Expert at controlling my anger because I do it infinitely more than you. Shut the f up. <laughs> Thus today, <laughs> let's examine women's life satisfaction and happiness in general in the decades since the women's rights movement, as well as the relationship between motherhood and women's well-being, to understand if being a mom really is as difficult as some women, like Mary, the real peach that she is, claim it to be. But first, and because while mom life comics may be more concerned with securing the safety of the last peach, the rest of us have other safety and security concerns. Namely, our online privacy and financial safety, which is where this video sponsor comes in, Aura. Aura is an all-in-one- Let's go, Aura. Brit says that I have such a hard time connecting with someone if we don't speak the same language fluently. Is a recipe for stupid misunderstandings? You know what's crazy? Is That is the number one question I ask people who date people who speak like very little of a shared language. Because my partner and I, he's very fluent in English. Like he's very, very fluent in English. And we don't have misunderstandings. Um, I, I honestly like there's there's no way his English is so good. It's better than mine, like honestly. But like, OK, some of my partners no, some of my partners, some of my friends or family or people who are dating people with like, again, minimal like shared language. I'm always like, how do you not have a misunderstanding? There is no way I am such a specific communicator. I don't think I could ever, ever be with somebody that I didn't share a very strong understanding of language with. It's like. Hello. I mean, look at the YouTube. Look at YouTube. How like we're talking 50, 50, 100, 100. And everyone's like, what does that mean? Even little things like that. Like I'm literally serious that I found a partner that is so similar to me, even though we grew up in different countries, that when I say 100, 100, he goes, yeah, absolutely. Like, do you get what I'm saying? Like we're so similar in this way. Um, are you currently learning Croatian? <laughs> Duh. <laughs> It's very hard. Yes, I'm trying. It's really hard. I'm not going to lie. I'm trying, though. I have four years to learn it uh, enough to pass a test to be a permanent resident. So I'm temporary right now, and the goal is to be a permanent resident. Okay? We're doing, like, face stuff right now. Okay, so, like, cello and glava, and I'm, like, learning, like, different words for the face right now. <laughs> It's not easy, okay? It's not easy. Uh, you know? Security suite that provides you with everything you need to stay safe online. 
or includes financial fraud and credit protection that monitors your credit score and transactions, alerting you when there's been unusual activity and allowing you to instantly lock unwarranted inquiries into your credit history, as well as assist with lost wallet. Can you say hello in Croatian? Well, we say bok or dobrodan or bok. I say bok a lot or when you so bok means both hi and bye. So you can say bok bok, bye bye or bok, hi or bok bok, hi hi. Or you can say ciao, which is like from Italy. Everyone says it here. Ciao, ciao. Remediation. And each plan comes with an insurance policy that covers up to $1 million in identity theft insurance. Along with your credit score. Or also... Okay, stop. Quick count to 10 in Croatian. It's so hard. We've been learning the numbers. And it is very hard. Text identity theft, notifying you when any accounts or passwords have been breached. And includes a password manager to help you secure your data. Aura also comes with malware protection, built-in antivirus software, and a VPN. So with just Aura, you can not only protect yourself, but change your location to access TV shows and films not available in your region. And if that wasn't impressive enough, Aura also offers a family plan that provides protection for up to five family members, including alerting you if your children's identities have been compromised. Finally, Aura provides 24-7 <sighs> customer support because your online security doesn't have time to wait for business hours. All of these services, all in one convenient place, start at just $12 a month annually or $15 monthly for an individual plan. If you click my link down in the description and in the pinned comment, you'll also get six months of service absolutely free. So you can check out Aura. Yes, V, let's go. I need to practice. Once I get really like, I'm trying to learn certain things in Croatian so I can even practice them, like saying them on stream with you guys. Because I have a few Croatians who watch me or people from like this area, which is really exciting. For yourself and figure out if you like the service. And I think you will. Thanks so much to Aura for sponsoring this video. And now that we've got a service that can help keep us and our families happy and safe online, let's talk about the paradox of women's happiness. Croatians are very similar to Russians, um, but they're also just like Eastern Europeans and we're all very similar and associated with each other, but also like different, all the same, like very different, but also the same, but also different, but also the same, but also different. I don't know. I'm still learning. The women's rights movement instilled in generations of young women a belief that they could do it all and have it all. She could have a career, a family, and passionate hobbies, and balance all of these things in perfect harmony. But has that really been the case? Or has she chosen to instead have none of them, preferring the comfort of a cat and a box of wine? Ooh. This smells like a goon bag. Oh, that smells like a goon bag. For over 30 years, in the US, the number of women staying at home as full-time mothers has been declining, as while well, 49% of single and married moms stayed home rather than working in 1967, that percentage fell to just 23% in- I was listening to a Dave Ramsey clip and the woman goes, um, you know, I would like to be a stay-at-home mom full-time and I've been talking to my husband about it. And Dave goes, okay, that's great, you know, because he's Christian. And so he's like, okay, that'd be cool, do that. Um, does your husband make enough for that to be possible? And she goes, yeah, he makes like 975000 a year. And he was like, uh, yeah, you guys can make that work. Her husband didn't want her to stay at home he was afraid she would never go back to work, which would signal laziness in. And so there was like some trauma there. See how that's trauma based? Like he was so afraid, even though he allegedly made so much money, that having a stay at home wife who was going to raise his kids meant that she wasn't going to go back to work, which would insinuate like a laziness or like her being a gold digger. And that's what I'm saying. You are marrying people and making babies with them when they don't trust you. Y'all are insane. Humans are literally insane. Like humans are so just oh my gosh like if evolution is so strong why aren't you waiting to have babies with better people but you're not like that's what i'm saying you're having babies with people you don't even trust men and women it is so weird you know what i mean i couldn't even imagine it, and that's one of the things my partner and i have talked about like we really trust each other to have a baby if we were pregnant god forbid <laughs> like god forbid we know we would be great parents because we take it so seriously and we would be 100% on each other's team and we would be like focusing on that baby. So again, it's like, okay, it's all of these things. Like again, how are you making babies with people you don't trust, men or women? 1999, 
But those trends started to change in the late 2000s, as by 2012. And by the way, I'm sorry, one of the reasons I married my husband and not anyone else I've ever dated is because he 100% would never take advantage of me and I would not take advantage of him. But my past partners absolutely tried to take advantage of me. Absolutely, freaking lutely like absolutely but like this person like no like this person is like no we're a team you don't take advantage of your teammates bro 29 percent of mothers chose to stay home with children rather than work according to pew data a more recent poll from motherly reports that this trend has continued into 2021 at which time 32 percent of mothers were mothering full-time Despite the increase in stay-at-home motherhood rising to just under a third of moms, 60% reported to Pew that they believed children were better off with a full-time parent in the home. At the same time, while only 29% of people polled in 1987 completely- Maybe the babies were unplanned. That is fair and that does happen. But here's the thing. We're living in the modern world where women should know better by this point. So let's freaking figure it out. Again, if you think you're smart and capable and resourceful, then why are we making mistakes? And then like, what kind of mistakes are we making? So again, we're all going to make mistakes for the rest of our lives. But what kind of mistakes are we making? Look, you are more than capable of doing research and figuring out your body. You are the only person who owns your body. You need to be in control of it. You need to decide who's impregnating it and like who's having like whose baby are you having? You're the one who has to go through it. Stop like risking unplanned pregnancies. And look, do I have family and friends? Do I have homies? Do I have callers? Do I have people in my life who are always calling me and say, Brittany, my monkey brain took over and I slept with somebody with an STI. Brittany, my monkey brain took over and I didn't wear a condom. Brittany, my mo yes, all of the time. Stop giving into your biology. Be introspective and evoke free will. Stop giving into your biology. Stop doing it. It has your, it does not have your best interest in mind. <laughs> Stop using your monkey brain. Oh my gosh. Oh, I literally, stop using your monkey brain. Okay, stop. Or do it. I don't care, but don't complain. I don't want to hear one fucking complaint. If you gave into your monkey brain and got an STI because you didn't wear a condom or got a baby because you didn't wear a condom and you knew better, I don't want to hear one one complaint out of your fucking mouth okay and I swear to god if you keep going around saying like I'm very smart and you do these things ma'am okay so again take precaution and then handle the consequences take precaution and then handle the consequences your biology is not invested in your best self interest it just wants you to have sex Gainly disagreed with the notion that women should return to traditional roles as mothers and homemakers. By 2010, that rose to 58% of the population who were completely- No, no, no. Listen to this. Colleen says, girl, you know, some of these people don't have that much introspection. No, no, no. They have so much introspection because I know very smart, very introspective people who do these things, but their monkey brain is that powerful when you're not evoking free will. When I say you have to evoke free will- it means you have to fight this thing that feels so determined for you, like the need to have sex. You know what I'm saying? Like there are people that I know that I would classify as very introspective, but man, even maybe fours and fives, but the moment they get their biology involved and they don't evoke their free will, they be fucking and they be fucking in inappropriately. It's insane how some of the most introspective people I know be fucking inappropriately. And I'm like, what are you doing? biology bro I'm telling you they're not evoking their free will because when I challenge them I'm like so you're telling me you made this decision with all of the wisdom in your brain and they're like okay well maybe not like all of the wisdom I'm like oh okay <laughs> listen to me when I say this okay you can be very introspective about yourself and then go and become like if you're not evoking your free will you will absolutely move on your biology and that biology wants you be fucking with no responsibility involved okay stop fucking irresponsibly do not give into temptation opposed to said traditional roles and polling seems to be indicative that women aren't exactly happy about it a 2018 motherly survey found that 74 percent of mothers felt that they were unsupported by society and in just one year that percentage increased to 85 percent by 2020 Wait, it was that, 80. a teen motherly survey found that 74 percent of mothers felt that they were unsupported by society and in just one year that percentage increased to 85 percent by 2020, it was 89%, and a full 97% of millennial mothers in that year reported feeling burned out at least some of the time. In 2022, 42% of stay-at-home moms reported being dissatisfied or very dissatisfied with their childcare situation. As such, even though more and more women were staying at home with children, 
They didn't seem all too pleased about it. As Gallup polling is illustrative that while 51% of women reported preferring to stay at home in 1992, only 44% reported preferring mm. to be a homemaker by 2016. Things appear to be changing for millennial and... It is interesting because like my sister-in-law, you know, she's homeschooling the kids. Um, she's, she's, ma she makes all the food from scratch. She is now pregnant with her fifth baby. She does a lot of like homemaking. Like she does calligraphy. She's very talented. So she does art for around the house. She, she does a lot. Like there's definitely not enough hours in the day for everything she's doing. And they like run this little mini farm with a few animals. So they're doing a lot for their, like their home. You know what I mean? And so there is something to be said about like what kind of stay at home mom would be satisfied being at home and probably a very, very busy one or a, um, a very, very chill one, something like that. You know what I mean? So there's something to be said about sort of like what kind of person would actually be very satisfied doing this because I know I think I would get bored if I was a stay at home mom because when I nannied full time for two babies at a time, I still did my YouTube channel on the side because like I there wasn't enough to do. Even with two babies, there was just like wasn't enough to do for my brain. I was like, we have to do something. We can't just like, I need to do more. So I feel like I would be on purpose the busiest stay at home mom in the whole world because I would want it to feel like a job because I'm stimulated by work. And so I'm one of those humans who's like, I want to work more. Like I feel like it gives me more spoons to work. But of course, it feels better knowing you're working in the way you want to. Like Obviously, YouTube gives me that satisfaction. Being a mom would give me that satisfaction because I would be working a job I really, really wanted. You know what I mean? I really want to be a mom. I don't think I need to be a mom anymore. Something in me significantly changed where I don't need to be a mom anymore. Um, but I'm at this point right now where I've been meditating on whether or not I want a job or I really need it. And I'm kind of moving towards needing it, you know, in my career versus just wanting it. And that's a very huge shift for me and I'm recognizing like that's what like my path has taken and I I get to make the choice ultimately what I decide to do like any choice I make is the right choice as long as it leads me to my joy but that's the thing is like I'm giving myself time to like make the right decision and I that's the advice I'd give to you guys like take your time making very big decisions and also make sure it coincide coincides with your joy because both are great options. Everything in life could be a wonderful option for you. You just have to have to make sure it coincides with your joy. You know what I mean? Gen Z women, however, as in 2015 <clears throat> of mothers under the age of 18, 56% reported preferring to be a homemaker overworking outside of the home. Those under the age of 18 who did not- And by the way, I think men should have access to this ability as well. I really think men- deserve to have the chance to be stay-at-home dads or stay-at-home parents. The idea that they wouldn't be able to because they're men is, I think, so limiting in a world that is so, just the options are so vast. So I couldn't imagine limiting my partner's choices just because of their gender, you know? Have a child were less positive towards homemaking, with only 39% reporting to prefer that lifestyle over employment. So even though moms were unhappy, more and more started <laughs> staying at home. Is this because being a mother is more stressful than working and parenting part-time or working full- Also, there's no way my kid would run around me and like, see, I believe in boundaries and like, you need to be appropriate. What are you doing? Like, I would never let my child like ruin my day. I'm so sorry. Like, you're a child. You need to like learn boundaries and respect. But also like, if your child is stressing you out, like, give yourself some space. You're a person. You deserve some space. Okay? Full-time? That seems illogical, but it's possible. Or is it instead that women are just less satisfied with their lives in general, completely outside of motherhood? Also, not to curse myself in being pregnant, but I did have a dream last night that I was taking care of three different babies that were not mine, but I was delivering babies for people and the parents disappeared and I was I was responsible for three of the babies that my partner and I were taking care of. And it was like an apocalyptic setting because it always is in my dreams. And technically, that really scares me because now I'm having pregnancy. Oh God, I cannot be pregnant. Pregnancy symptoms. My mom had a dream or my brother had a dream that I had a baby. And then my mom messaged me about it. And now I just remembered like that was my dream last night. My dream last night was like it was an ap apocalypse as it always is. And my partner and I had delivered these babies. I delivered these babies. And then the parents disappeared and it was just me and these babies. Has the women's rights movement really liberated us or has it made us miserable? For years, social scientists and journalists alike 
have noted the seeming paradox of life satisfaction in women, in that the freer women have become, following the sexual revolution, the less happy we appear to be. But how is that possible that women become less satisfied as our options in life have expanded massively? Women can do anything. We can be a girl boss in a leadership position at a major company. We can be scientists and doctors. We can vote and be elected to top political positions, including the vice president of the United States, even though we haven't made it to the high She chose not to have babies though, Kam 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 Kamala. Highest station in the nation, and one woman certainly never will, no matter how much she complains about it. Why aren't I 50 points ahead? And yet all of this has seemingly come along with decreases in women. Uh, Brittany, could you give us a definition of your free will? I actually have a video on this. I will send it to you. It's happiness. This paradox was assessed by Stevenson and Wolfers 2009, utilizing data from the U.S. General Social Survey, or GSS, collected between 1972 and 2006, which questioned women on their subjective levels of well-being, measured by the question, how would you say things are these days? Would you say that you are very happy, pretty happy, or not too happy? Including additional questions to assess satisfaction with their marriage, health, <coughs> financial situation, and their job. Across baselines of satisfaction, these data were indicative that women unite- Wait, doesn't Kamala have a daughter? No. Wait, does Kamala have kids? I've never- I thought she was literally like kidless. Googling- Laterally have become less happy over time. Specifically, in the 1970s, women were more likely than men to report being very happy. But by the 1980s, this difference had almost completely disappeared. According to Kamala Google, she doesn't have any kids. Do you guys see any information that says different? She's married to Douglas as of 2014. And she has two parents, and I see no children. In contrast, in the 1970s, men and women were about as likely to report being not too happy. But by the 1990s, women were more likely to report being not too happy than were men. Regression analysis further revealed that while women's happiness has dropped, there has been very little change in men's reported happiness, indicating that women's happiness has fallen both absolutely and relative to that of men. Men instead seem pretty stable in their happiness, just wanting to grill and perhaps even eat a peach. I once secretly ate every urn of my father's beloved honey peaches. And the next day, he brought before me a servant girl that he had accused of crime. And he placed her hand on the table and he drew his knife and he delivered the punishment. To convert these findings into proportional changes, women were one percentage point less likely than men to say that they were not too happy in 1972, but by 2006, they were one percentage point more likely to report being not too happy. In terms of distributions, in 1970. I just feel like all of these videos, I'm so sorry, like all of these videos end up being this. Of course you're unsatisfied or happy. You don't have a relationship with your consciousness. Of course you're unhappy with an abundance life. Of course you're unhappy with all the money in the world, staying at home, working, dream jobs and choices because you're not having a good relationship with your own consciousness. Of course you're unhappy. You know what I mean? Like... You're unhappy because you don't have a relationship with your consciousness. Or you're happy and it's fleeting because happiness is an emotion as it should be and you're not seeking out your joy. Or you're doing something on a checklist because you feel like it's what you're supposed to do, but you're not really, you don't even know why you're doing it. Or you know what I mean? It's like people don't even know why they're doing things. Two, the average woman was as happy as a man in the 53.3rd percentile of happiness, while in 2006, the average woman's happiness aligned with men's at the 48.8th percentile, meaning the average happiness of a given woman was on average five points lower in 2006 than 30 years earlier. In contrast, men saw slight increases in happiness, such that- I hate music and videos, you know I do. Jesus, Brittany, I get the feeling you don't like polygamy and kids. Polygamy meaning many marriages? I don't care. As long as it works and everyone's consenting, like, I don't care. The average man in 2006 reported happiness levels that aligned with men in the 50.7 percentile in 1972. That's not a big change, but just to be clear, these happiness levels from the 1970s represent a population that survived the Lidomide, the Korean War, <laughs> Vietnam, and bell-bottom jeans, and they were still happier than Americans in 2006. Mm -hmm. Overall then, between the 1970s and 2000s, women and men's relationship to happiness reversed, with women largely being happier in the 70s and men largely being happier in the 2000s. Almost like there wasn't a meat grinder in the form of the draft for men, but there were a lot of changes in the US and in gender roles during that time frame. So Stevenson and Wolfers also conducted additional analyses to understand the potential influence of external variables on this trend. However, even when adding in employment, the presence of children, education, and marriage, the inclusion of these controls had little effect on the gender happiness gap. 
That is, women were less happy in 2006 than they were in 1972, and that outcome was not explained by whether or not those women had children, were employed, had attained a higher degree of education, or were married. I mean, there was a major social change that happened over that period of time, but at least according to these data, that change could not be attributed to other common correlates of happiness. When comparing the decline in women's happiness with the decline in happiness experienced by decreased GDP, the authors found that women's happiness drop was equivalent to a GDP reduction of 0.32 points, such that this lowered happiness in women was similar in scope to a significant drop in economic well-being across all populations in its effect on lowered happiness. That is, women were less happy in general, as if they had significantly less wealth, regardless of actual wealth. This was not the case equally for all women, as happiness for both male and female African Americans increased over this period of assessment, but the increase was greater for black women than for black men. Hmm. When looking to data from Europe, with which to compare to the US from Eurobarometer, these scholars found that both men and women were the most satisfied with their lives in the 2000s than in the early 70s, but that the increases in happiness were greater for men than for women, illustrating a significant decrease in the happiness gap that existed between men and women in previous decades, mirroring trends in the states. To try and get a clear idea of why it is that women's happiness was declining or at least stagnating worldwide, the authors also examined several domains that may influence life satisfaction in more detail. They found no significant difference in satisfaction with employment across the sexes, hmm. although women who reported their job as keeping house generally reported lower levels of job satisfaction than did women employed in the workforce. However, over time, the gap between job satisfaction expressed by women working outside the home and inside the home decreased. And although this change in no way explained differences in overall happiness, the findings are indicative that women are happier being homemakers now than they were in the 1970s, following the women's liberation movement, a trend we will see a lot of. You know, I saw a TikTok of a girl, I think she was mostly being funny, but also maybe being serious, but she's like, I don't even want a job. And she was like crying. She's like, I don't even want a job, you know? And I think there's something to be said about like, what category of the populace do you fall under? You know what I mean? Where like, are you the kind of person that wants a job, like a serious job, like a like a people can depend on me for my income job? Or do you want to be the kind of person that has a job, but people don't depend on you for your income job? Or do you want to be a person that basically like has hobbies and doesn't have a job? And I or do you want to be a person who like doesn't have who just like does the bare minimum of existing? Um, and I think this is like a really important for you on the introspection journey to ask yourself, which one are you? Because I'm definitely like in that category where I want to have the job and I, I would prefer like, not that I would prefer people depending on me, but I'm happy to fulfill that role. So I, I would love to fulfill that role of like, I make the income and people depend on me or I have an income and I help my family and friends. Because look, even if I was really single and I made all this money, I'm making it for my family. I'm thinking about my siblings. I'm thinking if one of them gets sick, I'm thinking about a second home or someplace I can rent for them if God forbid something happens to them. Like I still think about my family. They think about me. We're all thinking about each other. Like, okay, what happens if one of us gets dementia? What happens if one of us gets paralyzed? What happens? Like who's going to need the help? You know what I mean? So why do we have a job? Why, who are we responsible for? Who is our community? Is it just us? Like, who is it? And like, that's the question you have to ask yourself. Like, I'm thinking about my in-laws. Like, obviously I'm going to help my in-laws in the future if they need money or my farm brother is going to take care of my parents. Like we, like we're already thinking about that. We're planning for it. Okay. Like we need to make X amount of dollars in 10 to 15 years to have enough money for ourselves and our our parents. Okay, okay. And even if our parents did their thing and were really responsible and retired themselves and did everything, which it looks like that's going to happen, it doesn't matter. You still have to prepare for something going very bad, right? So it's like, okay, so where are you on the spectrum? And then regardless of gender, because who fucking cares, right? Gender is such a construct. Who cares? Like who cares? Well, if you're a boy or a girl or something else, who cares? You as a person, are you the person who loves to work or not? Like, you know, we talked about poverty the other day, how you have to understand, like, if you're a person who's living off of, like, government assistance full time, which is totally fine. I'm not moralizing it. You are a type of person that's different than another type of person. Like, I can't live off of that. Like, you have to understand, I would rather work 17 different jobs if I had to, because the little you guys get paid is too little. Like, I don't know how y'all do it. And God bless you. I know a lot of you have to do it. But for those of that, but I've met a few people that I felt like, you don't have to do this. 
it would be better if like if I was you, I would do something different, but I'm not them and they obviously don't need to do it. And that's fine. So some people like are truly on disability. They they should be on disability. But also if I was in their situation, my brain would be like work more jobs so you can make more money because I can't live off $600 a month. Like I'm not doing it. So again, everyone's having a different relationship with their categorization. Are you the kind of person that can live off very little? Are you the kind of person that wants a certain standard of living? Are you the kind of person that, you know, is going to live in their car? Like, I mean, every type of person exists. So you have to think about that for yourself and then work off of that plan. When I say like pick a game to play, play to your strengths. Play to your strengths, okay? So I already know, like, if my dad died, God forbid, my mom would be chilling because my mom's, like, a volunteer person. She works at churches. She, like, helps her community. If my mom died, my dad would just throw himself more into work and, like, he would be devastated, I think. Like, they'd both be devastated, but my dad would throw himself into work. Like, I know he wouldn't lose himself. I know she wouldn't lose herself because they have lives. And so that's a big part of it. But my mom is centered around volunteering and my dad would be centered around work because my mom likes to work, but she's not a career person like my dad is. And I like to work and I'm not a, a volunteer person like my mom is. I do not want to fucking volunteer anywhere. Okay. In my 20s, I would volunteer. In my 20s, I would do activism and help local communities it's not fulfilling. I'm so sorry. God bless you. It does not feel like a full-time job. It feels like I'm wasting time. Like I didn't feel like I was getting the, enough resources to the people. It didn't feel satisfying. It didn't feel like I was making a difference. It didn't give me any fulfillment in the way that like working full-time does. And I feel like I'm still helping my community with my job. So again, you have to know your categorization and know what fulfills you and work a game that works for those things. So you're playing to your strengths, you know? And says, how would you feel about being a provider if you were not doing your dream job? Um, I don't understand the question, right? Because you're talking to somebody who, like, I do what I want. I live in a world with an immense privilege. I'm a woman in America in this time and age. Like, I... It was born into a family that knew how to get a job. I was a full-time nanny and that would have been a great job. Like that's – my plan B is still a dream job. Like my plan B is like be a full-time caregiver to children. Like awesome, bro. What – you know, help the next generation be awesome. Like cool, bro. That's so fulfilling, you know. So I don't understand. Like if you – if I didn't have a dream job, I, I don't understand the question, right? Because you're talking to somebody that like I don't have an option – in a way, like I, what do you mean? You know what I mean? Like, why wouldn't I have my dream job? Like what, what bubble would I would have, would I would have, what bubble would I have to be born into where I didn't have a job that fulfilled my joy? You know what I'm saying? Um, I just have too much access. Like I'm, I was born in America in 89, 1989. I have so many options. So there's just no way I wouldn't have a job that wouldn't, what that wouldn't feel like a dream job. You know what I mean? Um, does that make sense? I'm not sure if that makes sense. But I, I I would have to have been born into such a restrictive bubble, like where you just, you know, you had to survive and survive in a very particular way. And then at that point, you would just be grateful to like have food on your table. You know what I mean? It's different. Um, have you always just done what you want? Sort of. I've always done what I want. Uh, let me rephrase. I've always went for what I want. Even my dad told me when I was younger, he's like, you know, you're not going to work for somebody like a normal job. You can't. And it's true. Most of my siblings work for other people, but I'm one of the siblings that I can't do it. So two of us work for ourselves fully and we love those jobs. Like two of us, farm brother and me, the two siblings that are the same, we're very similar as siblings. We both work, run our own businesses and there's, and we would rather work 12 hour days, seven days a week than work for somebody else. You know what I mean? And so there's something about that. You know what I mean? Um, so you always just like aim for what you want. Like I I truly believe and my farm brother truly, we have an incredible amount of faith in ourselves. We just have the evidence that we're we're good at our, we are good at life. We have evidence at it. The thing I tackled for most of my 20s and my teens was my mental health and my philosophy on life. So I always knew I could work. That's what my therapist said to me when I went to go get diagnosed with borderline. She was like, hey, you're really amazing that you can work three jobs and have family and friends and like networks and a relationship and all that stuff. And I was like, sure. As I was like, I was breaking down, but it was just like one of those things where I was like, yeah, you know what I mean? 
like whatever it takes. So that's just my, that's my personality. You could argue that's the determinism working its magic. Like I am determined to be this person because like this is just who I am genetically. This is who I am as a personality. You know what I mean? I'm not saying you could be like this. I'm just saying this is how I, I am. You know what I mean? Um, did working in a grocery store fulfill your joy? No, not at all. Now, to be fair, at that time in my life, um, I wasn't fulfilled. I remember I was working really hard at the grocery store. And at, at a time, I was really happy there because I was really good at my job. Everyone liked me. Customers liked me. People would literally ask me out over the deli counter. It was so funny. They'd like slip me a piece of paper. in a hair. I was in a hairnet and an apron. And people would slip me their numbers. And I'm like, what is attractive about this? And it was the way I ran. It was the way that I I, I vibed with people. Like people really like me. I don't, I, I'm so honored. Like I love that. So I like that people like me. Well, I get along with people. I just like people. Um, even though I'm in my seclusion era, I also like people. So I appreciated that energy. I felt really good at the grocery store at some point, but I was never going to make enough money. I was just never going to make enough money. So I got a raise and it was like 10 cents. And I was like, you want me to be happy about 10 cents? I quit my job at the grocery store. I went to Hawaii for two weeks and with a partner and he paid for it. And when I was in Hawaii, we fought every day and I had breakdowns every day because like very toxic relationship. And his cousin was like, why don't you work with children? And I was like, I'm great with children. And while I was in Hawaii, I was applying for jobs. And by the time I landed back in Seattle, I had three interviews lined up. I got my first nanny job at $12 an hour for one kid. And then, or two kids, one kid, I think it was two kids actually, a boy and a boy. And then I ended up moving up, eventually made like 50K a year for one baby. And then I moved up. And so again, it's like, I, I know myself well enough to know that I have to be working hard to feel fulfilled and I have to be working with purpose. You know what I mean? But like, not everyone's like that. You know what I mean? Wait, you had a partner actually pay for something that's rare for you? Um, I'm okay with partners paying for shit, bro. Like, I don't care. But yeah, um, at the time, he paid for our airplane tickets and our trip to Hawaii. That was like, that was really interesting. He did, yeah, he did. He paid for it, which was nice. And then we stayed at his cousin's house, so we didn't even have to pay for a hotel or anything. Um, It was interesting. That was an interesting two weeks, but it shifted my whole life. So when I came back, I found nannying and I felt like my joy again and I felt really good. But then even though the job was really fulfilling, my life was unfulfilling because I was suffering with an undiagnosed mental illness I didn't know I had. I was suffering from two I didn't know I had. And then I was suffering from like my my grand purpose, my real joy. My real joy is my curiosity and like fulfilling that curiosity and I think that I didn't have a relationship with that until I was 30. So now if I had to go back to nannying, which would be great, I know exactly how I would do it, how I'd run the daycare, what licenses I would need, where I would move. Like I know how I would do it. I always have a business plan as a backup. But obviously like YouTube and content creation is my full-time career and I want to make it that forever, right? This is my career number one. And if I need a plan B, I have it. But it is one of those things where my joy is separate from my work. And then I chose a job that allows me to sort of like basically be curious 24-7. Like, look at us. We're like watching a video and we're talking. We're having discussion. And like my curiosity is like, do, 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 do. And I'm very fulfilled. And I'm like, oh, this is great. And like we get to talk and have great comfort. Like, great questions, guys. Like great. You know what I mean? Brittany, you told us you always initiate. So apparently not always. If they hit on you, they did the first move. Well, obviously not literally. Like I've been obviously not literally. Um, I don't. I don't mean, guys, I'm not, I'm not saying when I've, I'm not saying I literally always initiate, right? Like I've been asked out by like a lot of people. So obviously I've not always initiated. I mean, when I'm interested in somebody, not when they're interested in me, obviously, because like, why would I hit on a customer at work? You know what I mean? Like, obviously they have to be interested in me first. Um, but no, 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 of course not. Like, of course I've been asked out by a bunch of people I never initiated stuff with. Um, but the people I initiated stuff with is what I mean. Like the people I was into, obviously I initiated with them. Um, but I'm talking about the differences between relationships I had and just people who asked me out. Obviously, I, I said no to most people who asked me out because I could tell. I'm like, it's not going to be a vibe, dude. You know, it's not going to be a vibe. And then if you're on dating apps, you're both making the initiation, right? So it doesn't even count. It's like neutraled out. Um, you know what I mean? Um... Okay, give me two seconds. 
I'll be right back. Boop, 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 break time. A few minutes. Give me a second.
All right, all right, I am back. Hello, hello. My partner says it's statistically impossible for me to be pregnant and we are gonna vibe with these vibes, okay? That's the vibe we're gonna go off of. Over the course of this video, and perhaps reminiscent of a classic Joni Mitchell song, financial satisfaction followed a similar trend as fewer women reported being satisfied with their household finances in the 1970s than they did in the 2000s. And while there was a decline in men's financial satisfaction as well, it was significantly smaller than that seen in women. However, when marriage was added into the equation, the relationship was not so clear-cut. Both married men and women became more financially satisfied over time, while unmarried persons of both sexes became less satisfied. Although again, this decrease was most prominent in women. Regarding marriage, women always reported being less happy with their marriage than did men, mm. but women's reported marriage satisfaction declined over the years. During this period, pun intended, women's assessment of their physical health improved, which makes sense given the increased focus on women's health, including gynecological health, over time. In contrast, men's reported subjective health remained stable. When all variables that increased women's happiness were included as controls, researchers found that residual unexplained variables outside of those assessed were causing more damage to women's overall happiness than the control variables contributed to positively. With the falling reported well-being of women, these scholars also queried 12th graders to understand how young people in the 2000s may have differed from adults of previous decades and found that 12th grade girls reported themselves to be under more pressure and having less hmm. leisure time with friends than previous generations. And that this decrease in adolescent satisfaction over time- Well, look, okay, I think there's like a confusion thing that happens and I don't know why it happened this way. Where again, there were some women that knew when going into the workforce or quote unquote being equal to quote unquote men, it's very silly, there was going to be less time to do leisurely things. I'm not sure that that's quite the association that we're dealing with in this study, but <laughs> I will say there seems to be a misunderstanding with like what, how life can change so quickly once there's a different standard of expectation. And I think that's interesting, right? I wonder if people are, they have like a fantasy of like, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And then they don't have the reality mixed in to like what is happening. Like, oh, I'm going to be a mom of five kids, but then don't think about that means like five years of changing diapers or like, you know, I was at the grocery store with my partner and I was like, let's go to the baby aisle and look at diaper prices as a reminder of the responsibility we'll have to face. Because remember, when you have a baby, you're not just having the baby. You're paying for the diapers. You're paying for clothes. You're paying for shoes. You're paying for, you're paying for so much. That's why I'm sitting here like, if you can't afford yourself, how are you affording a baby? Because like diapers alone were like, what was it? $25 for 40 diapers. <clears throat> How many times a day do you change a baby's diaper? Hopefully often. You know, hopefully you're not one of those parents that just lets them sit in their like pee and poo for hours and hours. You know what I mean? But it is one of those things where I know a lot of parents who are like, I can't be just like changing diapers like this. Or when I nannied, we use some cloth diapers. You know what I mean? So it is one of those things, you know. Uh, five years of diapers when you have five kids. Not if, no, if when you have five kids, it's not two years of diapers, right? If you're having five kids, that's at least two to years each kid. So it's like 10 years of diapers, depending on how you view it. You know what I mean? But hopefully your kid is potty trained by two to three years old, if you're lucky. Because I know I was potty trained. I think my mom potty trained all of us pretty quickly. You know what I mean? Pretty quickly. And cloth diapers are great, but they do smell and they're very difficult to clean. Honestly, they're not my preference. Like as a nanny who had to deal with them, they were a cool idea, but they didn't last like they didn't last very long. Um, there are a lot to clean and they're quite expensive uh, initially. Um, oh, yeah. And baby formula is super expensive. Like hopefully, obviously, I would breastfeed. But that's another thing. So if I had the baby, I would be breastfeeding. So am I breastfeeding during my streams? Am I breastfeeding during like my calls? Am I... How am I going to work? You know what I'm saying? Am I pumping through the night? And then I'm giving, like, I have to think about all of those things and time is money. So it's like, okay, how much and it's, that's the problem is like, I like being a full-time mom or a full-time worker, like that's impossible to me. I just think it's, I don't think it's possible. And so it is one of those things where mm, I got to think about it, really think about it, you know? I'm occurred both absolutely and relationship to 12th graders of the past and relative to boys as well. When asked what aspects of their life they believed was important, teenage girls in 2006 expressed increased importance. In 2006, I was one year away from graduating high school. So I was in high school in 2006. Of 13 of the I 14 domains assessed, with the exception of one, finding purpose and meaning in life. 
being the only domain that young girls were not more concerned with in that year than they had been in decades past. Specifically, girls attached more importance to non-domestic related aspirations, such as being successful in work, finding a steady job, contributing to society, and being a leader in the community. You would think these things would be related to increased focus on finding meaning in one's life, but they were not, which at least to me may indicate that the desire to work and for success is perhaps more performative than it is aspirational. That is, over time though, women became more like Patrick Bateman. There is an idea of a Patrick Bateman. <laughs> Some kind of abstraction. But there is no real me. Men also expressed increased interest in these domains, but to a lesser extent. As such, young girls have come to be more and more preoccupied with work and activism, while being less preoccupied with actually finding meaning in their lives. And this change in interest has coincided with a continual decrease in female happiness, both universally and in comparison to their male counterparts, that is not well explained by increasing physical health, decreasing marital satisfaction, decreased financial satisfaction, and increased satisfaction with being a homemaker over an employee or vice versa. The aforementioned assessment from Stephen and Wolfers caused something of a stir at its time of publication, both in academia and the media, despite coming from mass-level survey data. It flew in the face of all of the promises of feminism, in that it didn't seem that women's liberation had actually made women happier. Quite the opposite, in fact. It was speculated by some that the reason for this paradox was the increased pressures on women to be girl bosses in the workforce, but also still come home and be good moms and wives, and had created an unrealistic expectation that women could have it all. Mm. And subsequently- Yeah, that's interesting, because men don't have it all, right? Men who work full-time and aren't with their children, they lose out on being- Why do you think men didn't want to have it all, but women are, are sort of branded to have it all? Why is it being a parent and a girl boss is having it all, but when you're a man, that's not the case? And I don't think it's like biological or evolution, because if you look at past- um, like past communities of villages, obviously it didn't quite work that way, or maybe it did, or maybe it shouldn't even, maybe we shouldn't even look at the past. Maybe we should just look at the present. Why don't present modern men see being a parent and a, and a boss as the whole package? You know what I mean? Cause that's something to think about. Like that's something that I, I wonder, you know, and again, for me, I see being a, like the whole package as, maintaining joy and like peace and harmony within the self so obviously that's why yeah that's that's the question I would ask myself I don't yeah I don't know why that is why men would have to answer that question I think too because I don't know you know Donna oh my oh my gosh girl I caught you live I spoke with you a couple years ago about my daddy well hello girl what's up Amber says, I just want to know why young girls are so susceptible to everything, activism, predators, any social con um, contagion. <laughs> I, I think women are, oh, women are open. Women are just open, you know? Maybe it's that. <clears throat> Maybe it's that. Oh, my gosh. You're so sweet. Um, I just have to say you are helping me so much find my way. Love your levels video. Yay. Yay. I love it too. Links down below for the levels video, guys. But like, this is interesting to me. I honestly, like, obviously, um, can you repeat the question? So the video is saying that women feel this pressure to be the whole package, to be a breadwinner or a boss girl slash a stay-at-home mom or slash a good parent. I wonder why men don't feel that way. Or if they do, are they not talking about it? So that's what I'm interested in. Because again, for me, I'm at the stage in life. I've been very transparent and open about this, right? I personally, I don't want to do both. I don't want to be a full-time parent and a full-time worker. I want to be one or the other. And I'm willing to go part-time on working, but not part-time on being a parent. So what does that mean, right? For my, oops, I feel like if I have a child, I would want to bring that child into the world with a full-time parent accessible to them. Uh, until they go to school and then obviously they would part-time parent because those kids would go to school and that parent could go back into work but if I don't put full-time into my career then my career is not gonna stabilize I have to do this full-time for it to work right so my career has to come first unless my partner decides to go into a specific field where he's working full-time and very successful because we also have a standard of living we want so again, when I think about having the whole package, I think about actually having a life that's 
that's good. I don't want to be stressed out like this. Life is already stressful. I don't want to regret my life. I don't want to regret anything um, that isn't within reason because we all have regrets. I regretted plenty in my 20s. But again, I wonder if men also feel this stress to be like an amazing dad and parent and to be a boss, you know. <clears throat> and again, my dad, I think, did want to be that. So he came home every night. We had dinner with a fam as a family every night and I got him on the weekends. So that felt pretty good. And we saw our dad in the morning, to be fair, because he would take us to school or whatever. Um, so I guess we got both. We got enough of them. And then we got our mom full time. That's how my husband looked at it. He wanted the job, the wife, and he really wanted the kids. <clears throat> hey, this is it came in late. Did the video say that women are more unhappy than men now or the decrease in happiness is greater than men's decrease in happiness? You know, I'm not sure at this. I think they're saying it's less than the women from before. And I'm not sure if the guys did the video say that it's less than men or it's not very much different. You know, <clears throat> yeah, I am interested. Huh, interesting. Hmm. I think because a lot of men view traditional, traditionally feminine gender roles as being weak in a way. Mm, maybe. I think it's because we were never told we could have it all. Oh, interesting. Socially speaking, being a full time parent is uh, considered being a failure. Maybe that's it. That's a good point. So do you do men in the audience feel like they were never told they could have it all? And so they don't relate to this narrative? Because I definitely feel like women were told that probably because there was an oppression issue where women were not given the option. Like back in the day, women couldn't even have their own bank accounts without being married and having like male partners. Right. So there is a narrative in which women maybe needed to hear they could have it all because they at what point were told they weren't even allowed to legally have it. Versus men were always always had the accessibility, and minus if you were black at a certain point in America or uh, an immigrant of some sort. So I wonder if that's why women got that narrative and men didn't. You know what I mean? Hmm. The traditional men's parent role was mostly entirely as a protector for men that wanted a more active role but wasn't able to do it because of work demands. Um, died with regret in their mid-50s like real men. Oof. Oof. Huh. I have a friend who has her own uh, business and includes her kids. She homeschools them and is super successful in her business as well. She's a superwoman, but she makes it up. Her husband was able to quit his job, so they're all in it 24-7. Okay, there you go. <coughs> that's something to do. That's another way to, like, that's another way to play the game to your, to your success. And that's something to think about as well. That's what I think about is, like, how do we as a team – play life in a way that makes sense for our joy, not like societies. And then if the society isn't vibing with us, like where do we move that it vibes? And obviously I live in Croatia now for a reason, right? It's a vibe out here, guys. It's a vibe, you know? My dad used to leave on business trips, but only up to a week at a time. But we didn't mind back in because of the abuse. Oh, P.S. Now he's actually changed. I'm glad he's changed. That's really nice. Stephanie says, I think guys absolutely have the stress. There's just no girl boss word for men that have it all. They are successful in their careers, but not at present father. They're just a shitty dad. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. Not many, uh, not true. Uh, many rich people have great relationships with their kids. I hear the opposite. It depends on how hands on you are. Even um, Kevin O'Leary from Shark Tank says that the reality is, is like he was a bad father growing up because he was never there for his kids, which is because he was working and building his empire. And he says one of the consequences to doing this kind of job is like you don't see your family. So you have to really make it up later in life. Hopefully you're still alive to make it up. And studies show that parents who work more than spend time with their kids their kids reported more unhappiness and dissatisfaction with their parenting style, like growing up, their parents' parenting style, than children who had parents who were more accessible to them. Like kids don't care about their parents' money as long as they're not living in poverty. Because if you're not really living in poverty, like kids can manage in struggling homes. Like if you're lower middle class or even like, you know, kind of like living sort of, sort of paycheck to paycheck, sort of, sort of, like kids still manage, right? So it is kind of interesting. <clears throat> It left women feeling unhappy when they were unable to live up to that unrealistic expectation. So what about women who do try to- See this? Like this? This never happens. This isn't allowed in my home. I don't know if about you. This is, this is not allowed. Like 
as children, you are you can't do this to your parents. Do you know what I mean? I don't know if um if you like if you grew up in a similar bubble, but like you uh, this isn't allowed. You can't like you can be kids, but you, you be respectful of people around you. If you notice your siblings studying, if you notice your mom is working, if you notice your dad is like focusing, like don't be distracting. Don't be rude. Go outside. You have the outside. Go outside. Go outside. You know what I mean? Like, what are you doing? So this is what's funny to me. Is like, I wonder if parents are so stressed because like you're letting your kids dominate your life. Tell your kid to grow some fucking manners and shut the fuck up. Not literally like that, obviously, but like raise a child who's going to be a good adult. This is not going to be a good adult. N uncaring, not considerate. You know what I mean? Obviously, this is like a fake scenario, but I've seen parents like this. Even even people um, I've seen in my life, I was like, so your kid runs the, the household, huh? And they're like, what are you saying that for? And I was like, well, it's like kind of obvious, like you're kind of a bottom to your kid, bro. Obviously not from brother. And I was like, that's kind of weird. How do you feel about your two-year-old running the show? And they're like, well, they're, he's two. Like, I can't just control him. And I was like, maybe you shouldn't have, like, procreated. Maybe your genetics are bad. You know what I mean? Like, I'm sorry. I'm being judgy. Like, you need, like, I don't mean that literally. Like, I know you're good parents. But, like, also, you have to be the parent. You have to, like, you have to parent your children. Otherwise, you're going to go crazy. You're going to be stressed. You're not going to sleep. Put your kids. Give them a bedtime. Spend time with your spouse. Give them their own room and own space. Like, let's go. And if you were too poor to have kids, well, hello, ma'am. Why we fucked ourselves over twice? Hello, you know? Have it all and attain some degree of success at accomplishing oh, that goal. Where's the volume? Are they happier than women who don't? Actually, according to oh my- Oh my god, what? Hello? Is it my earphones? Did I unplug my earphones? What? At least 22 survey- was it even playing just now? Because I couldn't hear it. Have it all. Okay, hold on. I'm going to rewind it. Oh, no. I'm Increase rewinding it. And why subsequently left okay. women feeling unhappy. Sorry, hold on. How do you recommend we instill discipline in children? My brother's kids run the show and it's sad. Oof. Values, bro. It has to be about values from the parents. Why did they have kids? And what is their obligation? Like, what is their obligation as parents? It's to raise competent adults. And to raise a competent adult, you have to be one. You can't instill discipline in your children when you don't have enough to parent them. So the problem isn't with the kids. It's with your brother. Okay? It's with your brother. Like, that's who it's with. It's with the parents. You know what I mean? when they were unable to live up to that unrealistic expectation. So what about women who do try to have it all and attain some degree of success at accomplishing that goal? Are they happier than women who don't? Actually, according to Motherly's 22 survey on the state of motherhood, 22% of non-employed mothers said a cultural shift around the expectation that women- <laughs> Look at this little babino. Notably, 24% of Gen X moms say that they're- there was a cultural shift around the expectation that women can do it all. Feelings of burnout would greatly reduce- be greatly reduced. Only 90% of millennial moms feel that way. And do it all would be the best way that they believed they could decrease their feelings of burnout. But for more answers, we can look to a study from Bertrand 2013 who utilized data from the GSS between 1972 and 2010 and the American Time Use Survey's well-being instrument from 2010 to examine the relationship between education, career, and satisfaction in women. For women born between 1944 and 1957, those with neither a career nor family were about as likely to report being very happy as those with a career and no family, 28.4% and 29.9% respectively. In other words, having a career for this generation did absolutely nothing for their well-being. Women from this cohort wait, with wait, a family wait, wait, wait. with wrong? neither a faction in women. For women born between 1944 and 1957, those with neither a career nor family were about as likely to report being very happy as those with a career and no family, 28.4% and 29.9% respectively. In other words, having a career for this generation did absolutely nothing for their well-being. Women from this cohort with a family and no career were the happiest, with 45.9% reporting being very happy, while a slightly smaller percentage, 42.2% of women with both a family and a career reported being somewhat happy. For college-educated women born after 1957, things were a bit different, as while women with neither a career nor a family were the least likely to report being very happy, at a somewhat lower level than those from the older cohort, 26.6%, 
Women with a career but no family were more likely to report being very happy. No career, no family, career, no family. Happy at 36.8%. Those with both a career and family were only slightly more prone to report being very happy mm. at 39.6%. But once again, women with family but no career were the most likely to report being very happy at 47.2%. Oh my gosh, that's so interesting. <clears throat> Yeah, I don't think I fall into the statistical probability. I don't think I'm the average woman. I'm almost, I've always known that about myself, but truly, 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 like, <clears throat> there's no way. There's no way I could relate to this. Like, not in the same way. I, I think for a time in my life, oh God, I can't imagine it. I've always worked. I've worked since I was 11 years old. And I've always dreamed about working. I've always dreamed about owning my own business. I've always dreamed about being a radio star. I've always dreamed about being... A work, like I've always dreamed about working, always. And so I think that I just don't fall into this, but I wonder how many of you guys do because so many of my girlfriends fit sort of into this or they fit into the desire to have like a career as well. Like a few of my friends are definitely choosing to like forego children for their career because they're going to like resent their kids if they have them over their job. But a lot of the women I know are choosing to be mothers or would really like to stay home with their children. I just don't think I fall into this category. Like, I think I am considered an anomaly. I have, I don't have, even when I was a child, I wanted to have a family and work. So I don't, even if I took a couple years off to just have babies, I always had the dream of going back to work versus I know a lot of people like don't want to go back to work, which I think is fine, by the way. I really do believe in like active stay at home partners or active stay at home parents. As long as you're like active and you're wonderful, like I'm in, I'm in, I'm in it to win it. Let's go. So yeah, I kind of wonder, I kind of wonder, because even if somebody gave me like a million dollars and was like, what do you want to do with that? I was like, um, build my business or invest in my business or start another like in-person business or like I have a slight dream of a business in mind that I wouldn't associate with my name one day that I think I would want to do, but it's like way later in the future. <clears throat> and I think about it as like my, my dream plan. Um, but I would need a lot of money. So I would need capital. So it's like, okay, there's like all these dreams I have and I wouldn't, I would never be able to do them with kids. I just, I can't, I couldn't do them with kids. I just couldn't even imagine dedicating my life to those career dreams with children, but I couldn't imagine not having kids and not doing them. So if I don't have kids, I better accomplish all these goals. I better accomplish these goals. You know what I'm saying? Two to four million, I'm retiring. Yeah, I do not want to stop working. Like, but I do, you know, I, I couldn't just not work. Like, I have to do something. And I can't volunteer. It's not interesting enough. Like, I need a challenge. So it's interesting. Like, what would you do? You know, what would you do? What would you do? Do, 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 do. As such, women under the age of 55 when this study was published were slightly more likely to be very happy when they had a family and no career than women over that age, while the percentage of very happy women with both a career and a family decreased slightly by 2.6%. Hmm. In contrast, women with a career but no family saw the largest changes in percentages of happiness, increasing by 6.9% in those born after 1957, again a trend that aligns with societal changes as these women would have come of age during the height of the women's liberation movement, but also the launch of Sputnik. Coincidence? I think not. There is no such thing as a coincidence. Oh my god, no. <laughs> we love him. He's so funny. What happened to the philosophy retreat business stream? Um, I think humans are too human to accomplish it realistically. Humans would ruin it. They've already ruined. They, they ruin too much. They don't mean to, but they really do. That's why I always joke about like I'm not going to do it because like they're going to ruin it with drama or clout or something like humans genuinely if it's centered around a person they will find a way to like ruin it and so I'm just like mm, I'm not gonna do that but um but you know there, that there's something to be said about it's really weird it's like very confusing when you decide to do things that involve like groups of people you know what I mean like groups of people is like what kind of people would it bring in you know what I mean? Who would it who would it attract? And when you do retreats, if you do like adult camp, if you do anything like that, it does attract a certain group of people. And 
it puts a bunch of adults with certain kinds of personalities in a closed space together and shit just hits the fan. The drama is clear. It happens at, hello, I just watched Matt Delahanty throw a fit at Andrew Wilson because Andrew was being such a troll at a debate event. Like, you just bring certain people into a room, especially people who are, like, interested in philosophy, and then you get a whole room of e- people with egos who all think they're fives <laughs> or sixes or eights or whatever in a room together, and then everybody's fucking in the back pool, and there's, you know, sperm in the the hot tub. It's like, it's a mess. I just, people are messy. So it just, I don't think it's going to work long term, but it was a nice idea while I fantasized about it. The fact that you're watching this video means you're energetically aligned with me and- See, I should have just done this for a career. I should have just trolled everybody. This message. Your thoughts create your reality. <clears throat> but you already knew that, yet you still live a life that you dread. Citizen. When looking just to college educated women over the age of 40 who had largely ended their fertile years, Career satisfaction was no longer a significant predictor of life satisfaction. Marriage predicted happiness in all women of all ages, but for women over 40, being both married and having a career was no longer related to happiness. Similarly, having kids and a husband were always associated with happiness, but having both a family and a career was unrelated to happiness in women over the age of 40. Compared to women that had neither a career nor a family, those with only family were happier, less sad and less stressed, while those sense. with only a career reported lower sense of meaning in their daily lives. Exactly. Like you need your consistency, community and structure. Science has shown this. This is why religious communities fare fairly like better. OK, so you need to have those three things. And then on top of that, if you don't have a relationship with your consciousness, of course, you're going to feel like you died alone. Of course, you're going to feel that way. Right. You have to have a connection to the people around you or at least such a good relationship with yourself. You know what I mean? There's something to be said about Again, the why. Why is this really happening? Because people will blame all kinds of reasons, but I genuinely always feel like it goes down to the relationship you're having with your consciousness. I just feel like that is so important and everyone neglects it. If I just have a better job, if I just have kids, if I just have, if I just have, if I just have, what if you just, like, what if you were enough? You know, what if you were enough? You know, <laughs> Brittany Camp would be a mess. Brittany Camp would be a mess. It would be a mess. Like adult camps that exist are great. But even those, like no matter where you go, it's just drama. I love people, but like people are drama. I think the only thing I might contemplate doing in the future is a silent retreat where you can't talk. But see, you could still fuck and not talk. See, I'm telling you the fucking is the problem. People would join this community to like flirt and become friends and create drama. And I'm like, what if I had an asexual, platonic, no sexual energy retreat center? What if I did that? You can't do anything. What if it's like a like a spa so you meditate and there's no fucking allowed? But clothes are optional. Ooh, playing with fire. <laughs> Further, it appeared that the combination of career and family decreased positive affect and increased- Oh my gosh, great question, Terry. How do you have a relationship with your consciousness? I've never heard of a, such a concept. Lo great question. We love that question here. That is what my work is about. You should check out my levels video, link in the description. But you're having a relationship with yourself, right? So depending on why you think you're here as a human, what you're doing on the planet, if a God puts you here, if evolution puts you here, like first you got to start there. But it's a relationship with yourself. That's all the consciousness is, right? You're having a relationship with yourself. You're saying like, who am I? What am I doing here? But what am I doing here in relation to myself, the relationship I'm having with me? Because the world will tell you what you're doing here. Other cultures will tell you what you're doing here. Hell, you skip towns, they'll tell you what you're doing there. You go to a different YouTube community, they'll tell you what you're doing. But what are you doing? What are you really doing? And that's the question you need to ask your consciousness yourself. You need to meditate with yourself or pray or whatever your version of meditation is and ask yourself, okay, how do I have a relationship with myself? So I'm seeking my joy, which is furthest from evil, right? A lot of these women are being told, or a lot of these women are reporting unhappiness. And I really think it's an unhappiness with themselves. You know what I mean? Because again, if you know yourself, you'll know how much you need to talk to your friends, how much community you need, how much food you need, how much water you need, how much everything you need. If you really know yourself, and that takes a long time and it's a hard struggle because you have to face yourself. You have to admit to yourself when you're wrong, when you aren't perfect, when you're not doing great. And you have to, you know, there's so much that goes into this, but it's really the relationship you're having with your consciousness, right? 
And I think that that is a really difficult thing to have. It's a relationship with your consciousness. When, when you're born into the world, you're usually born into a family with an expectation of behavior, given a dream, a list of jobs that are appropriate. And then you're told like what you should be like as an adult. And oh, guess what? When you're an adult, now you have to be this kind of a woman or this kind of a man or this kind of a person. <clears throat> and that's the irony is like everyone's like, why am I so unhappy? Have you ever thought to ask yourself if this is the life you wanted or if this is just the life somebody else like signed you up for, you know? Sadness, stress, and tiredness. There was no evidence for greater satisfaction in women who managed to combine having a family with a career, nor that women with a career but no family were more satisfied than women that had neither. In total, stay-at-home wives were less stressed, tired, and sad and spent about 4% less of their day in a poor mood state than women with a career who spent about 2-3% to more of their average day in such a state. Additionally, the worst off group according to this analysis appeared to be wives and mothers that were working some sort of job but who did not have a career. Thus, it does seem, at least according to these data, that women who try to have it all were less likely to find happiness in doing so than women who focused exclusively on raising a family. You kids don't know what you want! That's why you're still kids, because you're stupid. <laughs> the persistent out. <laughs> I never, <laughs> I never watched The Simpsons growing up. It's so funny. <laughs> Be it shortening gap between male and female happiness may uh. actually also help explain another major cause of life distress, but also Ooh. forming another seeming paradox in that the wider the gap between happiness levels in heterosexual couples, the greater the likelihood that said couple would get divorced, as seen in a study from Guven, Senek, and Sichnoff, whose name definitely sounds a lot like a person of shadow. Although the divorce rate <sighs> in the U.S. has declined since the 1990s... Uh, Metaform says, yeah, follow this OF model to tell you the secrets to happiness. Thank you so much for supporting my work. I 100% agree with you. I have attained not only consistent happiness, though happiness is an emotion, so don't expect it every day, all day, but joy. Joy is what I will lead you to. I am so proof in the pudding that my system works. I have callers that have benefited from my work, viewers that have benefited from my work. Thank you so much. Like, for thank you. I agree with you, commenter. I literally believe in my, my work so much. I stand by it full force because it works and it does, right? And the proof is in the pudding. I really believe in you, your ability to overcome and your ability to face yourself. Don't listen to miserable people on the internet that are literally going in cycles of depression and anxiety and can't even humanize themselves. What I'm telling you right now, you absolutely can get better, okay? Everybody knows if you know my story that I went most of my life wanting to unalive myself, undiagnosed illnesses, no like no sense of purpose or joy, only to eventually find it while understanding my consciousness, me, myself. Be selfish in a healthy way, not in an unhealthy way. This is key. Be selfish in a healthy way. This video we're watching is proof, is so proof of what I've been saying. None of these people are talking about the consciousness. None of these people are saying like, have you ever asked yourself like, what do you want? Because again, just because feminism gave you the option of being the breadwinner doesn't mean it's going to fulfill your joy. And just because you're a man doesn't mean being the breadwinner is going to fulfill your joy. You have to ask yourself the consciousness, what is going to fulfill my joy? What is going to fulfill my joy? My joy. My joy. Okay? Not my hedonism, not my temporary wants, not my horniness, not society, not monetary value, not, not temporary. Temporary happiness is cope and it's fine. Okay, temporary joy is cope. It's fine. I'm not moralizing it, but it's not going to last you. And then you're going to end up a statistical probability of unjoyful populace. You don't have to be that way. You don't have to be like a majority of people who re re like refuse to face themselves, right? Who refuse to face themselves. Ooh, metaphor. Good point. You're being so abstract. What are you even talking about? If you know, you know, and if you don't, you don't. If you don't even know what I'm talking about, that means you haven't even started the first stage of facing yourself, which is great. That's a great question, right? What am I talking about, guys? I'm talking about knowing yourself and I'm talking about actually knowing yourself enough to find joy, actually living the life you want. You have a short time on earth and then you die. And in that short time, you can truly be happy and truly be joyful. Happiness is an emotion. It's fluid. It's not every day, all day, right? Right? But joy can be consistent even when the world is shattering around you, right? And this is really important, you know? If you're really about, wait, 
you'll tell your audience what actually makes people happy? I do. And if you guys want, we can book a call and talk one-on-one -on -one, or you guys can ask specific questions, but I do. Literally stick around. It will, it will show. It will show. You know what I mean? I like your cynicism though. It's really, it's so beautiful. It's the perfect indicator. The cynicism, whether it's a troll or not, is the perfect example of somebody who's like at the beginning stages of the journey, right? Of knowing themselves. Cynicism, pessimism, negativity, like all of those things are just the beginning stages, which is great. It's great. That's exactly where you should be so you can be somewhere else later. He's falling from almost five per 1,000 people in crude analysis to three per 1,000 in 2018. More than half of marriages in the country still end in divorce. And part of that decline in divorce rates is likely not because couples are separating less, but rather because they're far less likely to get married in the first place, as the marriage rate in the States has plummeted, dropping from nearly 10 per thousand in 1990 to seven per thousand in 2016, mm. and then decreasing another three points by 2020. As such, Gouven et al. were interested in how the happiness gap between the sexes might have influenced divorce rates, which they assessed using data from the German Socioeconomic Panel between 1984 and 2007, the British Household Panel Survey between 1996 and 2007, and the Household Income and Labor Dynamics Survey in Australia between 2001 and, you guessed it, 2007. So two former imperialist powers and an actual threat. So I can wish for anything. Anything! Oh my gosh, Alicia, that is the sweetest comment I've ever read. I fell out of your content about two years ago, not sure why, and I've been back for the last three weeks. I honestly feel like I'm breathing again. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. That is, yes, that's what I wanna hear. Let's go. Uh, that's awesome. They found that after controlling for the total level of happiness of a couple, as well as various other potential confounds, including age, age differences, education of spouses, duration of the marriage, number of children and household income, a one unit increase in the happiness gap between spouses raised the probability of separation by 0.23 in Germany, 0.2 in Australia, and 0.08 in the United Kingdom. The average general risk of breakup at any point is about 2%, and as such, the happiness gap represented a non-negligible risk of marriage dissolution. This effect was not equal across the sexes as, in all three countries, a situation in which the woman was unhappier than her partner increased the risk of separation in the following year by about 0.5, while such an effect was not present in couples or in the male was less happy than his female partner. Such findings provide an explanation as to why, in Australia, 60% of separated women reported that she was responsible for the divorce, compared to only 16%. I always consider this um, a part of females like independence. A lot of people think women aren't independent by nature, but I would argue that because women are the reason for divorce, they are independent by nature more than men. And I grew up in a bubble that, you know, was Middle Eastern bubble, but it was like my big fat Greek wedding, like literally where the men were the quote unquote head, but the women were the neck and the men did need the women more than the women needed the men. Like the women were very independent and self-sufficient in a lot of ways, even if they were stay at home moms, they didn't need the men the way the men needed the women. Like I grew up in a bubble where like if your wife dies before you, you are emotionally screwed as a man. Versus if the men die before the women, the women like really managed to like keep the family together. So I think there's something to be said about like women's inherent um, independent nature. And I just, I do think women value themselves more than men value themselves. I think modern men's in this bubble, modern men's resentment towards women comes from their inability to face themselves and recognize like they don't value themselves as much as they should. And I know some men are saying that some men are like, no one values us, but it's not women who are not valuing you it's you and then you're signaling to women not to value you like it's a self-fulfilling prophecy so the same specific group of men that are bitter against women very specific group of men right they are so upset right that they are not being valued but they don't even value themselves and so again like in order to you have to know why you value yourself. Nobody is like default deserving of anything right we're just human I believe we're animals on a planet evolved over time. So I want there to be like an understanding that depending on your category of person and where you belong in the bubbles, right, you're going to have a completely different relationship with all of these things. It's like, again, it's like the incel group. We'll watch that video too. There's a video I want to watch with you where it's like these, some of the incels will blame women. Like women won't pick me. It's like, sir, you wouldn't pick you. You wouldn't pick you. 
All I wanted in life was a partner who was similar enough to me that we would like agree on reality and vibe with values. And when I found that, I put a ring on it, girl. The moment I found that human, I was like, you're my person, right? And he's like, yeah, you're my person, right? I was like, yep, this is it, right? This is the thing they talk about in books. This is it. Cool. Let's do it. And it's been the greatest decision we ever made. It was like the greatest decision we ever made was knowing ourselves well enough to know to pick our partners. Like it was the greatest thing we ever did for each other, even though we hadn't even met yet, was to literally get to know ourselves so we could know our partner when we met them versus what we did in the past, which was like dating people and wondering like, are you them? Are you them? Are you them? It was very easy to clearly see my partner when they came into view because I had done the work with my consciousness. I had like learned myself, right? So again, I I really think there's a disconnect here about, and I don't want you to put that, oh, I don't want you to have that like, everyone's a queen. Everyone is like, everyone is valuable. Everyone deserves love. Like, I don't know what you mean when you say that. I think it's just like a hallmark thing you say to yourself to make yourself feel better. <clears throat> when I say like you should be somebody that you would date, I mean like you should have a good sense of character that the right person when they come into your life sees that and you guys match up. Again, if my partner and I met five years ago, we wouldn't have been compatible because we, yet we wouldn't have faced ourselves individually enough to be the person we could marry. My partner and I could not have met before we met. We wouldn't have been compatible. This is like a very important part that no one's paying attention to. So when you get married and you settle and you don't know you're settling yet and you grow out of your marriage because you didn't even know yourself when you got married and you grew apart and you're a woman especially who's going to be introspective and go on that journey, hello, of course you're going to get divorced. Of course you're going to get divorced. Of course you don't know yourself yet, you know? And look, some marriages work out anyways. That's great. But you wonder why the divorce rate is so high? I'm telling you who attributed sole responsibility to her ex-husband. Similarly, nearly two-thirds of German women reported initiating divorce. As such, women are generally more likely to end a marriage and couples for whom female happiness is lower than male happiness are more risk of breaking up in the following year. That is, your girl is more likely to leave you if you're happier than she is. So I guess get more depressed, lads. It's not that. It's not that. It's just that some men are very simple which is, again, it goes to their, like, eagerness for dependency versus independency. I feel like independent people are a little bit more complicated because they are independent. So they are, they desire more versus a less dependent or a more dependent person is willing to settle for, like, quote unquote, less. But it's not less. It's simple. It's just simplicity. I knew a, a couple. <clears throat> they were a really good couple together for a while. They got together pretty young. And one of the dilemmas that ended up happening is the guy wanted to stay like a 90s sitcom dad who came home, kicked up his boots or took off his boots, kicked up his feet, drank a beer. And that's a great life. But his wife wanted to pursue like higher education, more like volunteer work, um, being a part of the community. So they ended up growing apart because <clears throat> of lifestyle of of um, like she wanted to be more independent and he wanted to be more simple, which is great. Like what a great life to be simple, right? But simplicity breeds dependency and also um, like a lack of ingenuity sometimes. And so there is sort of this disconnect. It's not more, again, I'm not moralizing it. Pay attention. I'm not moralizing your lives. I'm saying if you want to live a life where you literally work your nine to five, come home, drink a beer, that's beautiful. What a great life. But that life is not going to work for somebody who's very independent. And that's the dilemma. Now, I'm a very independent person, and so is my partner. We consider each other very independent people, but we're also a team. So we work together, and our life is centered around that team effort. So again, he he's not that kind of person, right? So we're both, like, very interested in more. We want to talk all day. Like, the men I'm thinking about that are, like, more simple, they don't want to talk all day. They don't want to face themselves. They don't want to have lots of conversations. They just want to, like, live a very simple life, which is fine. But like my partner and I, all we're doing is problem solving, talking all day, discussing philosophy, going through stuff, you know, blah, 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 blah. We would be very hard partners for simple people. And simple isn't bad because I think we're very simple in our own way, but it's very different, right? Like my whole family is very like talk, 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 question, 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 philosophy. And when we, when again, like 
Everyone's having a different relationship with these words. Oh, great question. Do you mind defining independent? <clears throat> this is a difficult one to define because I think everyone is dependent independent on a spectrum. In many ways, my partner is dependent on me since he doesn't have a job anymore. In many ways, I'm very independent because I've kept my job. But I'm talking about personality. I'm talking about personality as much as I'm talking about action. So some people genuinely, like, they just want to um, okay, for the sake of this conversation, let's associate independence with curiosity as well. Just for the sake of this conversation, just for the sake of this conversation, right? She'll create her own meaning. Yes, I will, because meaning is a construct. Good job. You are keeping up, Maniform. You are, you are doing very good today in class. Very good job. Everything is a construct. So if for the sake of this conversation, in context, because context matters, words mean different things in context, when I'm talking about independence, I'm talking about curiosity versus dependency, lack of curiosity, right? There's something to be said here. So if you're less curious and you're more dependent, you are more focused on what you can create in the moment, in that little bubble, in the span of time. If you're independent and curious, you'll go and seek out information. You'll spend a lot of time seeking out information. But if you're dependent in a very specific way, you're dependent on the intermediate no desire to go out and grab. And that's how I view it in this context. When you have a very hyper-independent partner and a more dependent partner, you can make it work, it happens, but it also creates like, and can create a rift, a lack of intimacy, a lack of time spent together, a lack of desire to have the conversation. And again, everyone is different, right? Raiders cat, 11 months, let's go. Indiana and Raider would be great buddies. I believe it. I believe it so much. I believe it so much. By the way, she came in and scratched my chair today and tried to destroy it. This girl, my cat trying to ruin everything, girl. She trying to ruin everything. You know what I mean? <clears throat> At least on the positive side, she'll probably help you on that journey. And perhaps that's the only time she'll help with anything. Of course, not according to Mom Life Comics, but let's just say I don't think she's a very trustworthy source. And before you rush to the comments to complain that I'm only making these jokes because I'm a pick me, I regret to- And by the way, for, for the sake of conversation, there's another context of independence that people get confused, which is like always going out, always being active. I feel like that's a cope. If you're going out and being independent, that is a version of it, but it's not the one I'm talking about. Being curious and independent, like being like doing your own thing, being the driver of your train, being the head of your life is different than spending all of your life detached from people because you have trauma and coping outside by looking like you're adventurous and traveling all the time, but you're actually just coping and putting on band-aids and you're not being more introspective. So I will say there is this illusion of the girl boss bubble that says I travel and I party and I drink with my friends, but those women are so unhappy because they're not independent. They just pretend to be. They're independent, meaning driving your own life, actually in charge of your life, actually know what you're doing in a very specific way, like actually saying, I'm just not going to do that. I'm going to go get a better job. Actually, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go have a better life. Mm, actually, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go have a better relationship. Oh, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go look for my joy. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to settle for this life. A lot of people cope with like their little TikToks and they'll show themselves again doing all these things, but then they'll cry and be like, I'm unhappy. I'm unhappy. I'm unhappy. Hello? You're unhappy because you're not being introspective. You're not even facing yourself. You don't even know why you're traveling. You just think that traveling signals independence. Hello? You think like traveling signals like, oh, look how cool I am. I'm doing all these things. But are you joyful? Or do you do them because society has told you this is what independence looks like? This is what um, driving your life looks like? Like, think about it. Just because you're doing the action, if you don't know why you're doing it, it's not the same thing. Hello? That's not the same thing. Just because you're doing the action that look, that's why women with careers aren't happy unless they know why they're doing it. You have to actually want the career. Otherwise, of course, you're not going to be happy. Like women who are stay-at-home moms and they're like, why am I unhappy? Because it was never your dream, bro. You're not actually living your life. You're living someone else's dream. To inform you that it's instead because most of them were, as with most female comedians, written by a man. Although I did write that one, but only because he told me to. What about all the funny female comedians? Like, um... No, no, no.
male income, female unemployment, sharing the same nationality or region, having divorced parents, the number of previous marriages, and the presence of children in the household were all non-significant in influencing the direct effect of the happiness gap's presence in general on divorce rates. While higher female income and more hours worked did magnify the effect of the happiness gap on separation. To reiterate then, children don't influence women's likelihood of instigating a divorce, but how much money she makes and how happy her husband is comparative to her do influence divorce rates. Specifically, hmm. following the initial marriage, a baseline happiness gap of one unit increased the probability of breakup in the following years by about 4% in the UK and Germany hmm. and 2.3% in Australia, which represents between 7 and 15% the average risk of separation per annum. Thus, while a happiness gap always provides a threat to the security of a marriage, the gap is most harmful within the last few years after tying the knot. And again, not for men, only really for women. As such then, while yes, women tend to be happier than their husbands even now, as women's happiness has massively decreased to become closer and closer to that of her husband, the likelihood that she will divorce him has increased, perhaps in part explaining consistently high divorce rates, which although peaking in the 1980s are still higher than in previous generations in the US. Part of the paradox of women's happiness then is that if she is less happy than her husband rather than more so, she is more likely to divorce him and women are more likely now to be unhappy than in the past. Thus, divorce rates partially explained. If women are less happy now than they were in the past, and this trend started to occur around the world around the same period of time, all following the women's rights movement, we need to perhaps look more closely at the women's rights movement and gender equality to understand how feminism has influenced women's happiness. So, while women are happier than men, although less happy than they used to be before the rise of the girl boss and the women's rights movement, it seems that the imbalance in happiness between the sexes is part of what keeps marriages together. As perhaps such a gap is seen as normative and without said gap, women feel that something with their marriage is just off, all of which seems quite paradoxical. But what else might help explain why women's happiness is decreasing? Well, data from Lilaev and Stutzer 2009 are indicative that part of the problem mm. may be, only adding to the paradox, liberalism. Valentine's. Mm. I'll tell you this right now. This is my goal with my career. Because my majority of audience is women. And I do think women are more introspective than men, generally speaking, because women have the privilege to be. So men are so busy still surviving. Men have not evolved past it that they almost never have the time to be introspective. What's the story about Diogenes we learn is that he spends most of his time laying on the grass while Alexander the Great goes, sir, what can I get you? And he goes, you can move. You're blocking the sun, right? The idea of introspection being accessible to all is actually a, a, a mistake. It is accessible to some because of the privilege you have for spending the time to think and women have a lot more time to think about what they want than men do. But men also trap themselves in this paradox about not giving them the not giving themselves the time to think about it. So no, no, like um, no gold stars for self-inflicted wounds, right? Like I do not care about men's suffering that is self-inflicted. I don't care about women's suffering that's self-inflicted. Okay. That's like your that's your issue. Figure it out. What I want to do with my career and what I want to show women is that because I know I think I can relate to women a lot better, though I think I've helped plenty of men as well, is like this paradox that you're living in of getting more choices and still unhappy has to do with a relationship you're having with your consciousness, like I said before. But the problem is, is like women do have the time to consider their introspection. They do have to consider the, the time to consider their unhappiness. They do have the time and more, this is the best time to be a woman in the same way this is the best time to be a man. But if you do not recognize that, you will always be miserable because this is the best time to be a person. We are living in the greatest time in history, the most accessible time, the time you can all earn money, the time we have access to technology. This is the greatest time to be alive. But you have to learn how to stop surviving and living. But you will always need to survive because that's the basics, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So there's something to be said about this. Now, great question. Do you think that introspection introspection can still be possible well e even while surviving of course because everybody has to be introspective to a degree you have to know yourself enough to know you're hungry you have to know yourself enough to know you have to go to the bathroom you have to know your body enough to know you're like happy or sad or oh my gosh like I'm feeling pretty sad right now like introspection on a spectrum is happening all the time all people are having a relationship with introspection unless you're literally in a coma so unless you're in a coma you know, unless you have a very specific issue with your brain, you are absolutely operating on some default level of introspection, 
right? And so there is a relationship with introspection you can have depending on how much of a relationship you want. So if you find yourself having access to everything, it's why rich and wealthy people are still unhappy or slash not joyful because they know they can be happy temporarily, but happiness is an emotion. It's fluid. So you have to replace the desire to be happy with the desire to be joyful. That way, when everything crumbles around you, okay, you don't lose your joy, right? So again, this is the best time to have a relationship with your consciousness. You have more time than you've ever had time before, but you have to give yourself that time. You have to remember that instead of scrolling on TikTok and numbing yourself out, instead of coming home and kicking off your shoes and popping a beer, which sounds great, maybe be introspective. But the problem is, is like most people come home and numb themselves and try not to think about work tomorrow and try not to think about how the weekend's almost over. And most people are not interested in introspection past the need to fulfill those basic Maslow's hierarchy of needs on the very bottom of the pyramid, right? So not a problem. I'm not moralizing it. I'm just saying it is what it is, which is why I say most people are twos and most people aren't interested in having more of an introspective relationship because you don't want to give yourself the time to do it because it does take time. So again, you can be a two who can find your joy by like really finding your place in the bubble and finding your purpose within it. Great. You can find joy by being a five and finding your place within it or outside the bubbles and within your own bubble. You can have a relationship in any way you want to have that relationship. It's just on a spectrum. So obviously, like I read these statistics and I go, okay, cool. Like how do I do it different? When I read statistics in my 20s, now I'm in my 30s, that women don't ask for raises, I just started asking for raises and it worked. Boom. When I read statistics that women don't ask men out, I started asking men out. When I read statistics that say women do this and it's to their detriment, I do the opposite because obviously I don't want to live to my own detriment. You know, the problem is, is like, that takes a level of introspection. I have to first admit I am self-sabotaging. Then I have to do the thing that doesn't allow me to self-sabotage. And that's the dilemma. That's the difference. Now, whether or not you want to go on that journey is up to you. This day is a sham created by card companies to reinforce and exploit gender stereotypes. Evelyn, this is the lady I was telling you about. At least in Switzerland. In 1981, Swiss citizens voted on an amendment to their constitution which would specify that women and men specifically should have equal rights, which previously included language about the equality of all human beings with no mention of sex. They just really wanted to specify that all human beings included women. Wrong. The amendment passed with just over 60% of the vote, and the main reasons given by those who voted in the affirmative, 70% concerned equal pay and women's value being equivalent to that of men while the other 30% mentioned women's rights in the family and in education. These scholars compared data collected during the 1981 referendum with information on labor market and subjective well-being outcomes measured by these- No, can that higher level of uh, levels of hierarchy can't be attained by the poor because it requires time and mental effort? No, 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 <clears throat> I disagree. I think attaining introspection is about time and the poor have plenty of fucking time. If you're at home, and you're disabled, and you are living off government income, all you have is time. You just don't want to be introspective about your situation. If you are truly poor, and you are not working, and you are living off food stamps, you have nothing but time. You just don't want to be introspective. Now, it's about attaining those tools as well. I have callers that grew up on Section 8 housing, that grew up in deep poverty, and they are so introspective compared to other people in their families. They were introspective enough to ask themselves, do I have to live in this bubble forever? And once they realized they didn't, they called me. Once they realized they didn't, they found my channel. I have worked with people who grew up in, in poverty and they absolutely know it's not about poverty because rich people also don't have time. Really, really, really rich people also do not have the time to be introspective because they're working all the time. They don't have the the... They can't take the consequence of being introspective because they might actually not want as much money as they wanted before. It's not about money or not money, right? It's about time, time. And time is specific. You have to give yourself time. <clears throat> oh my gosh, I'm sick and I'm losing my voice even more. It's about time. So I just want to make sure that we say that out loud. Whether you're very rich or very poor, you both maybe don't have time, right? Swiss labor force survey between 1991 and 2003 to understand the long-term effects of voting for liberal policies on happiness in women, taking into consideration changes to the wage gap that surely that constitutional amendment must have done something to ameliorate. Although women's wages remained lower than men's on average after the amendment that made gender discrimination illegal, 
even though it was already illegal, but also meaning that the gap could no longer be attributed to inequality and unfair pay, <coughs> there was a- It's because no matter how much you give society, they're not going to find their joy if they think happiness is joy. Happiness is not joy. Happiness is an emotion. It's fluid. At your mother's funeral, are you feeling happiness, you fucking sociopaths? Or are you actually feeling sadness? You don't have time to be happy but you might still maintain your joy. Look, when my parents die, I'm not going to be happy. I'm going to be very fucking sad, but I'm still going to be joyful for the time that I had with them, for the fact that I get to be here, for the fact that they loved me, for all of those things. My joy will maintain, right? Because I have a good relationship with it, but my happiness will be fluid. The goal is not happiness. Happiness is easy. Eat some in and out. Happiness is easy. Have an orgasm, right? Happiness is easy. Watch One Piece. It's not about happiness. It should be about joy. That is the fundamental mistake we're making. You know what I mean? This is a mistake we're making. And says, do you really not think that intelligence is a factor and not only time? Again, I don't know what intelligence means, right? Because unless you have a severe disability, unless you are in a coma, how intelligent do you need to be to be introspective? right? Unless you have like a severe mental imperative, which is possible. You could have um, a very bad relationship with autism. You could be like, have a very like difficult, you could have some relationship with like a chromosome issue. You could have some genetic, dif like, yeah, absolutely. But again, like, okay, like this is very important. Like, you know what I mean? This is very important. Like the average person without a insane medical reason should have more than enough IQ and intelligence to engage with introspection, right? I mean, I think babies are twos. They're doing their best with what they have and they're trying. That's like basic introspection. Do the best you can do to fulfill your needs. A baby cries when it's hungry, cries when it needs a change, cries when it needs affection and knows how to get what it wants. It signals to the world, this is what I need. It's being like, well, biologically, sort of genetically, their instinct is moving itself, but also babies are thinking they have like ideas about themselves you know what i mean um uh you're uh, okay happiness and joy are synonyms synonyms don't mean the same thing though like in my world that's not what words mean gay and gay are mean different things in different contexts so on my channel i'm reforming language to say happiness is an emotion which a lot of people agree with and joy is something different like in a spiritual metaphysical religious sense joy is different it's like saying peace means peace like gay means gay no words mean and can mean different things if you don't know the difference between happiness and joy then you haven't meditated enough you haven't sought out different bubbles enough. You're not having a philosophy relationship, right? A philosophical relationship with these words, right? If you study philosophy, happiness and joy are different. Market increase in wage rates of women in line with equal rights being approved of by much of the populace, while there were little changes in men's wages. In 1981, in communities where less than 60% of residents supported the amendment, women made on average 30% less than men. While in communities where more than 60% supported the change, the wage gap remained, with women earning 24% less. Initially, women in regions with more than 60% approval tended to have attained a higher level of education and had spent on average two or more- Okay, joy is internal, right? Mm, I'm not spiritual, so what does that mean? Okay, focus. Okay, do you guys, okay, this is going down to the basics. I don't know your life. You have to explain it to me. Do you know the difference between when you're happy and when you're sad and when you're angry? Like, do you have a relationship with your emotions? Do you know the difference between when you are happy, when you're sad and you're angry? Like, I need a yes or a no. Do we know the differences between what those three specific words mean, even though they're all emotions? Do we know what they mean? Like, do we know what they mean? Okay. I need to know what the relationship with your own emotions are, okay? So, because to understand this, you must first be able to distinguish the difference between happiness, anger, and sadness. Like, you have to know the difference. And if you don't know the difference, then we have to start even more from scratch, right? But if you at least know those differences, then we can continue forward. Okay, so Cass says no. You says yes. Vegan says yes, I know. Okay, so, okay. Okay, so some, okay, we know the difference is enough. Okay, so that is your emotions. That's your biology. Those are like the, the, your signals, like your brain is sending to say you're having this relationship with your emotions. These are emotional, right? These are emotions, okay? Joy is introspection. It's thoughtful. 
you've thought about it and you've internalized it into your consciousness. So even when I am sad, I am still joyful, right? Because I haven't lost myself to the sadness. Do you guys know what it's like to be depressed? Do you guys know what it's like to lose a relationship with joy even when you're happy, okay? When you're depressed, often you have a relationship where you could be happy eating a burger, but you're still like depressed internally about existence. You have an existential dread. This is a lack of joy. Twos can have joy. Fives can have joy. When a two has joy, think of the the people who have endured war. My family was very unhappy enduring war in the Middle East and being targeted as a minority, but never lost their joy. They never lost their connection to their religion or their spirituality or their joy. So when you're having this relationship as a secularist, like I am, you're saying fundamentally within my consciousness, I am recognizing that my emotions are different and then my ability to contextualize and understand my consciousness within the world is something different. So my joy maintains. If the whole world imploded, I could be very sad, but still maintain my joy. Or you could lose yourself, right? And crumble because your joy didn't have the foundation to maintain. Okay. So does that kind of make sense? Now, if it's not making sense to you, this might just be like um, above your grade level at the moment, which is great. I would recommend reading books on philosophy. I would recommend reading books on spiritualism. I'd recommend reading books on historical um, civilizations that moved through and had relationships with life and death. I would I would really recommend researching because there's so much more to learn to get to this point, right? <clears throat> ah, green bean, great question. What is the opposite of joy? When is the absence of joy? Are they, or what is the absence of joy? Are they different? Okay. So recently I've been saying joy, the opposite of joy is evil. Okay, and the opposite of evil is joy. Evil is like this made up like scary thing we've created in society to sort of explain our relationship that I think is furthest from joy. So again, okay, <clears throat> I think like joy and evil are kind of like the opposites. So joy is this fundamental metaphysical relationship we're having with an awareness about our life and our purpose in that life. Think about Jewish people that were in internment camps who or in, in the camps who maintain their joy and hope, even though they were very unhappy, right? How did they do that? They had a very specific relationship with their joy through the construct of the bubble, but internalized as a people, which is really beautiful. And then I think as a secularist and as a, maybe if you're a five or maybe not, you're having a relationship with yourself, the consciousness, and you're maintaining the joy through the relationship you're having, very self-aware relationship you're having with yourself, okay? So for me, I think joy is sort of the opposite of evil. The more joyful you are, the further you are from evil. I think the more introspective, introspection, introspective you are, the more less violent you are, the less hateful you are, the less bigoted you are, the less, while still recognizing you still are a human with a biology who has sort of a determined um, direction because of that biology. Well, recognizing, I know this is difficult, okay, or maybe too much, maybe, you know, well, you're still recognizing that biological determinism. You're also acknowledging the ability to evoke past that biology and into what I would call free will, even though people would argue that everything we do is within our biology and therefore free will can't exist. I get it. I understand. Right? But when I hear people say, I don't understand what you're saying, I'm saying this is an opportunity to understand. Because if you don't understand what someone is saying, what you're saying is, I don't understand myself enough to translate what this person is saying to understand them. And I'm saying this is an opportunity to understand, right? Ooh, Ken, interesting quote. I know why the cage bird sings. It's the, that's a lyric, right? Beautiful. I love it. You know, um, metaphor says, this is just, you are, if you are an atheist, make yourself your God. That doesn't work. I don't believe so. Right. I don't think it's about making yourself a God. I don't really believe in a God. It's about radically accepting that you are a, 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 a small ball of energy on the planet. It's about radically accepting that you're not a god, that you're just a human on a planet. You know what I mean? And you're chilling like a villain. Like you're just chilling. Like that's a joke, but you're chilling. You're just an animal on a planet. Or maybe you're a gift from God or maybe you're this or maybe aliens put us here. But as far as we know, I'm just alive. Just like right now, you're watching my stream. Why are you spending your limited time on earth watching my stream? Why are you in my comments? Why are you being bitter and cynical? You know who you are. Why are you in my stream? You have one life on earth and you're spending it with me. Why? 
And if you don't know the answer in a real way, and I swear to God, if you say it's trolly and fun, then you are literally outing yourself as a person who's spending your one time on earth doing this. You have one, one opportunity at life, as far as we know, maybe there's reincarnation, maybe there's not, and you're spending it with me, which I love. But why? Why? And that's the fun part for me. It's like, yes, let's figure out why you're here. Because that's what's interesting. That's the point. You know, JJ says, now I'm questioning if I should. My, one of my greatest things I see from people is when people are like, oh, I'm like moving past your content for now. I'm like, cool, bye, have fun. Come back if you want. Because that's what life is about. You're supposed to take from people, take their wisdom and use it in a way to find your joy and maintain it, right? Watch Verveke, watch Jordan Peterson, watch everybody, watch, watch Andrew Tate, watch everybody. And see what tool they're going to give you to make your life better. But don't worship anyone, especially yourself. Right? Don't worship anyone, especially yourself. And I am right. And I know you know I'm right. You know, for the haters out there. And they're just afraid to admit it because they won't even ask themselves why. They won't even ask themselves why. They won't even ask themselves why. Because it's too goddamn scary to face the fact that you are the reason you're not joyful. And that's what it is, girls. That's what it is. For years in the workplace, more than women in more conservative regions, comparative to men. By 2003, the average wage gap in Switzerland between men and women shrunk to 13.8%. Specifically, for each one standard deviation increase in regional support for the amendment in 1981, the wage gap was reduced by 2.4% in the 90s and early 2000s. Further, a one-point increase in the share of people in an area that supported the change was related to a 4.9 reduction in the gap in those areas. While regional approval had no apparent influence on changes in women's schooling outcomes, Areas with higher approval saw an increase of one-sixth of the average difference in work experience between men and women disappear over time. That is, women were working slightly more than in years prior. So the initiative appeared to have worked to a pretty significant degree, even if the wage gap did not disappear altogether. Which of course is a pipe dream for a wide variety of reasons, including but not limited to the realities that women tend to choose different occupations, choose to be in the workforce for shorter periods of time due to child rearing or choosing to leave the workforce altogether to be full-time mothers, and that women are simply less likely to ask for a raise than are men. Point is, in the liberal areas of Switzerland in particular, women were seeing a lot more gender parity in the workforce by 2003 than they were in 1981, although there were some significant differences in workforce participation based on more broad political characteristics of the region. So, were women in the more liberal parts of Switzerland that not only supported the amendment but subsequently did see greater reductions in the wage gap happier after gaining so much ground? Surely women with more independence in an area that is more supportive of women's equal rights must have been happier than women being oppressed in rural, backwards, conservative Switzerland, right? Wrong. Well, not really. Using data from the Swiss Household Panel Survey from 1999 to 2001, which questioned Swiss citizens on their levels of satisfaction in life and in the workplace, as well as their perceptions that women were discriminated against, Alev and Stutzer were able to see just how happy Swiss women were by region. I really do think it's, again, like, uh, they'll often bring up, like, studies about happiness around the world or how in very egalitarian societies, women still choose overall not to work as much. And I think there's obviously a biological component, which, again, is why I encourage introspection so you can decide if this is what I want because of my biology or if this is what I want because of me. And both are the right answers, as long as it's maintaining your joy. Right. As long as it's maintaining your joy, I think that's what's key. But so many people are unhappy, which means you're not having access to your joy, because even if you were unhappy, you wouldn't report it as being unhappy because you would know why you were unhappy because, you know, you have your joy. Right. Like, of course, you're stressed. You ever watch like um, you ever meet a, like a small town of people that are really struggling? And they're like, ah, eh, what are you going to do? Like, that's just life. You know, you find a way. It's like, yeah, of course, they're struggling. But when they have when they have a narrative that like you'll find a way, that's their hope and them realizing that like this isn't the end all be all of my existence. They actually believe in themselves. And I think people are less and less believing in themselves as time goes on. So they're very, very unhappy and they don't have a relationship with their joy. And so again, I think having the hope that things will be fine is also having the hope in yourself. You believe inherently in yourself. You know what I mean? Men and women in liberal areas had similar levels of life satisfaction, 
but the levels of life satisfaction reported by women in these areas was higher than that of men in conservative communities. Additionally, and by the way, so the study is just fake? No, but be careful of studies because even though they're helpful in a society that isn't introspective or have options, you don't know. It's the same narrative of people saying like, why are there more trans kids now than ever? Well, because they're allowed to be trans without being killed, right? So if you took a study in the 80s of how many people were trans, of course you would have less people. But if you take it now, there are more people because they're allowed to be trans. So studies are very helpful, but all studies say to me is where people's minds are at, not really who they are. That's what I, right? That's what I notice about studies. Is studies show you who you are or how you think of yourself, not like what's actually happening, right? And that's what's important to recognize because if humans aren't allowed to have labels or express themselves in certain ways or actually say an answer that's honest, you're not going to get the right statistics. You're just going to get the statistics of how people feel like they should answer things or think of themselves. Employed women were more satisfied than employed men, reporting a 0.16 higher score of subjective well-being than their male counterparts. Remember, not only is it normal across the world, or at least it was, for women to be happier than men, in fact, seemingly imperative for women to be happier than men for marriages to last, thus none of this is really surprising. What may be more surprising, though, is that when female gender was assessed by approval of equal rights in a region, employed women were significantly less satisfied with their lives in liberal areas. Specifically, communities with a one-point standard deviation greater amendment approval rate reported an average reduction in life satisfaction by 0.2 points on a 10-point scale. To put that into context, a 0.2 point reduction in life satisfaction is equivalent to the negative effect of not having completed compulsory education on satisfaction and one seventh the negative effect of unemployment on satisfaction. That is the deleterious effect of a smaller wage gap in liberal areas on women's individual happiness was about the same as if that woman had not completed high school. Not only is that a woman moment, it's a certified bra moment. You don't have another guy to wrestle with for 10 years. Cool. Bruh, you know that. One may think perhaps that this is just because women hated their jobs, but that wasn't the case, as women reported higher job satisfaction than did men. Instead, it seems that part of the problem may have been that while women liked their jobs more than men, those in liberal communities felt like they were being more discriminated against than women in the more conservative communities. Just to reiterate then, the women in the liberal regions that were more in favor of securing equal rights for women where there was a smaller wage gap were not only less happy with their lives outside of their job satisfaction, but they were more likely than women in traditionalist regions to feel as though they were being mistreated and discriminated against based on their sex. The feminists got what they wanted in Switzerland, and yet what they wanted left them less satisfied. Again, I'm sorry, like I've worked in both these, again, my bubble's anecdotal, but I've worked in both of these environments. And what I find happens is that in conservative areas, the women are also more open to misogyny and discrimination because they feel like it's their role and place in the business. And they feel more independent because they're working and staying in their place versus more feminist and liberal women notice the misogyny and discrimination more and get annoyed at it faster because they don't actually agree with it. So I have found the reasons for this is actually that conservative women or people in conservative bubbles actually just agree with the misogyny and don't care about it versus again it's like i, I uh, 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 again why are these things happening well what's the mentality what is the belief system around these things why are things more tolerated why are some people reporting like oh i'm okay with this action versus other people aren't it's like well people are different there's nuance not everyone's the same people aren't the same even though people are people everywhere People are different categories of people. Like people are just different categories of people. And feeling more victimized. So girl power, I guess. <laughs> then again, Switzerland is a country that recently legalized euthanasia pods. So at least they're unhappy, but liberated women have a- No, I didn't say that metaphor. You need to listen. You're so fun in the comments, but you need to listen, right? Right? Conservative women are just lying and are secretly unhappy. They're not unhappy. Lots of women uphold the patriarchy. Lots of women are internally misogynist. Lots of women have no problem being treated as second-class citizens. Humans are going to human, right? Way out. That are alive, you are going in the pod. Even if women are less happy now than they were in the past before the rise of girl power and girl bosses, 
we would certainly expect that even if women are less happy now than they were in decades past, that at least they're happier in the West where they have greater equality than other parts of the world where women lack equal rights. Right? Wrong. Well, data from Zwig 2015. Again, if you live in a bubble and it's perfect for you and you never thought about going outside the bubble and all your basic needs are met, then you are more likely to be happy. It's why the religious tend to be more happy because they think like uniform. They think like sheep. And it's not, I'm not saying that in a bad way. Most people think in bubbles. Everyone thinks in a bubble until you make your own. Most people want to be and group think with their neighbors. They want to think the same as everybody else. Most women in men in religion want to think the same. Of course they're happier. Why would they feel like they're not happier? If you live in a more independent, secular society, right? Hello? Then of course you're going to think maybe differently from everyone else. Maniform says you are in a bubble also. Exactly. Thank you. You've been listening. Maniform's been doing his homework, guys. We all live in bubbles. Exactly my point. We all live very good. Very good. We all live in bubbles. We all live in bubbles. That's the point. You either make a bubble or you choose a bubble. And of course, if you've chosen or live in a bubble where we all vibe with the same belief systems, you're going to feel validated. Um, you're going to feel respected. You're going to feel beautiful. You're going to feel smart. You're going to feel worthy, men or women. You're going to feel like everything is the way it should be. That's why people seek out tribes. So you feel like you are validated back and forth with the community and yourself. The question is, what do you do when you don't fit into the bubble? You make your own bubble, but that takes an insane amount of introspection. It actually seem to be indicative. Or that you can be a two who f makes their own bubble by like living in the woods or something. But that's a, and that's possible, right? That's a different variation of forming your own bubble, you know? Are perhaps happier in less developed countries than they are in developed ones where they have equal rights. Zweig utilized data from 73 countries collected from the Gallup World Poll Survey in 2009. This data set contained 20 developed countries, 12 transitional countries in Eastern and Central Europe, 16 Asian, 17 Latin American, and 8 African countries. They found that there were 10 countries where women were more satisfied than men, 2 where men were more satisfied than women, and 61 with no significant difference between the sexes. The two countries where men were more satisfied than women were Costa Rica and Italy, which is surprising given the nature of Italian mothers. I came home and I was like, Mom, next year I'm going to be stronger, faster, I'm going to make the team. She's like, no, son. You're raising black kids. <laughs> Genetics, boy, you make pizzas, that's what you do. Only two of the ten countries where women were happier than men were developed first world nations. The gender happiness gap was found to not reflect individual nations' levels of development. Um, this video was made by Aiden Paladin. I'll put the um, the link in the chat again so you guys can check them out. A GDP, and in fact, they found a slightly negative slope, indicating that women may be happier in less developed countries than in more developed ones. Perhaps also surprisingly to many in the Western world, women were happiest relative to men in Islamic and Buddhist countries comparatively to historically Christian ones using the number of women serving in national again you're always happy when you fit in but what happens when you don't fit in again my work is centered around people who don't fit in because the world like the bubbles don't work for you but that doesn't mean you have to be without hope look if you're a normie get the fuck off my channel and go live in your bubbles like if you're really normal why are you on my channel you freaks don't lie you knew you're here because you're a freak too you know it no normal person is watching me if you're on my channel, if you're on this side of the internet, if you're watching any of us freaks, you are not normal. You are fucking weird. And that's why you're here. You're not normal. Normal people aren't spending their time watching streamers. And I don't mean children. Children are not people. They're like figuring out themselves, right? Adult people who watch streamers are not common. They are not representing billions of people, right? Just millions, millions, millions. There are billions of people on this planet. And a third of the world doesn't even have access to the internet. Okay? So let's be real. You're here for a reason. There's something in you that is either agreeing with me, questioning me, hoping I give you an answer, or just having fun. All are good reasons, right? Okay? But like, we are here for a reason. We are interested in these kinds of videos for a reason. Look, only 300,000 views, right? It's like, it's not like millions of people are watching this, right? So again, when we're having this conversation about what we're doing here, we are here for a reason. Ask yourself why you're here. Why do you watch the people you watch? What does it tell you about yourself? If you're a normal, truly normal person, you'll be happy in a general society. 
right? Go be, go like have Islam, go have Christianity, go be normal somewhere else, right? But if you're here, that means you probably are a person who's like, you know, I want to do a different game at life. The game they gave me, the default game, it's fine, but it's not like fulfilling me. Okay. If it's not fulfilling you, let's have a conversation on how to be fulfilled, right? And let's get a bubble, either find a bubble or start a bubble that works for us, right? And I think that's what's important. So not everyone's born into a perfect bubble. Like my brother, he was born into like a perfect bubble for him. Like born Catholic, raised Catholic, loves it, a participant in his church, found his wife, five kids. Everyone's happy. Like everyone's living the best life. Great job. Bought a house. Just like barely 30 years old. Like great life, right? He like, he was born into a perfect bubble for him. For a lot of other people, right? Like we have to go run around. We have to go figure it out. We have to ask ourselves, like, where do we belong? And I hope, right, you belong in a place that, like, fulfills your joy, whether you're a two or a five on my level system, right? It doesn't matter, you know? Um, Discord says, how did the study account for the people misunderstanding the questions? Oh, great question. What were their standards in the first place? It's like if a woman was getting beat every Friday and then suddenly stopped, but she still can't open up a bank account. I mean, yeah, she's going to be happier than she was. Exactly. That's the dilemma with things like this. A woman will literally consent to an abusive relationship and say like, oh, I'm pretty happy. Like life is working out. But if you actually gave her a chance to face herself and say like, is this what you want? Like, are you happy? I will literally have people come to me, complain about their spouses, talk about the infidelity, abuse, whatever, toxicity, gaslighting, whatever it is. And then they'll talk, they'll cry, they'll mourn, they'll do the whole thing and then go about their life and appear and say they're happy. They'll literally be like, I'm happy, everything's great. But behind closed doors, they are crying to their therapist, they are crying to their best friends, they are crying to me, they are crying to people. And that's the point. You can pretend to be happy. You can pretend and fake and do whatever you're doing at church, at the grocery store, whatever you're doing. But the thing is, if you're introspective and you go home and face yourself and realize like, I'm not happy. Something is fundamentally wrong, okay? That's what I'm talking, the cognitive dissonance is so strong in society that I almost like, I don't trust people who aren't questioned properly to know if their answers are authentic. That's why people call me. So I can ask them, are you sure about that? You sure about that? Why are you calling me? If your life is so great, if you're so happy, why are you calling me crying? If your life is so great, if your marriage is so great, why are you calling me crying? Parliament as a stand-in for women's rights in a country, there was no relationship between the number of women serving in the government and the female-male happiness gap. When controlling for additional variables, including demographic characteristics, life circumstances, and economic factors, the total number of countries wherein women were happier than men increased to 16. More specifically, women in the same occupations with the same income, demographic characteristics, and life circumstances as men were significantly happier than men in 24% of the countries assessed. As such, and as surprising as it may seem, women are happier than men across the globe, and the likelihood that a woman will be happier than a man in a given country is seemingly negatively associated with that country being a first world developed nation. Thus, women are more likely to be happy than men in Iran, which the World Economic Forum has ranked 150 out of 156 countries on gender parity in 2021 mm. than they are in Sweden, which US- Sweden! Sweden. What type of consultation do you provide? So it's all up to the caller. I, I just, I give my time. Like I offer my time, my one-on-one -on -one time. So if you want to call me and play video games, I do that. If you want to call me and talk about philosophy, I do that. If you want to call me and like go on an introspection, introspective, introspection journey, I can do that. But look, all my content's free. You don't have to book a call with me. I stream. I'm here. You can ask me questions. The only reason people book a call with me is to get my one-on-one -on -one attention. So we can specifically tackle their issues and and or like hang out like otherwise like you do not need to book a call with me and for Christmas I will be giving Christmas discounted calls for just Christmas for funsies for people who have especially never called me and want to try it out I'm doing it for December though anyone can use those call spots so if you want to sign up in December go through Patreon um but hold on I saw another question that was where is it oh <laughs> Manaform says I kind of look like his mom I knew you were into me I could tell I could tell. I could tell. I thought you were flirting. I thought you were flirting. Thank you. Thank you. I thought you, I thought you, you know, you know, I thought so. You know, how are you different from Andrew Tate? I'm a woman. Well, actually, I'm kind of a man. Um, 
I mean, plenty. I don't sex traffic women. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I don't abuse people. That's number one. News and World Report surveying ranked as the best country in the world for women in 2022, in which the WEF placed slightly lower at fifth place for women. Then again, there's not much of a difference between Sweden and Iran anymore, at least by some estimates. As even um, uh, Zen says, did you, did they just imply more developed nations have less happy women? That makes sense because again, it's the paradox of choice. Again, humans do very good when they're in tribes. Hear me out, guys. Listen, this is the foundation of my work. If you never question yourself, if you go with the flow, if you go with the norm of your bubble, you will be happier than the moment you rebel. Modern women, on average, are rebellious. That's why they're modern. Like, to be modern is to be rebellious. And so if you rebel, you are going to, if you are introspection, introspective, if you pop a bubble, if you question how you were raised, you are less likely to be happy temporarily until you do the work. Listen to me right now. This is, this is the work that I'm doing. If you find yourself unhappy in the bubble you were raised in, if you find yourself being, having all this access to all these things, money and success and education, and you're still like, why aren't I happy? You call Brittany or you come here. Okay. If you are born into an environment in which you decided to rebel against, you are literally going against the tribe. You are saying to yourself, I want to fit somewhere else, which of course will bring ostrac like ostracization, alienation, lack of community, lack of dating prospects, of course, right? So of course, women in modern countries will be quote unquote less happy than women not, but not because modernization is wrong, right? It's not, hello, it's not about the modernization. It's about the reality that once you pick yourself and you have that relationship with your consciousness, you will feel alienated. Introspection is a relationship with yourself. And most people aren't having that. Most people aren't asking themselves in a, in a, in a deeper way, what is the relationship I'm having with myself? Most people ask them, themselves basically within the bubble, right? So again, you can choose the bubble, you can pick it, you can go back into the religion you were raised in, go back into the culture you were raised, raised, you were raised in, or if you find yourself unhappy and you want to sort of rebel, then you have to find that for yourself again in a different way, right? And that's where my work comes in. That's why it's separate from mental health. You should actually get a therapist if you need one, but this is why it's about philosophy. What is the philosophy in which you navigate your existence, your life? right? That is the question you have to ask yourself, you know? Okay. <laughs> Jessica says more man than Andrew Tate will ever be. Thank you. And more woman than he can handle. Thank you, girl. Thank you. You know? So again, okay. You can have whatever life you want. You're here for a short time. And I believe in your ability to find your happiness and joy. But specifically, I want to help you find your joy, you know? Um, dude, I'd love to talk to you just to do it. I first learned about you from my friend who bought your, the uh, the book, not your book, The Ethical Slut. And now I've come across your work again. I didn't write The Ethical Slut for the record. I wish I did. The Ethical Slut is a great book though. And I really, really recommend it. Talk about bubbles. Talk about making your own bubble. I'm so glad you, like, I love that book. I really recommend that book. You know what I mean? It's so good. Um, um, let me see. Uh, <gasps> Thank you, Louis. I don't always agree with um, Brit, but she makes me think and I appreciate that and need that. Same. That's how I feel about people I watch that I don't always agree with. I'm like, well, at least I'm pondering, you know? At least I'm pondering. Even if the weather is not so sunny, it's all still Shiite. Boo, you stink! Looking to a more recent assessment from Bell and Blanche Lab That's true. G says, Mike, if you're truly enlightened, you wouldn't want to go back. If enlightened is a weird word, use the word like self-aware and have a relationship with your consciousness, but like you wouldn't want to go back. But there is a stage where you wish you didn't know things. Like sometimes people talk about this desire when they're a four or a three to like want to choose a bubble and go back. And then when you're a three, I think a lot of people do choose to go back to a two bubble. But I think when you pass a certain threshold, it's hard to go back. So you can only go forward. And then that's a decision you can make. But see how you know? And again, when we dream about the past, we're not living in the present. And we're not looking forward to the future, right? So there's um, there's something to be said about that. Um, what book was that? The Ethical Slut. The Ethical Slut. It's an amazing book. It's really helpful. It's all about constructing your own sexual liberation bubbles. It's all about 
living your life how you want. It's consent based. It's all about harm reduction. It's very, very great. Right? Like I, yeah, I really recommend it. You know what I mean? Um, do you recommend that book even if you're in a monogamous relationship? I personally do, Lucy, only because it's going to give you tools about negotiation that a lot of monogamous couples miss out on. One of the most romantic gestures my partner made to me when we were courting is that he started reading that book because he knows I love it so much. And I really think like our marriage is so wonderful because we negotiate constantly. Even Jordan Peterson was talking about negotiating with Tammy. And so again, like, um, I, I... I'm so excited that something that isn't about monogamy, though it has a chapter about monogamy, can really help everybody. Because again, it's about the tool. It's about the tool, you know? Flower 2021, we can see that despite the decreases in women's happiness relative to men's, the gap remains in the Anglosphere, as their analysis showed that men had significantly lower life satisfaction levels than women in England, Scotland, Wales, and North Ireland over the period of time between 2016 and 2019, with controls added into the equation. Additionally, men scored significantly below women in unhappiness in Scotland using the Scottish Health Survey between 2008 and 2018, and in England using the Health Survey of England between 2003 and 2016, evidencing the persistence of the paradox. Thus, even though recently, despite all the supposed strides in women's rights and equality, women largely remain less happy than men. But the last two years, in particular, have been plagued, pun intended, with a very specific issue that has contributed negatively to just about everyone's happiness across the world. And that's been COVID and its associated lockdowns. Oh, if that's the case, then do you think it has to do with no loneliness and facing yourself? COVID was so hard on people because you had to spend a lot of time with yourself. And you couldn't get distracted by work and traffic and all the stress of... The you had to spend a lot of time with yourself. Motherly surveys are indicative that young mothers struggled under the pandemic, but also that more and more of them became full-time parents. For Gen X mother- Sorry, and Confusion says, does being a five mean you can't be joyless? Can people that don't experience joy be a five? Um, I think, mm, I look at it more like a spectrum and then a place of whether or not you're living in the present or whether or not you're evoking free will. So I do think- a five has moments of like being trapped in like a two narrative. That's why I call it like a five being a two because I've noticed. And again, these things are still like in flow. I'm still like figuring this stuff out. I'm still like wait until I'm in my 40s and I have more solidified philosophy. I'm so excited. But obviously, like you guys are watching me in real time figure out my own philosophy, which is very exciting. This is the like this is being documented in real time on the Internet, which is like stoked, you know. Anyways, um. So when I think about it, I think about joy as being fundamental to the consciousness. But if you lose a relationship with your consciousness, you could lose a relationship with joy. So if I'm in a coma, I'm not a five anymore. I'm not even like in really, I don't even have my joy, right? So when I think about a five having a two moment, I think about a five who's lost connection with their consciousness because I think living in the present, not in a mental health way, but in a philosophy way, is a very difficult practice. And it takes a lot of dispelling the ego, which is really difficult, right? Do you think you'll write a book? No, because books, well, not about the levels. I'll probably write books about bubbles and I'll probably write books about my life because I think my life is very interesting, but uh, enough for a book, maybe. Um, but I don't think I'll write a book on the levels because once you turn it into that, it becomes like crazy. People become crazy. They'll start identifying as the levelers. They'll be culty. Like I'm not interested in dealing with humans in that way. I don't want to, um, I don't want a cult following. And I think once you write a book about a philosophy, you make them. So I feel safer just doing this. Um, plus if you write a book, you have to go on tour and you have to meet those people. And honestly, I feel like, I feel like. Mm, 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 I don't want to do that. Mm, mm, I don't want to do that. Um, you know what I mean? I'm really trying to harm reduce here. And I think it would, yeah, I just, I'm trying to harm reduce here. And I feel like sometimes writing a book causes more harm. There's 37% reported leaving or quitting their jobs during COVID and nearly half, 46% of millennial and Gen Z moms say that they left the workforce last year specifically because of childcare issues. The pandemic also seemingly influenced women's willingness to have more children, as this survey also mm. found. Vegan says in your system, two seem to have a more likelihood of being joyful than fours and threes. Yes, they do. Absolutely. Great observation. But if you're somebody like me, I couldn't find my joy in the two bubble. 
which is why like you could say it was determined that I would be a five because I wasn't finding my joy. No matter how many bubbles I hopped into, no matter how many identities, no matter how many versions of myself I molded myself into, I could never find my joy within the two bubbles. But like a lot of people I meet who are twos are very joyful within their life and there's no reason to be a three or a four and or a five, just like zero reason, which is why I say the goal is not to be five. The goal is to be joyful, whether you're a two or a five. Okay, the goal is not to be a five. The goal is to be joyful, whether you're a two or a five. So if you are a two who's joyful, you figured it out, bro. Chillax. If you're a two who can't seem to find joy, you might want to think about becoming a five. Found that women were 9% less likely to say that she wanted another child in 2022 compared to 2021, and 13% less likely compared to 2020. With these surveys in mind, we should look to a massive study from Blanche Flower and Bryson 2022, who examined the paradox of women's well-being across various countries, taking the COVID pandemic into consideration in their analysis. In this vast assessment, they found that the percentage of women who reported being very happy steadily declined between 1972 and 2006. And although the number of men who reported being very happy also declined, the slope was far steeper for women. COVID, however, represented a unique negative influence on the well-being of both sexes, as happiness fell in 2021 to levels never previously seen in the last 50 years of data collection and to a degree that was not comparable to the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009, which also struck a blow to American happiness. Interestingly, the recession barely impacted well-being when compared to COVID lockdowns, school closures, and social distancing. Further, female happiness fell more during the pandemic than did male happiness. Outside of the U.S., Blanche Laura. Mm. Um, seven, great question. Three and four, transitionary levels. Yes, Brittany. Three, well, sort of. Yes, four, three. Yes, that's a good way to look at three and four. Three is also a temporary. So you can make a decision like, you remember, it's like a bridge. So it's like, do I want to go here? Or do I want to go here? You know what I mean? Um, so that's specific. Um, but yes, three and four are more transitionary, right? Two is more solid. Um, one is, uh, versatile, so it could be a, a transition or it could be a, um, a, a permanent. And then five is like permanent though, has, uh, fluctuations of course. Um, is farm brother a joyful too? I think farm brother is going to be, I think he's pretty joyful for where he is. I don't think he's completely solidified that joy, but he's damn like, he's, he's definitely going to get there. Um, but I think joy is a journey. You know, it takes a lot. And I think he's aging very wonderfully into his joy. You know what I mean? He's very happy. And I would say that he, he has a relationship with joy, but he's still on the journey. I think he would also say he's still on the journey. Um, but I would say he's very happy. They have a very good life. You know, he worked really hard for that life. And so I think that, I think they're very happy, you know? Um, yeah. Um, Somebody asked a question. Wait. Mm, um, where was it? Oh, Mike, you said something interesting. I don't really understand it. You said, see, I could find my joy in t two bubble, but I was kicked out. I don't. I did you. That's possible. So you were experiencing a joy, but then you were kicked out, which means your joy I guess that's possible. That's a weird thing to hear. I don't know what that means. Because if you found your joy in the two bubble, what happened in your life? Did you transform? Did you have a transformation? Did you have like an introspection bubble pop where you realize like, oh, because you can't get kicked out of your joy by somebody else. You are the only person who can shatter your joy or maintain your joy. So was it joy or was it happiness, right? I'm going to specify the difference here because joy should transcend happiness. Happiness is an emotion. It's fluid right? It's, it's fluid. It so, uh, you know, I want to know, like, what do you mean by that? That's really interesting to me. It doesn't quite coincide with how I think about happiness and joy. So any more detail you want to give us, please do. So what if you're not there yet? You said, so you haven't found your happiness. Well, happiness is an emotion. It comes and goes. For sake of my conversation here, happiness has got to be recognized as an emotion, like anger or sadness. You do not and will never be happy 24-7. In the same way, you won't be angry 24-7 and you won't be sad, but sometimes it's appropriate to be all of those things, right? Happiness is very specific. It's just you can be more happy than anything else. Like I would say farm brother in his life, my brother, is mostly happy and on occasion sad or angry, right? Because those are emotions. And he's learning to have a relationship with his joy, which I think will take a few more years. 
um, you know, you know, the idea of normal is fake. I agree with you. I think like normal is just um, common or expected reality. So what's normal to me is normal to somebody else is normal to somebody else. You know, I agree with that. Um, okay. I feel like you guys are writing amazing comments and I'm missing a few in here probably. I feel like I'm probably skipping a few. Um, so if that happens, you can retype it. Just don't spam. Um, are there people who are permanently remaining a three or a four without ever becoming a five? Um, well, threes usually go back to twos because it's a bridge. A three has to make a decision to be a four, but often chooses to be a two. So I have a friend in my life who literally was a three and went, mm, I'm going to be a two and like picked a bubble and is really happy. Some of my callers were threes who decided to be twos. So threes often choose to be twos again. Really reasonable decision. And the threes who choose to be fours are less common because it's really scary and you don't exactly know what you're picking, but it happens. And then you hit four and fours always become fives unless they like die from cancer or a car accident. Because usually once you hit four, there's almost no reason not to become a five. It would be silly. And the journey is natural at that point. But it depends on how long you take. So some of the fours I've been, I've known who I qualify as fours. Some of them have been doing it for years and some of them did it for a few months. And then some of them, it's just very different for everybody. You know what I mean? And Brighton examined life satisfaction in 37 European countries. Kay says, wouldn't joy in the two bubble just be happiness? No, I don't think so at all. I think joy and happiness work the same for twos. Have you never met a joyful two? They're so joyful. No matter what happens, no matter the destruction around them, no matter if their whole family dies, the world shatters, they're always joyful. They have a joy about them, a fundamental understanding with their reality. It's a very beautiful thing to see in someone. Like I love seeing joy in people. It's so specific. They have joy no matter what happens to them in life, so joyful. And um, sometimes they're not happy during that tragedy, but they're still joyful. Very specific. But the joy a five is having, it's the same thing. It's just within a different mechanism of the bubble. So usually twos are joyful because they have a root or in a foundation within a bubble reality versus, and everyone has a bubble reality, but the five constructs the bubble while the two doesn't though a two okay this is very oh this is hard to follow here we go but okay you'll get it okay so a two can create a bubble in which they are still within the two bubble so it's not really their own literal bubble it's a bubble that pretends to be a bubble like i'm gonna say fuck the government and go live in a forest and not pay my taxes see how that's still in retaliation to the bubble so you're still in the bubble but you're living separately on your own and you found your joy that could be a thing but you're still tied to the bubble your joy is still tied to the bubble ironically enough or you're really religious okay you're really religious and your joy is tied to the relationship you have with god it's still joy you're joyful even if the world collapses around you you still like you're like i'm good to go okay you're still a joyful person you have this great joy even if you're unhappy in the moment you're still joyful okay that's connected to the root of the bubble in religion a five, when they construct their joy, is the relationship they're having with their consciousness and their consciousness alone. It has nothing to do with the outside world. And even though the five constructs its own bubble, the joy is in relation to strictly the consciousness, not the bubble, even if they've created the bubble because we all live in bubbles. So again, the two joy that I'm thinking about is about the bubble they're in and the relationship they have with information. And the five joy I see is the relationship they have strictly with their consciousness. It's about them and their understanding of themselves. So that's how I personally like see the difference. Utilizing data from the Eurobarometer surveys between 2003 and 2021, they found general declines in happiness between 2019 and 2021. And just like in the US, the Great Recession produced comparatively little decline in most nations, with the exception of Greece, Portugal, Italy, and Spain, which did see significantly lower life satisfaction in 2008 and 9. In contrast, some nations actually saw increased life satisfaction during the recession, namely Denmark, Finland, Germany, the Netherlands, Sweden, and the UK. Truly a laundry list of the worst people on the planet. And I use the term people extremely loosely. All that's missing are the South Africans to really round out the arseholes of the Earth compilation album. Eddie, yes, if sir. you by your own assessment are a racist, right? Yes. Then I what am. are you doing Man, I here? Keep seeing oh. In contrast, some nations actually saw increased what life happened? satisfaction during the recession, namely Denmark, Finland, Germany, the Netherlands, Sweden, okay. and the UK. Truly a laundry list of the worst people Repeating. on the planet. And I use the term I do not know what just happened. People extremely loosely. 
What was missing are the South Africans to really round out the arseholes of the Earth compilation album. Eddie, yes, if sir. you by your own assessment are a racist, right? Yes. Then I what am. are you doing here breaking breaking bread with uh, with black people? Because I am because he's a racist as well. The black man is a worse racist than I am. Really? You better believe it. What do you think happened in Rwanda Burundi, Louis? No. Ooh, okay, okay. When you were five, you see all the people BS, which is the darkness of self-awareness. Um, I don't agree. When you were five, you have radically accepted your place within the universe on the macro and micro. You have accepted that like you are a living entity within the whole universe and everything humans talk about. I think a four is the person that realizes like all the bubbles are constructs. And a five is a person who radically accepts it and finds their joy within that reality. So I think like a four is somebody who realizes like, oh my God, is everything a construct? Are we making it up? There is no matrix. A four knows there is no matrix. The matrix is a made up construct. There is no matrix. There is no conspiracy theory. There is no like evil elites who are trying to eat you. There's just people in power like high school and everyone's a mean girl. Like there is nothing secretive or powerful or outside your scope of understanding. We are all just energy within the universe. We are all within the bubble of the universe, right? We, if you zoom out, we are on a planet floating in space. And if you zoom out of that, we're just another star in the sky or, well, the universe. So like, again, like when we're having this relationship with like, I exist, you only exist on the micro. You don't even exist on the macro, right? You don't even exist on the macro. You're just a part of the soup. If you zoom out, you're just a part of the soup, my bros. It's only when you lean in. So there is no bullshit any more than everything is a construct. You know what I mean? Five is about that radical acceptance, you know? So four is more of the darkness, in my opinion, or a nihilistic two that hasn't even reached real four. But four should be the realization of like the construct of reality and how we're all having a different relationship with it and how much of it is subjective versus objective. Rarely is it objective. It's very hard to have a relationship with the objective. JJ, great question. Do you think one of the big differences between four and five is nihilism? There's two nihilism, which is like the edgy philosophy edgelord on the internet. He's like, nothing matters, bro. And then there's the four nihilism, which realizes like a real profound understanding of like, like things are a construct. It only matters through the ego on the micro. And everything else is just like you're in it. You're just in it. You're just a part of the universe, right? So I think a five radically accepts, well, a four discovers, a three questions, a two accepts like what they've been given and a one, a one won't even eat the cupcake, okay? Okay. Ah, great question, Miss P. Could a four be a four their whole life till death, like from 25 to 85? Yes, because everything is a moment in time. So you could be a four for, a, you're only a four for a moment of time, but that mon moment of time could last a lifetime, right? You're only a bad person for a moment of time, but that could last a lifetime. You're only a cheater for a moment of time, but that could last a lifetime. You're, everything is a moment of time. And then how long that moment of time lasts is up to you. So yes, a four could be a four for a moment of time that lasts a lifetime. What is a one in NPC? There are no NPCs. Nobody is an NPC. All of that language is silly. The Matrix, NPC, all of that is in denial that, that like none of that exists. That is a two thinking. Twos think NPCs are real. Twos think uh, the Matrix is real. There is no NPC. There's only people being people. Humans being humans. Like twos aren't even NPCs. Don't think of NPC as a construct made from a bubble to make you feel like you know more of what's going on than other people. You don't know more of what's going on. You have a different relationship with existence and existing. You don't know more. You know different. And it's specific. Fives are not better than twos. Fives are having a different relationship, right? Um, but check out my levels video link down below in the description to find out more details. <laughs> Well, that was a weird aside. Anyway, during COVID, however, things were far more negative. Maybe not more negative than that, but you get what I mean. Eight of the 37 countries assessed, including Austria and the UK, experienced falls of over 20 base points in life satisfaction. The drop was even- I'm not moralizing being a sheep though. Maniform, keep up. She said most people are, are sheep, but not NPCs. 
I'm not moralizing it. You are. If you moralize being a two, you're probably a two. There's nothing morally wrong with being a person in a bubble who lives in a bubble and dies. There's nothing wrong with being a two. If you moralize being a two, you're definitely not a five, right? You can't moralize reality, nature itself. You wouldn't moralize a bear being a bear. You wouldn't be like, why isn't the bear more introspective? It's like, it's a bear. It's only as introspective as it can be. So sheep exist, but not NPCs. I mean sheep as in, I mean it in the biological sense, like sheep as in tribes, like you are a cluster of sheep. Sheep is not, I don't mean it negatively. I'm not moralizing it. I mean, you belong to a tribe. Like you want to be a sheep. You want to be in a tribe. You want to be a herd. How about herd? Do you guys prefer herd? You want to be a herd. Okay. Being a sheep is not bad. Being a herd is not bad. You know what I mean? Like you, you don't moralize it, right? Don't moralize it. Just accept it. Like you're in a tribe. How about a tribe? A tribe is probably less. You're in a tribe and you're part of the tribe. You're part of the collective. There's nothing wrong with that. Even larger in Denmark, which consistently ranks among the happiest nations on earth. There were some exceptions, however, as happiness increased for both men and women during COVID in Albania, Bulgaria, Greece, Macedonia, Portugal, Romania, and Serbia. In 19 of the 37 countries, men's life satisfaction remained significantly higher than women's, including in several of the hmm. Scandinavian countries, specifically Iceland, Norway, and Sweden. Interesting. During COVID? all report generally very high levels of population happiness and pride themselves on gender equality. Beyond the coup in general, the scholars noted a shift in life satisfaction over time as men had lower life satisfaction before the turn of the 21st century, at which point it tended to even out with women, if not supersede female levels of happiness in several instances. 2006, 2012, and 2014 data from the European Social Survey, which measured five negative variables associated with life satisfaction by asking subjects how often in the past week they felt depressed, anxious, sad, lonely, or that their sleep was restless, found that in every case, men had fewer effective disturbances than women. Hmm. In contrast, feeling cheerful and being in good spirits, feeling- Is this whole video going to literally ignore, like, this, the, the reality that- Is this whole video just going to be- it's really not going to explain why empowered women are miserable, is it? It's just going to exp it's just going to be like I feel like it's not explaining it yet. There's not explaining the why. Does it does the video know it's not explaining the why yet? We're just hearing the data, but like why is the data that way? Like we don't actually know why yet. I hope she explains it. Calm and relaxed, being active and vigorous, waking up feeling fresh and rested, and reporting that daily life was filled with things that were interesting were all positively associated with being a man. Nobody cares about can cry you so it's okay to be weak could you imagine being a man it must be so <gasps> eurobarometer data collected during the pandemic between march and april of 2021 found that life satisfaction and feeling calm were both related positively to being a male while fear loneliness helplessness frustration and uncertainty were all negatively related to being a man thus in europe much as in the states Women were at one point a lot happier than men, but for the last 20 years, the happiness roles of the sexes have seemingly reversed, and women were more deleteriously affected by COVID lockdowns than were men. In the UK specifically, comparative to the United States, life satisfaction increased incrementally for both men and women, and female life satisfaction was above that of men for the majority of years before the coup. COVID caused the life satisfaction rates of both- Yeah, like, why are men happier? Like, again, why? Like, I, I hope she covers why, because right now we're not getting- Guys- this is what I mean when people don't even know what the why is. Like, this is just saying, like, here's the data. I'm like, cool, but why? Well, I need a why, people. And again, my answer is going to be introspection and relationship with the consciousness. Let's see what her answer is. Both sexes to plummet. However, female life satisfaction in 2021 fell below its former historic lows. While for men, the fall left them with levels of satisfaction similar to those reported in 1995 and in the mid-1970s. The mid-70s makes sense as that was during NAM, but... Was Waterworld really that bad to cause a massive decrease in life satisfaction in men? You, I liked Waterworld. Fucking postman apologist. As such, in the UK, women were less happy under COVID than they had been in nearly 50 years that life satisfaction was being measured. The world ends, women most affected. Specifically, women had always reported higher levels of life satisfaction than men in the UK, on these instruments up until 2019, at which point female life satisfaction fell. I wonder how funny it was filming this little clip she's filming. 
Jesus, do drugs make you more self-aware or deeper in unconscious? I think it's subjective. It, it's just so dependent on the person. So some people have a really good relationship with drugs. Some people have the worst relationship with drugs. Drugs are a tool. You don't need drugs to be introspective. Um, you don't need, it's not a requirement. For some people, they help. For other people, they don't help. Below that of men, and women's well-being declined more than that of men between 2020 and 2021. In 11 of the 79 survey instruments used, men's happiness was below that of women's. In 21, they were the same, and in 47 cases, male rates were above female rates. The extreme decline in female happiness during COVID specifically was seemingly somewhat temporary, however, for as of late 2021, women's happiness again overtook that of men, and their levels of life satisfaction became equal to that of their male counterparts, despite the fact that female anxiety was always higher than that of men. Despite this leveling out, though, under COVID, men's well-being still improved more proportionally compared with the well-being of women, which took a far larger hit initially in late 2020 and early 2021. We can zoom out further than just Europe and the US and the UK to understand the gender happiness gap as Blanche Flower and Bryson also examined data from the World Gallup polls between 2005 and 2021, which includes 166 countries worldwide. In general, results were indicative. Yes, Ingrid, I know it's stock footage, but how funny would it have been to film the stock footage? That's what I'm saying. Of course, it's stock footage, obviously, but it's somebody had to film it, like unless it's AI. So it's funny that men were seemingly happier in the moment than women, but less happy if asked a question inviting them to reflect upon their general levels of happiness. 30 okay, Metaform, I might block you for just saying Waterworld isn't a good movie. Waterworld is a great fucking movie. It's classic, bros. Classic. Countries reported negative male coefficients, meaning men were less happy than women, including the North- Amber, so no one is happy. People are happy. They're just not joyful and they don't know the difference. Because they don't know that they really want joy, they keep wondering why doesn't their happiness stay. Being happy is easy. Eat some pussy. But joy is hard. Joy maintains even if you don't get pussy. And that's why it's hard to find. That's why you fill yourself up with girls and boys and cars and Bugattis and YouTube and you cope, cope, cope because everyone thinks what they're looking for is happiness. That's like saying all I need is some sadness in my life. You want an emotion? Emotion isn't enough. You need a relationship with your consciousness. You need joy, what I call joy, because it maintains. Nordic countries, specifically Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden, again, countries celebrated for their levels of gender equality. 59 countries had no significant coefficients, and just under half of all nations assessed, 77, had positive male coefficients, again indicating that men were becoming happier. These nations wherein men's happiness was increasing included the US, Canada, Germany, Greece, Spain, New Zealand, and Austria, as well as developing countries such as Afghanistan, Iraq, Morocco, Mozambique, and Rwanda, as well as former Soviet bloc countries such as Georgia, Belarus, and Ukraine. Belarus? Although again, this was 2021, not 2022. How quickly the tide turns. In total then, it seems that across the world, women were far more negatively impacted by the COVID pandemic particularly early on, than were men, although their happiness did tend to bounce back to a certain degree over time, the trend seems to be consistent that going into a post-pandemic world, the paradox of women's happiness is not going anywhere. The thing that started in the 70s is only becoming more pronounced. Despite all the supposed strides in gender parity, women are less happy now than seemingly ever. Do children make women happy, even if equal rights hasn't? That might sound like a dumb question to some, but there's clearly a lot of mothers who feel overwhelmed and unhappy, even outside of circumstances beyond their control, such as postpartum depression. Mom Life Comics being just one obvious example. Before we look at the well-being of stay-at-home moms versus employed mothers, we need to first answer the question, are moms happier than non-moms? Because I mentioned that the question itself might seem silly to some people, let's begin then by examining how people even think about parenthood and happiness, Ooh. which we can do by examining global quantitative data associated with folk theories about parenthood from a literature review conducted by Hansen, 2012. Why don't you have a seat right over there for me, please? No, no, it's a study about children, but, but not like that. These folk theories are the belief that children make people happier, that childless persons are a sad bunch, and that childless people are often selfish hedonists. So are any of those beliefs accurate? According to data from the World Values Survey, which contains data from 97 countries that comprise about 90% of the world's population, contrary to what one might expect, people without children generally reported higher happiness and life satisfaction than do parents. However, these effects were small, making up comparatively happiness and life satisfaction than do parents. However, these effects were small, making up comparatively one-fifth of the difference in life satisfaction between employed and unemployed persons. 
This small difference was, however, more negative in women than it was in men, and over time the negative effect changed to positive as subjects aged. That is, children can reduce happiness while they are children, but seem to increase happiness as they grow up and move out, such that parenthood had a negative effect on happiness for those under 40, a near-zero effect for those in their 40s, and a positive effect on happiness for those over 50, being most pronounced in women. Those are the aggregate global data, but what about different regions? In the US, parenthood had a negative impact on happiness and life satisfaction, and it had a negative relationship with life satisfaction in Australia. In both the US Yo, and- Yo, they are both so attractive. These two humans here. Action, and it had a negative relationship with life satisfaction in Australia. In both the US and Australia, the negative effect on life satisfaction dissipates or turns positive for older parents as their children leave the nest. In Europe, parenthood was negatively related to happiness and life satisfaction, both in general and country by country, being either significantly negative as it was in the UK, France, the Netherlands, Denmark, Ireland, and Portugal, or non-significantly negative as it was in Germany, Belgium, Italy, Luxembourg, Spain, and Greece. There were some studies that found the opposite, as, for example, parents under 45 reported higher life satisfaction than did non-parents in Germany, and there was a positive effect of being a parent to children aged 20 to 50 across 26 different countries, although this effect was stronger in men than in women. There was also a wide degree of variability across countries as this positive effect was present in Austria and the Nordic countries, yet the relationship remained negative in Bulgaria, Italy, Luxembourg, Poland, and Slovenia. For parents with an empty nest, having a non-resident child was generally either weakly positive or non-existent. In terms of longitudinal data, several studies found that those who became parents experienced greater decreases in well-being compared Ooh. to those who remained childless over the same period of time in both the US and Australia. Mm. In Germany, there was a positive effect after birth for one year in men and two years in women. However, by the time that the first child was four or five years old, this relationship turned negative. Similar findings were reported in England, where the birth of one's first child had a positive effect on women but not men's life satisfaction, also turning negative by the time that the child was more than two years old. In Australia, life satisfaction increased for one year after birth in both sexes, but diminished to near zero after the first year. No. Of course, there are a bunch of possible confounds in these raw correlations. And not just because Australian parents are forced to start sharing their cigarettes with their school-aged children. How long have you been smoking for? 48 years. And how old are you? 52. You're gonna f***ing die of lung cancer, mate. You're gonna get punched in the face by the long dick of cancer. But because not all of the findings are negative, the data are not indicative that well-being influences the likelihood that one will become a parent. That is, it does not appear to be the case that happier people are more likely to reproduce and vice versa. In general, parenthood appeared to move from positive to negative over time between data collected before 1995 to after 1995 although there were differences across nations, with the Nordic countries experiencing less negative outcomes associated with parenting, perhaps as a result of those nations' work-family policies that make transitioning into being a parent easier than in other countries. Probably. One longitudinal study in this analysis found that overall, the negative associations with parenting seemed to appear between the 1950s and 1970s, coinciding with increased divorce rates and the women's rights movement. In line with that finding, analysis revealed that parenthood uniquely negatively affected the well-being of single parents, be they male or female, across 26 European countries and Australia. In contrast, parenthood had a weak but positive influence on the well-being and life satisfaction of partnered couples in 22 European countries, with the exception of the Nordic nations, in which there was no relationship between marital status and parental status on happiness or life satisfaction. Globally, being a mother was consistently related to greater life satisfaction in widows, Looking at other variations from the aggregate, parenthood had a more positive effect on life satisfaction in more educated parents, while it had a negative effect on happiness in lower income parents, unsurprisingly. Life satisfaction and happiness also tended to decrease as the number of children increased. In some studies, having children between the ages of 12 and 15 was associated negatively with happiness, particularly in women, while other studies found no such relationship although I can understand why children in that age range might decrease happiness. I dropped out of high school because of Tab G. That's true. I wish he were he were lying about that, but that's actually true. First talk. <laughs> I'm going to evangelical <laughs> board. What was fairly consistent is that when childlessness moved from voluntary to involuntary as women aged out of their fertile years, that childlessness was associated with depression and lower life satisfaction, also particularly in women. As I said before, cue Joni Mitchell. No eggs. No eggs. Empty egg. You don't 
Cavity jokes. Cavity jokes. Well, close enough. To summarize then, having children doesn't magically make everybody happier, and in fact, it can be an extremely stressful experience that at large tends to decrease life satisfaction and happiness until those children are a bit older. But overall findings are largely positive longitudinally, and when accounting for individual factors that make parenthood more or less stressful. The findings then from this massive analysis are indicative, however, that becoming a parent is not all sunshine and rainbows. Not that I would imagine most people, including most parents, think that it is. But even though it doesn't massively improve lives immediately, it seems to be a positive thing for people long term. One of the problems with Hansen's data, though, is that it's largely correlational, and it doesn't allow us to see how parenthood changes or does not change happiness and satisfaction in individuals. Mm, okay, now that I'm done eating my big, um, my crib of wheat here. Okay, <clears throat> I will say one of the greatest gifts my parents ever gave me was siblings. One of the greatest gifts my parents ever gave me was them changing to understand their children. Even if they didn't fully change to understand us fully, they changed enough to have a good relationship with us. One of the things that I think my family did as a unit to the best of their ability was try to understand one another. We work really hard to stay in each other's life. And we allow people to come and go as they need. Like one of the blessings of my family unit is that we understand when people need a break. So some of our siblings, like they'll be like, I'm not talking to you guys. We're like, okay. And then we let people leave and we like, like shouldn't be bothering them. And as far as I know, we're pretty good at giving people their space. And then when they're ready, they can come back because like, obviously we're not going to chase you. Don't be a freak. But obviously, like, we need you to go like in a reasonable way as well. Right. So we know the differences because we know each other so well. But truly, like, one of the greatest gifts my parents ever gave me was siblings. So if I had a child, I want to have two because, like, again, I don't want to not give my kid a sibling. But to give my kid a sibling that's going to matter, I also have to, hopefully, raise them in a way that values one another as this very unique friend that you get because you're family. But also, as adults, they can choose not to be friends. So I have to accept that as well. But one of the greatest things I have is a family. I have family. I have cousins. I have units. I love my cousins. Even ones I don't get to talk to all the time, I love them and I think positive thoughts about them. And I know that if we ever reconnected, it would be great because that's the kind of family we are. As a Middle Eastern Assyrian family, that's the kind of family we are. We don't have to talk to our cousin. We could go years without talking to our cousins. And if we ever saw them again, we'd be like, oh, my God. And we'd be like kissing and hugging and like laughing like, oh, my gosh. And like it would be so fun, you know. And I think one of the greatest things we got is a unit. And as people aged, we could come together. And when like my grandparents died, we came together. And when people were sick, we came together. It wasn't always perfect. Not everybody could literally be there. But in spirit, we were there. Um. It is one of those things where I can understand like one of the greatest parts about aging is being surrounded by people who love you and have come from you. But at the same time, I could understand still maintaining that joy without having kids. But then the question is like, what, what's the relationship you're having with your old age? So again, this comes back to what is the relationship you're having with your consciousness? Because yes, you can be old and childless and be miserable or happy. You could have children and die miserable and alone. It's not just about having those babies. It's about having such a great relationship with them as you age that they want to be around you in your old age. And that is so wonderful. What a blessing that you were such a person that people wanted to be with you as you aged. Because remember, not every kid cares about their parents as they age, because not every parent cared about their kid as they were raising them. Individual parents, but we can find out how parenthood changes the lives of those parents <clears throat> in a long- Mike says being a parent, I think gives you a level of empathy. All humans have empathy on a spectrum, all of us. The ones who don't are a rarity. That's why they're considered interesting and an anomaly. So we all have empathy. I think some parents evoke that empathy, but considering like abuse, molestation, and uh, mental like uh, illnesses and personality disorders come from your direct environments. I would say given the way the world has gone, I think a lot of parents don't always know how to evoke that empathy, but some like some people choose to evoke that empathy. 
you know. Longitudinal <laughs> analysis of data from the German socioeconomic panel conducted by Beichmann, Staub, and Schroeder in 2016, who thoroughly examined well-being in parents both before and after the birth of their first child, as well as potentially confounding variables. They found that in the years before motherhood, women who would go on to have children had virtually the same degrees of happiness as non-mothers, mm. meaning it's unlikely that happier women become parents. However, the scholars did find that women who became mothers reported higher levels of life satisfaction than non-mothers in the five years before the birth of a child. This was not the case for all mothers, but instead only mothers who planned their pregnancies, as mothers with unplanned pregnancies had lower levels of life satisfaction, mm. rather predictably, as mm. no one really has their lives improved by the surprise inability to control their bladder for me tomorrow morning. I'm just kidding. <laughs> nine months, culminating in being unzipped like a pillowcase. But anyway, women with more human capital, measured here by previous higher educational attainment, were more satisfied with their lives both before and after birth. Personally, I didn't care for that expansion of Binding of Isaac, but that's just me. Although women with less human capital also increased in their satisfaction between two to five years after birth, this increase was relatively smaller in size. In the 12 years after birth, the average difference in life satisfaction between mothers and non-mothers was 0.3 on an 11-point scale in favor of mothers. Prospective mothers reported being happier than non-mothers one year before childbirth, and maximum life satisfaction differences between mothers and non-mothers was between 0.52 and 0.56 on that 11-point scale, which was typically reached in the year of delivery. This effect is larger than the effect of unemployment on life satisfaction and twice the effect size of being divorced on satisfaction. In other words, women are generally very happy with being a mother before their children are old enough to talk, and they tend to decrease in that happiness as they learn to complain. So how's your life? Yeah, not bad. Steady decline. <laughs> Over time, this effect levels out, likely a product of adaptation to life as a mother, or that whole talking thing. However, motherhood remained a positive correlate to life satisfaction over 12 years after birth. Ooh. Compared to being employed, these data were indicative that the total effect of motherhood after 12 years is similar to the effect of between 1.01 and 1.94 yearly. Mm. <coughs> That's why even if we won't have a biological child, my partner and I are open to adoption well into our 50s and 60s. Probably our 60s will be our cutoff, but we're really open to adoption because even if we're not ready to have biological children now, um, we're open to adopting in the future. And I think this is a, like a really good compromise for us, which is to say like we're not closed off to parenthood. But at some point I will be closed off to a biological child because like my like I'm not I don't want my body to go through that much. Um, I don't want my body to go through that much, but. I'm always open to a parenthood because honestly, I think my partner and I would be amazing parents, but whether or not we need to be biological parents, like probably not, right? Like we'll see, but probably not. ...incomes. That is, being a mother contributes to well-being up to nearly twice as much as income. And I think if I had one bio kid, I might tie my tubes and then adopt a second kid so they can have a sibling. But like, I don't know if I want to go through birth twice. I don't go through birth once. Mm -mm. ...does in some instances. Older mother- I think the- I'm sorry, I was so open to having birth before all my life, but I think after the fibromyalgia, I was like, mm, chronic pain, hormones, every- no thank you. Mothers, those thank over you. the age of 35, experienced greater gains than younger mothers, <laughs> and only the youngest group, those between 26 and 29, experienced any negative effects on happiness due to motherhood. Mm -hmm. That's gains in happiness, not in muscle. These results were similar for women after the birth of their first child and for women with multiple children, although the temporary increase in happiness after childbirth is about half as much for the second child than it is for the first, indicating perhaps a bit of tolerance to the baby rabies. Finally, fathers also saw similar trends to mothers, although the effect sizes both before and after birth were smaller in scope. The results of this study, then, do seem to illustrate that motherhood is a positive thing long term. Although it can cause some declines, Ultimately, mothers are happier than non-mothers to the same degree as if an employed woman made, on average, 50% more income or to the difference in happiness between being employed versus being unemployed. P.S. We are 55 minutes into this hour and 28 minute video and I'm still not getting a why. I know the title is why, but I have the feel I'm feeling the title should have been here's some data because I'm still not getting a why. So ladies, either increase your income by nearly twice as much as you currently make, okay. or have a baby to be happier. Great. Either way, you're probably going to have to please a man above you. But were any of these women actually happier, or were they just pretending to be because the patriarchy tells them that being a mother is what makes them happy? 
I've seen plenty of arguments from feminists that would imply as such. So, do the presence of norms in society that- This is so important to know which category of person you are. The reason we keep thinking, they've been lying to us. This is actually what makes women happy. They've been lying to us. This is what actually makes women happy. Women aren't a monolith. Some women will be forced into motherhood when they were not destined to be mothers. And some women will be denied motherhood when it was their destiny, right? Whatever that means. So again, this is why it feels like people will say, you're a woman, do this. And it feels like torture because it's like, I don't want to do this. I, I don't want to be told I have to do this because I'm a woman. So yes, maybe you can say, generally speaking, a lot of women, especially people in bubbles, will be in uh, two bubbles, will be more than happy to have a baby and have a great life, especially if they're taken care of, 100%. But if you're not that woman and you don't fall under that statistic, you will be miserable. So you have to be careful about knowing who you are. Which kind of woman are you? And then pick that life. That's what I'm saying. Know your joy by knowing your consciousness. If you're meant to have babies and chill, go do that. Like my sister-in-law always says, like she would have hated to work. My sister-in-law is very independent, but not as independent as me, obviously. And she is very like a head, the head of her household as a mother. She's very in control of the home as a mother, obviously. And, um, <clears throat> you know, blah, 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 blah. But she would never want to work. Never. Versus, versus me, like I've only just worked. Like even before meeting my brother, my sister-in-law barely worked. Like barely. She had like a waitressing job at a, for a second just because she was like waiting for her husband. I have always worked since I was literally a child. I dreamt about having my own business. It was a dream of mine. As a child, I started my own businesses with my neighborhood friends. We would wake up on Saturday mornings at 7 a.m. to wash cars. We made money. We split it amongst each other. We had elections as children. We wrote little essays about why I should be the president of the club. Like I had a fantasy dream of working my whole life. She had the opposite. She was like, I do not want to work. Oh my God, please don't make me work. Know who you are so you can play to your joy. The value motherhood influence. And also, she is really lucky my brother came into her life because what if he hadn't until she was much older? I'm just saying. Happiness and satisfaction in women. Soups examined this question across two studies, utilizing data from 49 countries with different degrees of gender equality. In her study, drawing from information collected by the World Values Survey between 1981 and 2004, Soups assessed subjective well-being, the belief that motherhood was the norm, the country gender inequality index, and gender equality norms. She found that respondents who endorsed the motherhood norm reported being happier than those who did not. However, this effect was small. Although comparable to the difference between having the fewest versus the most years of education in happiness for women worldwide, there was no relationship between acceptance of motherhood as the norm and life satisfaction. Subjective well-being was more strongly associated with endorsing the motherhood norm in countries with greater gender inequality, and the strength of the association grew as the level of inequality grew in the nation. In countries with more gender parity, there was little relationship between endorsing motherhood and both happiness and life satisfaction. In total, there was a small but significant relationship between acceptance of the motherhood norm and subjective well-being, although this effect was more robust in countries with greater gender inequality. That is, people who believe that motherhood is an important part of a woman's life fulfillment are more likely to be happier and more satisfied with their lives, particularly when they don't live in a country with strong feminist beliefs and gender equality. Again, that doesn't explain why. She's leaving out one of the most fundamental studies about human beings, which is they thrive with like with culture, with um, structure, community, and consistency. That's literally like, it's just science because it's your biology, because it's your herd mentality, which is fine. Like you want to be in a tribe and that's beautiful. But what if you're not a person who thrives in the tribe? Because their brain is like, no, that's impossible. You would thrive in the tribe. You just, you're in denial. And it's like, what if you're a person who doesn't? And then the feminists who feel forced to be independent learn they want to be in the tribe. Fine, but it's not about you, right? Everyone is just in their wrong bubble and they're so confused why they're unhappy because you don't even know what you want. You keep listening to everybody else tell you. Quality. But just because thinking motherhood <laughs> is a good thing for women seems to be a positive thing, in theory, is it in reality? In her second study, Soups examined the satisfaction in women with children or without children in countries with different degrees of gender equality. She found that after controlling for demographic covariates, women without children reported lower happiness than mothers, equivalent to that of about half the effect of having the lowest level of education versus the highest. 
There was no evidence for any significant interaction between endorsing motherhood as a norm with actually being a mother on either life satisfaction or on subjective well-being, nor was there any three-way interaction with country-level gender norms. And I could have made a joke about women and three-way interactions, but I didn't because this is an educational video, obviously. <laughs> Although in this analysis, women in gender unequal countries were less happy and less satisfied, that seemingly did not influence the positive effects of motherhood, which was stronger in those same regions in influencing well-being. When looking at specific women then, and following her happiness over time, it does seem that motherhood is positively related to increased happiness worldwide, mm. although it is stronger in non-feminist nations. I mean, being a mom would be dope, right? I think like being a parent would be cool. But again, like having a baby isn't about your freaking ego, right? Like that's what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about this narrative that like if you – well, it depends on how you want to do it. But just remember like when you have a baby, you're forcing someone into existence who has to then deal with life and has to be a part of these statistics. Nations. It is perhaps important to note that happiness is a measure that is often exclusively examining hedonic pleasure, and parenthood is often fulfilling while not being particularly pleasurable, mm. at least according to pretty much any parent I've ever spoken to. And as such, a massive analysis like the ones that we've looked at earlier from Hansen, while useful, don't account for the meaningfulness associated with being a parent. While there isn't a ton of research that I was able to locate that specifically examined eudaimonia, that's meaningfulness with parenting, which I frankly found a bit bizarre, it might be because scholars don't always tend to use that precise term. One study I did find, though, from Brandel, Melchiori, and Ruini, names who sound like they should be teaching abjuration, not social science, did, however, examine the roles of eudaimonia in parenting using a sample of pregnant couples from northern Italy and the RIF Psychological Wellbeing Scale, which includes a measure of purpose in life, as well as a postpartum depression instrument, which is not, as I initially believed, just an Italian term for a wine glass. <laughs> Oh, are women happier than being parents? Oh, no, wait. Are women happier being parents or are un are humans happier with a life purpose? That's the thing. Is is it having a baby or because look, of course, having a baby, if you're that's the problem is like even I'm trying to decide, are they happier? But is the baby happy? Is it a healthy relationship? Like even if the parents are happy having the baby, is the kid happier? Is the environment happier? Because, like, people who report being happy parents could also be abusive parents. And that's what I'm concerned about, obviously. Is I'm concerned about, like, when you say and you report, because I've met some of the most abusive parents in my life who always report they were happy being parents. And I'm like, but you were a bad parent. You were never around. You were never happy to be there. You were always like you would only use your child as an ego boost. So when you take a survey like this, are you also surveying abusive parents who go, of course, I'm happy being a parent. Of course, I love my kids. Like, that's what I am curious about, right? So would they say that they're happy? And also, would they say that they're happy in these studies because to say they're not happy makes them feel bad? Because often people are very much like you're not allowed to say you're an unhappy parent, which I think I think it's. If you're an unhappy parent, I kind of feel like you probably weren't meant to be one. But people who are meant to be parents and decided to have kids and are honestly happy are probably just like really good in that role. I don't think everyone's meant to be a parent, right? Not in a modern world. Maybe in a low, like low requirement biological survive to the next generation environment, but not in like a modern, modern society. So again, I am curious about all these nuances that, of course, we can't take account for if you're just simply asking people, like, are you happy? It's like, what does it mean? What does it mean? You know? Before giving birth, mothers were higher on the postpartum depression scale, which they maintained after birth, while fathers were very low in postpartum depression and quite high in psychological well-being. Mm. Gender accounted for 4.6% of the variance in the postnatal measure of well-being including eudaimonia, while the prenatal measure of well-being accounted for 70% of the variance in well-being. Thus, for both parents, the transition into parenthood produced increased eudaimonic well-being, although this effect was more pronounced in fathers than it was in mothers. So while parenthood may reduce happiness, it does seem to increase feelings of purpose in life, and particularly so in fathers. But this video is about the mom-boss phenomenon, and we have already seen how little mom-bosses care about their husband's peachy keen happiness. In fact, we've shown how a husband's happiness is actually harmful to a marriage. So let's move more directly into understanding women. Oh, okay. Slow down there, girl. Oh, what a fucking narrative, bro. Actually, we've seen how husband's happiness is bad for a marriage. That's not the point 
of the study or like what a way to twist the fucking data to fulfill your fucking narrative like what she's talking about what she mentioned earlier which is like women who are less happy in their marriages tend and could lead to breaking up those marriages but that's because the men's desirability or like happiness threshold is naturally lower than women's apparently which when the woman desires more and a husband isn't able to meet that the husband maintains his happiness but the wife doesn't of course she would leave it's not the man being happy that ruins the marriage it's the, the an unhappy partner will destroy a relationship right like whoa like that's not hello the chicken or the egg it's like obvious to me that an unhappy partner would be the one to break up the relationship how is that even like hello men or women no matter the gender wouldn't the unhappy person probably break up the relationship what are you talking about or if men are the way they are they seem to buckle down in their misery and stay in that relationship because of pride women are just more self women are more selfish in a healthier unhealthy way so I think women, I, th I think that's better. Like, obviously, like, be be invested enough in yourself to give yourself joy. Now, obviously, I would say don't marry someone who isn't your soulmate and don't settle in relationships so you don't have to get divorced. The dilemma is lots of people, lots of people settle in relationships and then they get divorced. But, like, that wasn't your soulmate, dude. You're not going to divorce your soulmate. Listen to me right now. You're not going to divorce your soulmate unless they abuse you. You're not going to divorce your soulmate unless they abuse you. You can't tell me you are having the same experience I am having and you're going to leave your partner because like of any, like if this is your soulmate, if this is the person that is so compatible with you, like the, like you're like, holy shit, how did I meet this person? This is like the most amazing thing I've ever experienced. You're not going to leave that marriage unless it's abusive. You're not going to leave that marriage over something simple. It's going to have to be so a, like specific it's gonna you know what I'm saying so if you're divorcing these marriages because you're unhappy like hello like something is fundamentally wrong it was probably not I'm just I refuse to believe this is your soulmate like I refuse to believe that your soulmate wouldn't encourage you to be happier I refuse to believe that your soulmate wouldn't lift you and be like hey I see that you're unhappy how can we how can we help what can I do to contribute to your joy what can I do to make this better I refuse to believe it and if it's possible, then I don't, you cannot be experiencing what I'm experiencing, what my parents experienced, what my friends' parents, like you do not divorce in a marriage because you're unhappy. If it is your soulmate, you usually do that because you're literally realizing like, I don't think this is my person. And I realize like I accidentally married this person. Oops. Marriage, child rearing and happiness in the context of employment <clears throat> and working. In order to fully understand the relationship between life satisfaction, marriage, and employment status versus being a stay-at-home. Mm. And because I don't think you should marry someone who's your soulmate and not your soulmate unless you are willing to settle and you know you're settling. Because I also don't think like you should be getting divorced necessarily unless you have to. Like get divorced if you have to get divorced. Like you're not trapped. But again, if we're aiming for joy, we're aiming for the most like peace and, and being the most centered – it means you have to contribute to your joy and happiness by knowing your consciousness. So you are less likely to get divorced because you chose a partner that's right for you. You are less likely to stay in an abusive relationship because you want a healthy relationship. Again, healthiness is also a part of this like conversation. Again, I'm still not hearing the why of this video. Um, wife or mother, we should look to both modern and historic data to examine if things have changed over time as more and more women have entered the workforce and fewer and fewer have chosen to or even been able to dedicate her time primarily to housework or motherhood. Although, as we mentioned in the beginning, those trends have been reversing over the last decade. To get a better idea of previous levels of satisfaction across different types of married women specifically, we can look to a study from Freudinger 1983, who examined data collected from the GSS and conducted by the National Opinion Research Center between 1973 and 1977. And I know that's a long time ago, but we're trying to get a baseline here. Women's employment status was broken down into three categories, currently employed, either fully or part-time, formerly employed for at least one year, or never employed. And all were questioned regarding their levels of satisfaction with never employed whoa community family friends leisure mm. and is there anyone in my audience who has never been employed like never had to pay government tax like never been employed like have you ever is there anyone in my audience who's an adult 
who has never paid tax to the government. Like you're not like, you know what I mean? Where you've been, is that, a, like, what's that lived experience like? And work, as well as about various individual differences, including having children, level of education, physical health, both religious and political participation, and her husband's occupational prestige. She found that working wives were slightly younger with an average age of 40.4 years than never employed wives with an age of 41.6, and formerly employed wives with an average age of 43.6 years. Working wives tended to be the most educated, followed by formerly employed wives while Ah, <clears throat> oh, okay, Maddox, you study full time. That makes sense. You didn't, you, so you don't have to work when you were in school or anything like that. But that makes sense. All never employed wives had completed the fewest years of education. As one might expect, household income was lower in households where the wife had never worked. Looking to regression analysis for working wives, happiness with marriage was the most important variable, which explained 13.5% of variance in total life satisfaction, following by her husband's occupational prestige, which explained just 3% of variance. Working wives became more satisfied with life as they aged, and again, predictably, being in better health and being more satisfied with finances were also predictors of life satisfaction in working women. For formerly working women, having a happy marriage explained even more of the variance, coming in at 17% of variance accounted for, while financial satisfaction explained 4% and religious participation explained just 1.5%. Similarly to working women, age and perceived health were both positively associated with life satisfaction. Things were a bit different for never-employed wives, though, for whom financial satisfaction was the strongest predictor of life satisfaction, explaining 14% of the variance, rather than marriage satisfaction as it was in the other two groups of women. Freudinger speculated that because wives who had never worked were completely financially dependent on their husbands and even lacked a frame of reference from which to understand personal financial contributions to the family's finances, their earnings of her husband were more important as a determinant of her total life satisfaction than happiness with the marriage itself. Hmm. Wives who had never worked derived more satisfaction from religious participation and from voting, but also- uh, uh, community, 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 structure, consistency, religion, hello. Who gained more satisfaction from having obtained a higher level of education than women in the other two categories. In turn, having preschool and school-aged children decreased never-employed women's life satisfaction, while young kids did not have this deleterious effect on other wives. This may be because, as a stay-at-home mom, these women again had no frame of reference against which to compare full-time motherhood with full or part-time employment. So for mm. women who were working or who had worked in the past, they appreciated their time spent taking care of children, being able to compare that time to time spent in the workplace. Meaning perhaps moms who have never worked see parenting as more stressful than moms who have worked a job. And even though these data concern women in the 1970s, looking at you there, Mary. At the same time, never employed wives reported higher levels of satisfaction when their children were teenaged, which Freudinger suggests may allow her a form of living vicariously through her kids, mm. as unlike other wives, life satisfaction dropped in never employed mothers with age, possibly indicating a kind of empty nest syndrome after the children leave the familial home. But things have surely changed since the 1970s, namely the women's rights movement and the number of women in the workforce versus staying at home, which has been on an upward trend until quite recently, again. So what are things like for working versus stay at home moms now on this side of the second millennium? Well, a study from Craney and Miles 2017 examined work satisfaction in mothers between 1972 and 2012, utilizing data from the GSS and may provide us with some answers. Mothers were asked how satisfied they were with the work that she did which could include part-time work, full-time work, or keeping house. They found that the majority of women were moderately to very satisfied with their work, regardless of whether it was paid employment or being a full-time mom. I believe that. I really do, right? If you're really hustling as a stay-at-home mom, if you're doing a lot around the house, I really think like some humans' brains really need work, which is interesting because I was watching Dr. K on um, uh, OTK's podcast. Uh, it's not OTK, but it's Breakfast and Eggs. What is it called? With... Emaru and Tectone. I was watching the podcast with Dr. K and they were, he was talking about how he predicts like there's going to be a shift in working and how in maybe 40, 50 years we won't be working the way we see it. Like some people will always be working, but he thinks AI is going to help people work less and focus more on creative endeavors, which would be awesome, by the way. Like if like I would still be doing this, this would be considered like a creative endeavor you know, more than like a, a, a typical job-ish. Not that AI isn't also probably going to take over some form of streaming, right? Which is kind of funny. But I thought that was interesting because some people believe in the theory that like humans need to work, but I think humans need to have a purpose. So it's not about working. It's about doing something productive, whether that's being a stay-at-home 
wife or being a baker or giving people a place to go on the weekends. Like again, it's about what you're doing. It's about getting up. It's about having a reason to get up in the morning. You know what I mean? It's about finding a reason to get up in the morning. I think that's what's important. So I'm very excited to see what happens in the next like 50 years. I mean, I'll be an old lady, but I'm stoked to see what the world looks like because that would be a very interesting change, you know? Once again, illustrating that women are generally pretty happy, or at least they used to be. However, at a broad level, employed mothers were more- I like how she's just walking in the street with shopping bags, like spinning happily. More satisfied with their work than stay-at-home moms. But this changed over time. Specifically- JJ, you're so funny. I wish I could be creative enough to figure out what creative endeavor I want to do. <laughs> Why is that so funny? Can I tell you the truth though, girl? Let me tell you, as somebody who's tried everything under the sun, scrapbooking, quilting, crocheting, um, uh, painting, uh, uh, arts and crafts in some variation, woodworking, as somebody who's tried everything, because I always wanted to be a creative, the only thing I ever came back to was this. This is the only thing I have ever consistently done in my life is YouTube. I've done it since I was like 18, 19. And I've done it consistently. I've tried so many other kinds, but this is the only thing. I've written three books, like, you know what I mean, in my own time. I've done so many things and none of them took off. None of them became a career. None of them became my passion, except for this. For some reason, this, even though my head is pounding right now, I'm so tired. I'm literally sick. I'm breaking out in cold sweats. Like I'm hot sweats, cold sweats. I'm like shivering, but sweating. I love being here. My head is pounding. I have such a bad headache right now. And I just love being here. As somebody who has tried so many different ways, it was so clear this was always going to be it. But until I turned 30, I still questioned if this was it. Until I turned 30, I was still trying things. I was like, is this it? Is this it? Is this it? And I was like, oh, it's this, isn't it? It's the thing. Brittany, hey, dum dum. It was the thing you had never stopped doing, you dumb bitch. It was the literally the thing you never stopped doing. And even when I took a break from YouTube, I always came back. I took like multiple breaks from YouTube, like six months at a time. I always came back. This is the only thing I ever came back to do. I never went back to drawing. I never went back to paint. I never went back to anything but this. And I, by the way, I'm pretty good at art. I could have been an artist. Like I'm not, I'm not bad. The woman who was teaching me art, she was like, honestly, Brittany, like you could do this. I was like, I could do this. But this is what I came back to. You know, and I think that that's you got to try everything, girl. I don't care how many times you got to go to Joanne's or Michael's. I can't tell you how many thousands, thousands. I've spent thousands of dollars on figuring out what art I wanted. Sewing. I've had so many sewing machines, fabrics. I've att I have attempted so many things. I have spent so much trying to figure. That's what I'm saying. Have a relationship with your consciousness, with yourself with yourself because no one's going to figure this out for you you know in 1974 stay-at-home moms had a negative 0.09 lower probability of being very satisfied with work but this tendency altered over time becoming statistically indistinguishable from zero by 1998 and by the way you know my sister-in-law who's on her fifth child right now i'll tell you this even though she's a stay-at-home mom full-time and i told you guys she hustle hustles being a stay-at-home mom she's fully busy she is an amazing painter she is so talented. It's insane. Like, it is insane how talented she is. She does calligraphy. She's amazing, right? She's, like, so talented. She's – her my, her art – she does oil painting. It blows my mind how talented this woman is. But she doesn't have enough time when having kids as well. But when she does have her own personal time, that's what she does. She paints and she does arts and crafts and calligraphy and she does like all this amazing stuff. She's so talented. I can't even explain to you how talented my sister-in-law is. She, her, her stuff blows my mind, bro. It's so good. But it's a hobby. It's her thing. It's what she wants to do. Her first job is being a mom. And I think that's beautiful. But she knows that about her. She knows she's always wanted to be a mom, but she still has her own, she has an identity. And that's what's really important, you know? Ingrid said, show us what you made, bro. I Haven't you guys seen it? I only have a few pieces of drawings. I mean, I'll share it to the Discord again. It's in my storage. Like, I just came across my drawings the other day. They're okay. I, again, this was like my first attempt at drawing. I, I I took like a little class with a family friend who's an amazing artist. Amazing oil, amazing artist, amazing draw, amazing artist. 
and she gave me some drawing lessons and it was like literally for like a few months I was just doing some art with her and she's like you should do this and I was like I I could do this like farm brother too he's really good at it too but we don't we don't pursue it we have our own things we pursue I'll show you I, I think I've shared it to the discord before but I can share it again again they're just like sketches of my time starting out but I was like I see it I see the potential there Mm -hmm. Further, the percentage of respondents who strongly agreed that being a housewife is just as fulfilling as paid work increased from 1990 to 2006. However, it seems that the degree to which women felt satisfied with being a full-time mother was somewhat dependent on general cultural perceptions of women's roles in society. Specifically, when only 21% of the US population agreed that being a housewife could be as fulfilling as paid work, which was the minimum reported agreement on that instrument occurring in the early 1990s, being a stay-at-home mom had a negative effect on work satisfaction. Mm. However, when that rose to just 32% of the population, there was no longer any relationship between being a stay-at-home mom and work satisfaction, mm. comparative to employed mothers, indicating that women's happiness with work is seemingly heavily dependent on social norms, further indicating that social science exists to evidence the obvious and call women out on their BS. Household income and class status all- I feel like this is a straight women problem once again. If you're a woman whose whole life is centered around being partnered, you're gonna have a worse relationship with work. If you're a woman whose life isn't centered on being partnered with a man, you're gonna have less of a relation- less of a negative relationship with work. Like one of the unique things about my husband is he's not threatened by my job. He doesn't need to work to prove himself. He's so secure in his identity as a person that he's never threatened by my success. And that was the distinguished, like that was one of the elements about him I needed. All the other men I tried to go on dates with were so insecure and so threatened by me that I was like, what's wrong with you? Not every every single one, but a lot of them, okay? Don't take, guys, I speak in black and white sometimes. Not literally every single man, but a lot of them. So for me, one of the characteristics I was looking in my partner, man or woman, was somebody who was excited that I worked and somebody who didn't ask me to stop working. Like there's not, there should never be a conversation in my relationship where he says, so when do you think you're going to stop working? Like, what do you mean? Like if my husband came to me and he's like, so when do you think you're going to stop working? I'd be like, you hit your head? Do we need to go see the doctor? Like that's not the relationship I signed up for, right? There's no reality where Britney stops working. There's only a reality where Britney shifts her relationship with work, which is not the same. So again, this study, these numbers, these things, if you're a straight woman dating men who have a desire to be the breadwinner, then yes, you're probably going to have a negative relationship with working if you're coming home to a partner who's always nagging you about working or insecure about the fact that you work or seems threatened by the fact that you work. Like, do you get what I'm saying? Like, what are we talking about here? Also played a role as moms with college degrees who presumably are of higher class status than those without a college degree. Or yes, Miss P, I agree. I just like her framing. Like, this science is so subjective. We have no... Uh, why we don't even know why they were even asked like literally the title of this video is why empowered women are miserable but like i have yet to hear a why what is the why more affected by changes in work satisfaction related to single motherhood additionally and predictably stay-at-home moms from wealthier households experienced the greatest gains in life satisfaction and were more satisfied with their work by 2012 than employed mothers much like the author of mom life comics who has a lawyer husband and doesn't need to work yet still feels the need to well doesn't quote need to work what does need to work mean, right? Complain about it. These scholars suggest that the- Also, yeah, her comics are cringe if that's her life. Increasing happiness with their job as a mother seen in women over time is highly dependent on societal acceptance of that role, which means curiously, the women's rights movement in its emphasis on women working and being in the workplace- Also, what if her husband's a poor lawyer? and not in the home could have significantly negatively influenced women's satisfaction with being full-time moms. And it was only when it became more socially acceptable to be a mom. Oh my God, I love her hair. Oh, I miss my red hair. I'm not gonna lie. I miss dyeing my hair red. <laughs> as a profession that women who chose to be mothers as their primary job became more satisfied with that role, as were women in the workforce. Feminists made women less satisfied with their lives. How shocking. We can further examine broad changes in happiness across mothers and non-mothers over time that seems to reflect societal changes in acceptance of being a stay-at-home mom versus being a working mother in a study of German women between 1984 and 2015 from Preisner et al.
They found that mothers and non-mothers showed a similar course of life satisfaction with a slight drop in the 1990s through the mid-2000s, followed by a rise going into the 2010s at which point mothers' satisfaction outpaced non-mothers. Specifically, up until 2010, women reported lower satisfaction in life in every previous year of assessment in in-between subjects design, while within subjects, that is only amongst mothers, life satisfaction had been increasing slowly but steadily since 1996. When controlling for socioeconomic variables, this relationship started to become more clear as mothers were less satisfied when they had fewer socioeconomic resources, and given that children can be quite expensive, it makes sense why mothers may be less satisfied with their finances, because they were worried about their dependents. Or in other words, in the past, mothers had reported lower life satisfaction than women without children, at least in part because it was more difficult for them to pursue a career and full-time work, which may have led to them having fewer socioeconomic resources. Now, that was largely the conclusion of the authors, but I would also like to add that the rising costs of housing, healthcare, and college have made it so that while- This is a year ago. It's gotten worse. This video was put out a year ago. It has literally gotten worse in the last year. A family could easily live on a single earner's average income of about $25,000 a year in 1985, at least in the US. Before I was born. As if not in East Germany, meaning that there was generally no need for a married woman to work in the 1980s in order to be secure in her socioeconomic status. That began to change in the 1990s and 2000s, and more and more women entered the workforce. And as such, I'm not so sure about the scholar's conclusion that mother's lower socioeconomic satisfaction in the past was because she had fewer work opportunities. It seems that boomers perhaps made a mess of motherhood, as with so many other things. Oh, he punched me in the face! And I don't say that without evidence, because also from the research itself, as more women disagreed with the statement that mothers should not work outside of the home in this data set, the more conducive motherhood became to life satisfaction, both within groups of mothers and between groups of mothers and non-mothers. She doesn't source any of her sources? Wait, where are her sources? Hello, where are your sources? Where are her sources? Why are they posted in the description? This changed over time as near the end of the observation period in the mid-2010s, the differences between mothers and non-mothers seemed to vanish altogether with the relaxing of social norms for maternal employment at the raw data set level. However, the findings actually did remain consistent when controlling for socioeconomic status, in that mothers were increasingly more satisfied than women without children. Over time, the more women disagreed with the statement that mothers should stay home, the more conducive motherhood was to life satisfaction for women who continued with a full-time job, changed to a part-time job, or quit working altogether. That is, the more feminist influence in society, the more motherhood remained a positive influence on women working both in employment and in the home, with one exception, that being that motherhood was associated with reduced satisfaction in women who had lost their jobs, rather unsurprisingly, because getting fired sucks for most people, except maybe those doing the firing. Mr. Gribble, how would you like to make this your permanent job? Firing Gladstone? Sure. Gladstone! Uh. No. The more women who disagreed with the belief that women should not work, the smaller the gap in satisfaction between mothers working full-time and non-employed mothers was, with unintentional unemployment remaining as a persistently negative influence. In total then, as fewer and fewer people agreed with the notion that women should not work outside of the home, motherhood was increasingly conducive to life satisfaction. The maternal happiness gap vanished, maternal employment was increasingly beneficial in terms of life satisfaction, and the happiness gaps between mothers with <gasps> I love those raps. Different working statuses narrowed with the exception of newly unemployed mothers. In short, again, the opinions of society at large seem to have- Okay, first of all, the- this is a great image. I love this girl in the back here. Obviously, like, relatable. Love it. Love a vibe. A significant effect on the happiness of mothers. In terms of various other variables that might influence this trend, the scholars found that single mothers consistently reported lower life satisfaction. But that was largely oh, attributable- what? Single mothers? Are reportings no shit bro what the fuck why are you saying that like like no shit two demographic characteristics oh and my god being a single parent sucks no shit bro it's fucking hard being a parent with a partner is hard oh my god doing life alone when you have a baby is hard no shit low bro. socioeconomic resources of those mothers 
the number of children- Unless you're wealthy and you can pay for a nanny and all that shit. And seemingly made no difference in the disparity between happiness of mothers and non-mothers, as it was a transition into motherhood that made the difference, not the number of children. At least, again, at the raw data level. However, when adjusting for SES cool. factors, Dude. mothers with one child and non-mothers reported the same levels of life satisfaction but mothers of two or more children reported higher life satisfaction. Although to be fair, there may- Ooh, I wonder if it's because he got siblings. Maybe an upper limit to that one. I've got no option but to sell you all for scientific experiments. Oh, oh no, my OBS is disconnecting. Am I still here? My OBS disconnected. Am I still here? Am I still here? Yeah, you're here? Okay, okay. No, no. Look, I think my farm brother is going to have 12 kids, if I'm going to be honest with you. So my parents had 10 kids. Okay, well, 10 kids that made it to term, right? And my mom had three kids by 30, and my sister-in-law has four kids by 30, and she's about to have her fifth if it reaches to term, right? So... I think they're going to have 12 kids total, in my opinion, because she's got another 10, let's say 10 solid years of birth making, and they're on a roll. So let's say my farm brother has 12 kids. He can afford them. He can build a life for them. He's well off. He's he's doing really well for himself. My brother is like, he was really born into the most perfect bubble for him. He's doing very well for himself. And that's really great. Like, they're probably the perfect example of somebody who should and can handle a big family. And... um. It is wonder, like it is a, it is an interesting thing to see it happen. But then other people who have that many kids or even one kid, I'm like, no, you're not ready. Like I will look at some people and be like, you shouldn't even have one kid, bro. You're not ready. Versus him, I was like, yeah, you're ready to have twelve kids. <laughs> Everyone is different. Everyone, is, I don't even know if I'm ready to have a kid, and I think he's ready to have twelve. Some people are just more ready to be in that role because it's a completely different lifestyle. It's a completely different role. Now, a lot of people, when it's unplanned or even planned, but you're like left alone or you have nuances to your relationships, you make it work regardless. And I think that's even more amazing. I know so many amazing single parents, single moms in particular, though a couple of single dads too, who are just really great, fully like embrace the role or even had moments where like they needed their family support in some way, which is so important, right? Having that village. And look, that's another consideration to take in is like my brother is purposely, I told you guys, he moved from Arizona to another state with a Catholic community so his kids would have friends and people and find their spouses one day and actually like mingle with people that they might like because in Arizona there was nobody. Guys, in Arizona where he lived in this town of like 500 people, there were two families with kids and his family was one of them. There was no chance his kids were going to grow up with people around him. So around them. So he moved them. He was like, we're moving. We're moving to a community. See how he made the effort and it cost a lot of money and it took a lot of effort and they went and did it. And now his wife has friends. The kids have friends. Everybody has a community and it's really beautiful. And I'm so happy for them because truly my parents just went and visited them and said, like, Brittany, they're so happy. They really found a place that means something to them. It's really lovely. But they're doing it thinking about their kids from 20 years from now. They're very responsible when it comes to having kids. Um, but like, again, if I had a kid five years ago, it would have been very irresponsible. I wasn't ready. If I have a kid now, I'll make it work. It's not a preference. But I'm definitely more ready and responsible now than I ever have been. It's not ideal, though. So we are not manifesting a baby. <laughs> this birth control better work. Oh, that's the way it is, my loves. Blame the Catholic Church for not letting me wear one of those little rubber things. Okay. There was no apparent difference in the positive effect of motherhood regarding the gender of her children. So overall then, motherhood became increasingly positive for women over time in Germany, despite the decreasing percentage of people who posited that a woman's role should be as a mother rather than in the workforce. Again, this presents as a seeming paradox, as while women's rights increased, women simultaneously became happier as mothers and homemakers. Despite the increasingly positive effect of motherhood in Germany... But like, let them. That's what I'm saying. Like, let them. Right? Like, ultimately... Okay. Ultimately, I think people should... We should have more choices so the minority who doesn't fit into the majority has a place in society. We're not 
making, we're not giving women more rights so women can all choose not to be mothers. We're giving women more rights so the women who don't fit into the mold still have a place in society, guys. Focus. We're not giving men more social acceptability about being stay-at-home dads or being whatever so more men do this. It's just that the men who want to do this can. We're just trying to give people options so everyone in society has a role. It's just about everyone in the, so- in the society having a role. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing, okay? That's what we're doing. It's possible that part of the reason that some stay-at-home moms were less satisfied with their role in society is because they felt that said role was simply sexist or aggressive and inappropriate for a modern woman to hold. Is it into the world, babe? And you still find the time to make the nicest peccary pie in all the long box. Oh, darling, I remember when the least little problem used to put you right to sleep. Oh, not anymore, Madge. Today's modern now a go-go woman just pops these simple little pills called Anger Dream. What about the opposite case, though? Women who feel trapped by motherhood and unable to sustain their career goals. We can learn more about that by looking to a longitudinal study from Johnstone and Lucky 2021, who examined the life satisfaction of Australian women, drawing from two waves of data collected from women born between 1973 and 1978, once when they were in their mid-20s and again when they were in their mid-30s. Remember that in Australia, of course, taking care of children and fending off random encounters with the wildlife is a uniquely taxing motherhood experience. The scholars compared the answers women gave to various questions while in their mid-twenties, including what kind of job they would like to have and if they would like to be a mother by the time she turned 35, and compared these answers to- One of my besties was in um, the Midwest, and this little girl goes, how old are you? And she goes, I'm 24. And she goes, why don't you have a baby yet? <laughs> and my friend was like, I'm a baby. Like, it was so funny. Like, every bubble is different, but literally- I thought 25 too. I was like, by 25, I'm going to have a husband. I'm going to have a house. I'm going to have all of this stuff, you know? So funny. So funny. Two measures of career satisfaction, motherhood satisfaction, overall life satisfaction, mental health, relationship status, and financial stress from the same cohort of women a decade later when they were on average about 35. These two times of assessment allow us to get a clearer picture to better understand how young women growing up after the women's rights movement felt about career versus motherhood and whether or not they were truly happier in the workforce rather than in the home. I'm not going to lie. I'm spending a lot of this video just observing everyone's hairstyles, eyebrows, and dye jobs, and I'm kind of getting inspiration. I'm not going to lie. So I get to work outside the home? Totally. You get to sit in a cubicle all day while you stare at a computer screen chugging coffee. So liberating, right? But the researchers also recruited 45 women. God, bubbles are so basic. Oh, wow, the stereotype is like blue hair, purple hair, and a nose ring, right? And like, oh my gosh, you get to be in a cubicle all day. Girl, you being in a cubicle all day is a choice. You get to choose your job, dumbass. Dummy. Hey, dummy. <laughs> I'm tired. Dummy, you get to choose your job. You can choose being a mother, dummy. Like, you don't have to work, stupid. Like, you can literally choose. That's the point. You can be in a cubicle if you want, or you can get a different job. You can get any job you want that hires women. Whoa. Or you don't have to work. A society that encourages women to work also allows women to choose not to work. Just like men. Plenty of men don't work. I don't like societally, there's some pressure, and that's like you got to work on it. But like literally, you can choose. Like again, they're not thinking about the other women. Hey, guess what? You don't have to work. You can stay home all day and just have babies. And it's like, oh, and it's like, and you don't have to worry about your like what you're into. You can just like stay home and like fulfill your man's desires. It's like, oh, they never think about the other. Again, giving people choice. Hello. Isn't about denying you yours. It shouldn't be. Everyone get on board. It should be about giving people choice. So everybody has a role in society. Okay. So liberating, right? But the researchers also recruited 45 women. That's true, G. 99% of people literally think they can't choose their job. I know. They need to fucking get their shit together. Guys, are you independent thinkers? Are you, are you strong? Are you smart? You can, can you figure out how to choose your job? 
Can you fucking figure it out? Like literally figure it out before you have a baby. Jesus, you can't even figure out how to pick a job, but you want to have a baby. I'm going to fucking. Women from the survey sample, six of whom were stay at home moms with whom they conducted semi-structured interviews to really get a better idea. This guy made a whole job up. This is why it's so you are living in the best time in history. You can make a job up, make it up. There's a guy who made a job up where he goes to your funeral, like people's funerals and like, like blows it up like you come in and do comedy and stuff he's hired by the person who died so basically you he made up a job where he will crash your funeral for you bam a business you're living in the best time in history make it up idea of how these women felt of the 22.5 percent of respondents who indicated at the time that she was a stay-at-home mother 83 percent previously aspired to be employed either full-time or part-time meaning only 17 percent had always wanted to be stay-at-home moms an extremely low percentage comparative to the U.S. Gallup polling data. But how did that low percentage influence outcomes for these women? Well, first, a vast majority of stay-at-home moms were married or in a de facto married relationship, 91%, with 3% being single or widowed and 6% being divorced. Financial stress and relationship status accounted for 8% of variance in mental health, 6%- Literally, wait, G said I had to work at McDonald's in quotation marks, BK right next door. Okay, first of all, that's funny. But also, this is the thing, okay. If you're going to work at a fast food restaurant, work at one that pays you more like in and out It's privately owned. It's not a franchise and they pay more than minimum wage, right? Now, to be fair, in and out is only in a certain area of the United States, but that's what I did. At a high school, I worked at a veterinary office. I worked for my dad and I worked at in and out and I worked three, three jobs every day and I basically didn't sleep and it was great and I was reading like a book a day. It was like my life was full, okay? But I worked at in and out They paid me $2 over minimum wage at the time. I think it was $2. And then you had the chances of moving up very quickly. Managers of in and outs make six figures or more. Like you can choose McDonald's and do that route or you can do in and out bros. And they feed you every day. in and out feeds you a meal every day. A drink, a fry, and a burger. Every day you work, you don't even have to take lunch to work. They'll feed you. I'm telling you, if you're going to work fast food, go for the fast food, fast food restaurant that will treat you better. Now, here's the problem. They treat you very well because they also expect you to work really well. It is worth it to work at in and out to me personally. I think it was a really good job out of high school. And in general, even as an adult, like an older adult, it's a really good job. But hear me out. You have to work. You can't be on your phone. You can't fuck around. You can't spit in people's food. You can't like do the Burger King thing where you step on people's lettuce. You have to like actually work and treat your customers with dignity and therefore in and out will treat you with dignity. They're a good company to work for. They will take care of you. Percent overall life satisfaction, 2.5% for satisfaction with motherhood and 2% for satisfaction with career. Those who reported thinking that managing family income was easy had better mental health and life satisfaction and tended to be more satisfied with their careers, mm. but not with motherhood. Being separated or divorced was related to mental health issues, lower life satisfaction, and greater dissatisfaction with being a mother, while being single or widowed was only associated with mental health struggles, but not other issues of dissatisfaction. Mm. Prior aspirations previous to becoming a mother, while these women were in their 20s, did not account for any additional variance in mental health, overall life satisfaction, and satisfaction with motherhood in their 30s. And although prior desire to be employed full-time was uniquely associated with lower life satisfaction, it did not account for significant change in variance in the model, unlike other assessed variables pertinent to Aussie life, including the consumption of copious amounts of illegal substances. And, uh, have you taken any illegal substances today, Miss Guffey? Not for five years. Good riddance to that evil shit. It rots your mind, body, and soul. So I'm the whole. I'm done with ice, crack, gax, and smack. And I've got the token from NA to prove exactly that. I'm just trying to set a good example for me daughter. Okay, you've tested positive to speed. Stay-at-home moms who had previously desired to work full-time, however, were less satisfied with their careers than women who had always wanted to be homemakers. But this was the only significant difference. Open-ended responses allow us to gain greater insight into the feelings of these women regarding their life choices. Of the six women that were stay-at-home moms, only two indicated that they had always wanted to be in that role. The first did note, however, that she had been unmotivated of these women regarding their life choices. Of the six women that were stay-at-home moms, only two indicated that they had always wanted to be in that role. The first did note, however, that she had been unmotivated in school and did not attend university, and the second mentioned that her child had major health issues that required long stays in the hospital and daily monitoring, both circumstances that may have made having a career far more difficult for these two women. 
Concerning finances, several mothers mentioned working for several years before having children to get ahead on things. Some mentioned prioritizing needs over wants, and others discussed the cost of childcare. In terms of cultural norms, one woman expressed that both she and her husband were raised on farms with mothers who served traditional roles as homemakers, while another said that if she were to return to the workforce, that would mean more housework for her husband, which she implied would just be unfair, given that he was the primary breadwinner. And even if she were to work just one day a month, that's one day that would present- Okay, to be fair, to be fair, there is a real truth to this. Even in my relationship, if my husband works full time, it will make it very difficult maintaining the household chores. I think mostly because we're both neurodivergent and it is more of a disadvantage to have him work in some ways because he maintains the whole house. If he works full time, we're not going to have the spoons. I don't have the spoons to do everything like in the house and work and he's not going to have the spoons. So for these husbands that already work full time and are the breadwinners, I can see the disadvantage to having their partner work because now neither of them have the spoons to keep up the household chores. If you want your house at a certain standard of clean, if you want to swept and mopped every day, that is a full-time job. I'm going to be real with you. I don't know how, you know that joke on TikTok, how do you have a clean house? You clean 24 seven. It is a lot of work to maintain a very clean home, especially with a pet or a child. It is a full-time job to do everything every day, all the time. So for me, I personally see it as a disadvantage for my partner to work, but if he wants to work, if he wants to focus on his job, I absolutely want him to do that. I just want him to do whatever is always going to fulfill his joy. Whatever that is, I'm here for it. So for me, obviously, his joy is like my first and most important priority and vice versa. My joy is my priority, which is why he would never ask me not to work. Because if he, or not to, yeah, if he asked me not to work, it would stifle my curiosity which would like challenge like st stifle my joy and then we'd have to have a conversation about why he's doing this to me so okay so when we have these like relationship conversations it's it is one of those things where again you want the team to win and sometimes that looks unorthodox so again I don't want a stay-at-home partner okay this is my nightmare is having one of those stay-at-home partners or moms who just don't do anything like they're bored they're like I'm bored there's nothing to do and I'm like you can't be. There's so much to do. There's so much. There's dinner. There's cleaning. There's shopping. There's organizing. There's hobbies. There's meditation. There's working out. There's enjoying your kid. There's like, there's so much life to be lived. I just would be so sad if I chose a partner who didn't know how to live their life in my age. When I was younger, that makes sense. We're all learning how to live our life. But I wanted to make sure that I was with somebody who knew enough about themselves to live their own life and figure out their own like, joy and maintain it right so again that picture of the mom they just showed with the mom and the binky and she was just kind of like looking bored I'm like why are you bored like that doesn't make any sense to be bored with your life like you know come on let's go like get to know yourself please like you have so much time and effort and I think a lot of working husbands do resent stay-at-home moms because they'll see some of those moms not do anything and they're like why is your life hard like you're not doing anything and I'm like, yeah, if you're literally not doing anything all day, that's so weird to me. And a lot of women, I'm sorry, who don't have any aspirations or goals or hobbies, they confuse me as partners and moms. Like if you're what, hmm, you know what I mean? Like, hmm, I don't know, like something about that feels weird. Like I'm not, maybe I'm just not attracted to that kind of person. I'm not very attracted to a person who lacks ambition, to be fair. And I don't mean ambition like with career. I mean like for their life. Like they know themselves. They know what they like. They know what games they like. They know what hobbies they like. They know what food they like. Like, oh my God, have you ever met somebody who doesn't know what they like to do, who doesn't know what they like to eat? They just, I've only met young, young, young people like this and a few older people, but they don't know anything about themselves. They're just like, I don't know if I like that. I don't know. I don't know. And I'm like, bro you gotta figure it out my bro you gotta figure and that's a great journey again know yourself well enough to know why you're choosing your partners sent a major change for her home dynamic a sentiment surely unfathomable to mary Starr. several women mentioned child care as being inferior to a mother's care with participant three saying quote from what i hear there's lots of daycare centers and that sort of thing and kids can be dropped off at school and have before school care and after school care I'm of the other camp, I think kids would be so much better if somebody, not necessarily a mother, but if somebody stayed home and looked after them. I think there's so much more to be gained from having someone who loves you and is raising you as they want you to be, rather than just someone taking care of you. 
Some of the stay-at-home moms hinted at the divide between employed women and themselves, and one even stated that she was probably a bad participant for what she believed the scholars were trying to study because her life ambition was always to be a mother, and as such, she felt that she had achieved her life goals, even though those goals were not modern, illustrating that perhaps- Interesting. Um, if your goal is to be a mother, is having the baby alone enough or is raising a competent adult a part of that? Because I think that's interesting. You know what I mean? Uh, Vacan says, what if my ambition is to unalive myself? Honestly, um, kind of amazing because you will eventually die. So technically, you've already accomplished your goal because it will happen. So how does that feel? You accomplished it. I mean, you literally chose a goal that no matter what you do, it will happen. Kind of amazing. Really, if you think about it, you already did it. You fulfilled your ambition. Now what? Are you joyful? Find a new ambition. Perhaps some stay-at-home mothers feel, if not ashamed, at least out of place with what a woman should be in the 21st century. I do applaud the authors for keeping her comments in the study, as she was probably right in that she was not the type of participant that they were really looking for. Despite the problems these mothers faced, though, Participant 5 was explicit that she was very satisfied with her life and felt totally in control of it. In total, then, it does seem that stay-at-home mm. moms are just... In my early, early 20s, I did also think being a stay-at-home mom was really, really bad and like super scary and lazy, but that's only because so many people end up dating the wrong person. But if you date the right person, there should be nothing really scary about being a stay-at-home mom, except, of course, in case your partner accidentally dies on you and then you're like, oh my God, I have to go back to the workforce and oh my God. So other than that, I don't think it's really bad to be a stay-at-home partner. You know what I mean? generally not worse off psychologically than employed mothers, regardless of whether or not being a full-time mother was her goal in life. All the women were less satisfied with being a mom as a job when they had previously aspired to be employed in the workforce full-time. This is important. My bestie and I were talking about this because she and I are very career-driven. And I said, be honest with me, like if you had a kid right now, would you resent that baby? She goes, I think I would resent me being dumb enough to get pregnant. Because like, like, that's the thing is, like, I I would accept it. Oh, I just, mm, the problem is, like, I am not at the stage of my life where I can have an abortion unless it's for, like, a really good reason. And so I'm, like, so annoyed with myself if I get pregnant because I'm, like, <laughs> and this is, like, oh, the irony is, like, I will make do and I will make best and I'll be a great mom. But, like, also I will be kind of annoyed because, like, I really like my job right now and I like to do it and it's really hard to do when you have a baby. But it is one of those things where my partner would just be the stay-at-home partner and he would have to take care of that baby. And I would see that baby in between calls and in between streams and, in, and everything. We'd work from home. We'd be from home. But that's the only way we're having that baby. I'm, I am not giving up my job. I'm not doing it. Maybe in a different – maybe a different Brittany will give up her job, but this Brittany's not doing it. So I talked to my friend about that. My friend's like, yeah, I'm not doing it. Like if I'm this version of myself, I'm not giving up my job. And the thing is, is like that's why we're not having babies. Because we're not going to give up our jobs. And we both, I don't think we'd have the spoons to be working moms and career people. It's a lot. It sounds stressful. I don't want it. We can gain more information about the happiness of employed mothers compared to stay-at-home moms by looking to a study from Hemplova 2016, mm. utilizing data from mothers between 25 and 49, living with at least one child collected by the Organization for Economic Cooperation Look and Development curls. concerning their employment and levels of happiness. Overall, there was little difference in happiness between homemakers versus working mothers among mm. women with children under the age of three, as three quarters of both groups reported feeling happy most of the time. There were some differences by nation, however, as female employment produced more happiness in Lithuania, Romania, and Slovenia, while being a stay-at-home mom produced more happiness in Estonia, Germany, Spain, and Finland. In contrast to moms of kids under three, mothers of school-aged children were slightly happier as homemakers than being full-time working mothers. As such, in countries with low maternal employment rates, stay-at-home mothers with small children were generally happier than employed mothers, while working mothers were happier than homemakers in countries where maternal- Can I ask a question? I like how all this B-roll and behind the scenes role has moms in the office and their kids are at work with them. That's so cute. But like, when does that happen? Except for go to work day, like whatever that is. Employment was more common. 
Once again, we can see here that social norms seem to play a significant role in how happy women are as either mothers or workers. Speaking of social norms, how do women themselves feel about motherhood? She's explaining the bubble. Exactly. If you vibe in the bubble and you're a part of the bubble, of course your like, happiness is going to go up. If the bubble isn't shaming you for being a mom, you're happy. If the bubble isn't shaming you for being a working person, you're happier. Like Shame plays so much into how we live our lives, which is why I think you should do away with it by adhering to your own values and like, focus on those. But I understand when you live in a society, you live in a bubble and it works. Shame can be a useful tool, blah, blah, blah. So again, like, of course, like, your environment matters. Hello? And how does it differ based on whether she herself is a mother? McQuillian et al. 2008 examined this question in a sample of American women between ages 25 and 45. Subjects were asked how important motherhood was to their lives, the value she placed on work and leisure activities, cultural and religious beliefs, relationship status, as well as several questions regarding control variables, including general health and economic concerns. As one might expect, the average importance of motherhood was significantly higher for mothers than for non-mothers, and there was less variance in mothers' opinions on motherhood than in non-mothers. Very few mothers reported that motherhood was of low importance, and virtually none rated motherhood amongst the lowest levels of importance. Small mercies. Looking to regression analysis, there was a significant positive association between valuing success at work and the importance of motherhood for mothers, but not for non-mothers, indicating mothers value both work and motherhood simultaneous, while non-mothers typically only tended to value work. In contrast, there was no relationship between valuing motherhood and valuing leisure in mothers, but for non-mothers, the relationship was significant and negative, meaning non-mothers who value leisure time were less likely to value motherhood, likely seeing motherhood as a status that would seriously deleteriously impact their leisure. Just goes to show that most Darwin Award winners are women, albeit not in the most interesting or amusing way that most people come about being Darwin Award winners, but instead slowly while surrounded by cats and, again, boxed wine. Once again, proving that women are bad at comedy. Now, in real life, I know there are loads of funny women. Like, um... <laughs> I did it again, well spotted. Additionally, mothers who were employed full-time placed less value on motherhood than full-time moms not in the labor force. There was no relationship between valuing motherhood and levels of education, which was contrary to the researchers' hypothesis, as they anticipated that more educated women would place less value on motherhood. Perhaps they did not consider that more educated women might be more aware of some of this research on why motherhood is generally a pretty good thing, but I digress. Literally, Miss P, same. Holy shit, this framing. I know this framing is so weird. By the way, we are basically at the end of this video and she still hasn't told us the why. But I will tell you the why. You're not having a relationship with your consciousness. You have no idea what you're doing or why you're doing it. You need to figure out what you actually want in life and then either move to a culture that supports that or make up your own little one yourself. But like this video is still an hour and a half of our life and we still don't know why. She's just, this video should have been called The Data Around Empowered Women Being Miserable. Then it would have been a fair title. But the why seems like, okay. More religious women place more value on motherhood while holding egalitarian- Oh my god, no way, bro. Gender attitudes was associated with less importance placed on motherhood. Older non-mothers place the least value on motherhood, also known as a cope, while age played no- Oh! oh. Listen to this bitch's bias, bro. Motherhood while holding egalitarian gender attitudes was associated with less importance placed on motherhood. Older non-mothers place the least value on motherhood, also known as a cope, while age Older mothers placed on motherhood. Older non-mothers place the least value on mother. Older non-mothers, okay. Hood, also known as a cope. Well, a what? What is this bias? It's the data is showing it to you, and she's like, "Nope, it's a cope." And I'm like, "What? How is that a cope that older non-mothers put less of an importance on it? Like, how is that a cope?" Age played no role in the value of motherhood in mothers. Widowed and never married mothers place less importance on motherhood than did married mothers, perhaps because of the many challenges faced by single moms, including but not limited to finances, childcare, and the continued threat of Ezra Miller. In total then, while it's perhaps not surprising that mothers think motherhood is more important than non-mothers, it is interesting that said relationship is so consistent across women of different education levels, relationship and employment status, yet is still seemingly so heavily influenced by social norms. Women crave for being loved, not for loving. They scream out at you for sympathy all day long. They are incapable of giving any in return, for they cannot state a fact accurately to another, nor can that other woman attend to it accurately enough for it to become information. 
Now, is not all of this the result of want of sympathy? I am sick with indignation at what wives and mothers will do of the most shocking selfishness. And people call it all maternal or conjugal affection and think it pretty to say so. No, let each person tell the truth from their own experience, they really don't have sympathy or the ability to empathize because they are always judging everyone and everything as a product on a social value scale that relates to their own egos and bounces off themselves. There is no capability for genuine feeling. This is what I have experienced with women. There is no capability for genuine feelings for other humans or really in general, except when those feelings are for themselves and the other people are just proxies to bounce ideas off of. Based, based, absolutely based. <laughs> so ultimate. What? <laughs> what is this woman's editing? Who? What is that? What is the, what is the most random? What was that? Where did, it, did she, who, huh? Who said it? What was that? What the fuck was that? This video is so dumb. Is off of. Based, based. Yeah, whose quote Absolutely was that? What the based. fuck? And that's, is that Count Dankula? Who's that? But like, literally, what? Like, who was that quote? Where did it come from? Where, what is this editing? And where are her sources? Where the fuck is this girl's, oh, references. Okay, hold on. Hold on. References. Ah, okay, here we go. Nice. Oh, she does. Okay, good job. Okay, so she gave us some references. Okay, that's good. But like literally though, like what was that quote? What was it? So ultimately, is motherhood good? <laughs> Discourse says, is this video trying to disprove or prove? What are we trying to say? I'm not, bro, the title of this video is The Girl Boss Paradox. Why empowered women are miserable. But I, what nothing like nothing in this hour and a half i feel like i wasted all of your time today i'm so sorry but like nothing happened for women holton fisher and roe 2010 attempted to answer that question in a sample of australian mothers and non-mothers aged 30 to 34 who were questioned on their physical and mental health current and lifetime experiences with depression satisfaction with life and personal well-being the majority of women nearly 75 percent reported that they wanted children there was no significant difference between mothers and childless women on mental health scores however mothers reported greater life satisfaction and personal well-being after controlling for various socio-demographic characteristics this relationship remained consistent in that mothers had greater subjective well-being and life satisfaction than non-mothers interestingly scores on the mental health measure were similar across scores of postpartum mothers non-postpartum mothers and childless women indicating that even women who had recently given birth were not struggling with their mental health more than mothers or childless women. Perhaps that's because giving birth is a bit like taking off one's weighted training clothing. In turn, postpartum mothers actually had the highest levels of life satisfaction compared to non-postpartum mothers and non-mothers, indicating that giving birth contributes uniquely to feelings of fulfillment. Further, there was no significant difference in the number of postpartum mothers. Okay, but this isn't a reason why you should have babies. Like, like, this isn't a reason to have children. Nothing in this video was so, I'm so sorry. I feel like we spent an hour and a half. This is the most useless video I've ever watched in my whole life. What was the point of this video? There was, this is not a, she better have a good conclusion in the last four fucking minutes. What did we just watch? What? Non-postpartum mothers and non-mothers who were currently or had previously been depressed meaning that problems with clinical depression do not appear to be contingent on motherhood status. Great. So with everything that we've looked at today and all of that in okay. mind, let's come to a few conclusions about- Okay, finally, the conclusions, let's see. Women's happiness and motherhood. Over the course of this long video, we've seen how, in previous decades, women were consistently happier and more satisfied with their lives than were men. But that began to change over time, coinciding with the women's rights movement as more and more women began to enter the workforce full-time. Wait, just a reminder. No, no, no. Okay, okay. Never mind. Okay. It was not until the last decade or so that women began returning to life as homemakers and mothers that this trend has seemingly reversed in direction. However, women's happiness has continued to plummet, now falling below that of men in multiple first world nations. The countries that have maintained a higher life satisfaction and happiness in women are those with lower levels of gender equality. At the same time,
Okay. That's fine. Time marriages wherein men are happier than women are more likely to end in divorce, only adding to women's unhappiness. While motherhood seems to generally be a positive thing for women's lives, particularly long term, there are several confounding variables, including marriage and socioeconomic status, that influence the positive effects of motherhood. Several studies illustrate that the happiness bestowed by full time motherhood versus employment is easily influenced by cultural and social norms, with women being more satisfied with being a mom during periods of time where more people believe that being a mother as a job is socially acceptable, indicating that a significant element of women's happiness as either a mother or a girl boss is dependent on how much other women and men feel about those roles. As such, there are multiple paradoxes that plague women's life satisfaction, particularly in the West. There is no simple answer to the question then of whether women are happier as mothers or as girl bosses. It is. Here's the simplicity of the answer. It's based off the individual. <gasps> women aren't a monolith, you fucking reductive thinker. This is the dumbest video I've ever seen in my life. Literally, literally, humans are individuals. You're an individual person. Stop asking the world if you're allowed to be happy, if you're allowed to find joy, if you're allowed to have a relationship with your consciousness. Do it anyways. Don't listen to the world that is shaming you for being a mom. Don't listen to the world that is shaming you for being a girl boss. Don't listen to the world that is shaming you for me having mental health and getting better. Don't listen to the world that is miserable and alone. Don't listen to anyone who doubts you because they're not you. Listen to your joy. If you need advice and help, go to people that aren't going to turn you away from your joy because of their bias. What? There's no easy answer. The easy answer is let people choose their lives. Give society choices and let people choose. Even if a majority of women choose having babies, great. Let it be their choice. And if they choose to have jobs, let it be their choice. And if men want to be stay-at-home dads, let it be their choice. Men also get shamed for being stay-at-home dads. That's why I don't believe men's statistics on, men, on whether or not men want to stay at home. Men aren't always safe to say they want to be stay-at-home dads because other men make fun of them or some women don't think it's attractive. So again, like men also should be given choices about staying home. I think like I have a brother who I think would make a great stay-at-home dad, but because he's religious, a religious woman is less likely to not want to be a stay-at-home partner as well, which is kind of a bummer. Kind of sad, actually, that like his bubble doesn't necessarily give him the option. Maybe they can manage to work from home and have a business there, but they're not entrepreneurially spirited. So there's that. Like ultimately we have to play to our strengths and our joys. But like if you limit yourself because of other people's standards, like that's on you. That's on you. As well in general, the answer may appear to be yes, it is highly contingent on the opinions of others and social norms. So instead, I have to ask all of you, what do you guys think? Why do you think that women's happiness has been declining over the decades, particularly in first world countries, even as women have gained more and more rights? Does motherhood make women happy, or is it just a bunch of bonding hormones that make women think that she likes being a mom? Are women happier in the workplace than in the home? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. If you have enjoyed this video, please be sure to leave a like and subscribe if you're not already subscribed, as well as leave a comment to- You're wrong, Vash. I mean, Brittany's saying, um, Brittany, that sounds way re too reductive. Saying it's up to the individual takes away the fact that people will interact with society regardless of choice unless you're a hermit. But, re but interact with the society that allows you to fulfill your dreams. Like interact with the society or be a rebel. The reason modern women are probably more likely to be less happy than women in other countries with less rights is because the women who have more choices actually have to choose and they still have to battle all the societal pressures versus women with little to no choice. Well, they don't have to battle as many social pressures because they don't even have the option to battle them. But like, yes, you have to earn your right to happiness. You have to find your joy. You have to work on yourself. You want everything handed to you? Do you want everything to be easy? It's not about being easy. But the answer is about you. Nobody said it was going to be easy. It's about you, though. Is it like apparently battling society isn't good enough? People aren't even looking at themselves as an individual. The author of this video literally says women, 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 women. It's like, what about people, bro? She's not even considering people. She's just saying women. And it's not working. So maybe try being an individual within a society. You exist within a society as an individual. Hello, do we need to reference the text? Okay, so on the macro, right? We're in a bubble of the universe. We're just like, if you zoom out, we're 
people floating on a planet. And if you zoom out, we're a rock within the universe. And if you zoom out, we don't even exist. We barely exist when you reach its space, okay? And then if you look, society, okay? Society is that thing that um, was brought about through evolution. We became tribes. We have a tribe. And that tribe has individuals within that society. And as an individual within the society, you can adhere to the society's general rules, just like this person said in the video. You could live with the shame of not being a girl boss or being a mother or whatever else. Okay. Right. And then you can decide if you want to stay in the society or if you want to go to a different society and decide to do it a different way. And yes, that comes with sacrifice. It comes with moving away from family and friends. It comes with challenging your culture. But if the society you're in isn't fulfilling you, hello? change society or change societies. Or you can decide to be a specific individual consciousness, which means forego being an individual within society in any other way than superficial and create your own bubble where you get to live your own life and do your own thing that makes sense to you within a society. You don't have to be a hermit to be an individual. You don't have to be a hermit to be an individual. JJ says, to be fair, the studies say women, right? But I don't know why I expect... I always expect people to look at a study in the most objectifying way. Studies are very objectifying. They're not explaining a real human experience. They're explaining an idea around a human experience. Studies are very helpful to indicate things sort of about society, but they're never telling a true human lived experience. They're generalizing you, objectifying, and then whittling down your very lived, nuanced, interesting experience to a bunch of data points. You know, so again, like you do you, you know, decide how you want to be within the society you're built in. Like, again, pay your like pay your taxes, do your things. Right. But again, if she even said herself that studies show how the society reacts to the woman matters and we know that that's what I mean when I say bubbles. Everybody knows the society has an expectation of behavior that they will push on you. And it is your job, whether you're a man, a woman, non-binary, doesn't matter your gender, to seek out your place of joy and happiness in that realm. Again, happiness is an emotion, so it's fleeting, but joy is found foundational and consistent in your life, right? Joy, when maintained, maintains whether you have children or not. Joy, when real and maintained within your consciousness, exists whether the whole world is imploded or not. Joy, whether, you know, um, as long as it's real and within your consciousness, exists whether you're married or not. Happiness is different. Loneliness is different. Joy is consistent. It helps give you a place for your consciousness to rest and to exist in when things aren't perfect because nothing will ever be perfect. You know, you don't have to be a hermit. You just have to think for yourself. But if you keep letting society shame you for being a mom or shame you for being a girl boss, you're still, what are you, what are you doing to yourself? You're still not having a relationship with your consciousness in a real way. Good news is that because society challenges you within the mechanism of their bubble, it gives you an opportunity to rebel past it, which modern women are trying and they're still not seeing the happiness they want because they're not really facing themselves. Men who are lonely, who aren't, who are, who are reporting loneliness and saying we can't find partners, who are becoming resentful of women. They are also not, with all of their choices under the patriarchy, finding joy because they're not having a relationship with their consciousness. Men and women in modern worlds are reporting loneliness and unhappiness. And it has nothing to do with politics. That is everything to do with how they see themselves in the world. Okay? Like ultimately, like, come on. You are smart, you are capable, you know. All things are possible when you decide to engage with the possibilities of them being true. Nothing is possible if you don't think it's possible. This is where manifestation comes in, whether it's woo-woo or just like science. Your brain actually is benefiting by positive reinforcement. It benefits by positive reinforcement. I can do this. I've got it. I can handle it. I believe in myself. Is way better for you scientifically than I'll never do anything. I can't do it. Oh my God. Pessimists and negative people are less successful and less joyful in life. Literally data shows us that positive reinforcement is the best thing for people. It is the best way to change. Okay. You can do this. You absolutely can. Our ancestors have proven this to us. People who have come before us have proven this. You can do this. Stuck in my head in real life, 
on the bed My belly's being fed and I'm okay I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool